Good All right, everybody. Now that we are mostly getting introduced, I have started broadcasting, so we are streaming live to YouTube. Hey, Rob. Just as a heads up. Oh, hey, Richard. How hey, you Rob. doing? Hello. <laughs> Glad to meet you. Okay. So I haven't even been on your blog recently, Richard. What number blog are you on? Um, so I, I did uh, 22, and then I skipped a couple and posted that um, the one on the Alien Deception one. Um, so right, I'm, right. Actually, I'm on 25, but I skipped a couple. Gotcha. I'll be putting those out soon, hopefully. <laughs> you are one hard-working motherfucker, if you don't mind me saying <laughs> Thank you. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. You know, here in America, we like to sleep sometimes. Yeah. I yeah. love it. How <laughs> you just seem to never. You are. You are always on the go. You no, are. I like. I like working amazing. at night. I like working at night. So if like your evening time is my like middle of the night time, because um, I just silence then get things done with no distractions. That would be a better idea. So did hey, you Josh, have you got live? Before Flat Earth, Richard? Sorry? Did you write much before Flat Earth? Um, yeah, I did. Um, I did about 15 posts before Flat Earth, kind of laying laying a lot of the groundwork with, with regards to Freemasons and NASA and magnetism and other stuff because I didn't want to just come out and say, you know, this is the flat earth um, without having said who's behind it or, you know, what the alternative model would be, which I did by covering magnetism uh, and showing, you know, the, the Taurus model um, based on mathematics and vector equilibrium and other stuff. Um, so it kind of gave me a foot to stand on before I threw the, the flat earth into the, into the game. <laughs> Well, you certainly got a um, a plan. <laughs> I do, yeah. <laughs> I've got about. Um, I mean, I have a list of like twenty posts that I'm, you know, planning on doing. So there's, it's very much, um, you know, that I've forecasted what I'm going to write about. Try to weave things together so things. Um, uh oh, he froze up. Went quiet. God, I have trouble mastering doing one thing a day. <laughs> I can't even get a bloody video of a gyroscope. I do understand, John. I'm quite jealous of his output as well. I haven't had a video <laughs> up in a, quite a while on my channel myself. <laughs> what do you do for a living, Richard? I think he's gone. I think he's been kicked off. He's, he's, his icon's still there. It's just he froze up. Yep, I suspect he'll not be there long. And he's back. There he's back. Uh, Sweet. His, his clone is here. <laughs> what do you do for a living, Richard? Well, I've, I've been bartending quite a bit the last few months uh, since about June. Uh, before that, I worked with my brother who, who runs the startup. Um, yeah. <laughs> Just do enough to get by so I can keep writing my blog and sharing, sharing stuff. Can't be working in a pub. Yeah. <laughs> Can't be drinking in a pub. Well, yeah, that uh, goes along with it, doesn't it? Working and drinking in a pub. It, it, it's, a good, it's a good balance in a way because, um, I mean, I get kind of wrapped up uh, and obsessed a little bit with with um, you know the truth, as it were. Uh, so it's nice to meet people and just get away from it for for a bit. So that's that's nice. <laughs> and how long have you been into the flat earth? I may have missed that question. If somebody already asked you. Uh, well, I came across it last summer. To be honest, I mean, a, a lot of people. The consensus that I get from a lot of people is that you need you need to answer every single question before you can you know realize that it's flat but for me it was just you know once I had you know two or three things you know curvature and perspective and you know the sun 
you, all you need is like one proof that the globe doesn't um, doesn't work, and that's it. Um, but for me, it was you know pretty quick to realize you know that the, except the Earth is flat, kind of, and then um, took a few months until around Christmas, maybe uh, October, November, to you know answer all the questions I had in my head. Longer, the hardest one was um, 24 hour sun in Antarctica. Um, yeah, but yeah, so pretty much since last summer. How about you guys? Well, I myself am probably found it around, I guess, April of last year. Had the usual, ha, that's insane, you know, response, knee jerk reaction. Watched a couple videos to prove to myself how crazy it was and realized, you know, those are questions I had when I took all the astrophysics and things. Because I was a big NASA fanboy. I was shooting for working if, at NASA at some point. And uh, I had a lot of that under my belt. And I had a lot of unanswered questions. So definitely. And it turned out that was the hardest thing for me to get through and let go of. You know, go, okay, so the moon landing was fake, but that shuttle had to be real, right? And then, wait, no, because those wings don't work, and these guys are all still alive. Okay, well, that's ISS. That has to be real, right? So, yeah, I just had to let it go one piece at a time, but I started posting my videos and doing this crazy Twitter thing because I just, I'm kind of, I was kind of like you, just have to get this out. People need to know. Yeah, but did you, did you find that you immediately wanted to share stuff? Um, or did you want to wait a bit until you knew all the answers? It was kind of a toe in the water thing for me because I've always had a quest for truth. I've always had, a, I've always been into the other, if you will. And so people always knew I had some interesting series about everything. And so you know, me throwing this out wasn't a surprise. But most either just laughed it off or. Uh, I've even lost friends over this thing. But a few actually presented some interesting questions that made me do further research, like sniper bullets, uh, Coriolis, things I wouldn't even have actually gone into deeply to discover how much of it is, you know, a double standard. It works for this, but it doesn't work for that. You got your Velcro a atmosphere for the plane, but not for the bullet, you know, and it just doesn't, it starts falling apart. And when you show them that, then they don't want to go any further with the discussion, you know, the, the cognitive dissonance kicks in and, they're just stuck. NASA usually is what most of them just can't get past. And I'm showing them the fakery. I'm showing them the animation. I'm showing them the astronauts disappearing around corners. And, you know, they're just, oh, but yeah. excuses, excuses, excuses. Yeah. Hey, Walter, what I'm loving at the moment is um, all the, the songs and everything that I keep on hearing and you guys post, you know, will tell me about them and, and um, Richard, remember in the chat yesterday, Richard, um, someone was posting something about Westworld, and um, you know, just all 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 that sort of sort of the um, flat Earth is what I'm enjoying at the moment. Yeah, uh, the predictive programmer. Yeah, the predictive programming. <laughs> yeah, well, that's I mean, that's, they they do that constantly. It's, it's a double-edged thing, I think. It's both the elite and the, I guess, the Luciferian element that like to taunt their plans and rub it in our face and mock us with their obvious, here it is, but you're, we've got you so dumbed down, you're not going to see it. Mockery, and also the predictiveness of it, to let us know, hey, here it is, as they show us fake news stories left and right on what's supposed to be the truth. And we wind up getting the truth from the fake fiction and movies and TV. Do you think that there is some sort of karmic necessity that requires them to put it out there? At this point, at the psychotic level, we see them exhibit on a daily basis. I think it's more just ego that they really are so convinced they've got us that dumbed down that they could show us their plans I in agree. depth just to laugh at us. I agree. I think they've done this years in advance. They're just rubbing your face in it. They don't think you're ever going to read Manly P. Hall or uh, Blavatsky or, you know, anything uh, Crowley or or anything. When they, when they were written, you know, they were clear 
peasant elite um, distinctions where no one, you know, uh, the elite had books and things that the peasants couldn't afford, if, you know, in a, in a year. So they never thought we'd read this sort of stuff. I don't, I, yeah, I think it was just ego and I don't think they were obliged to tell us anything. If they do, they do it in a funny, bloody way. But it seems to be a common theme. They're always putting it out there. Why, if they're trying to keep something secret, would they consistently put it out there in front of us for us to see? They I can, I can understand. I mean, what, what, how many people claim to have predicted 9-11 as Freeman Fly, Jones, Cooper? Um, they don't think we'll get it. Absolutely. Maybe not at the time. And maybe we don't get it at the time, which is why it works. But it's a trail of breadcrumbs. So it just all roads will lead to Rome, you know, literally. You'll, you'll be able to turn and see all the predictive programming that had happened coming up leading to it. Well, maybe there's a um, maybe there's an end plan where we, we find all this out deliberately, that that was part of the plan. I mean, Flat Earth just fell in hmm. our lap, really, didn't it? I like it. Where they're going to come through and just divulge everything. I think they've written the script from start to finish. I think from thousands of years ago to to the end of time, they've written the script and they're going to make it happen no matter what. That's why all the prophecies come true and all the rest of it, because they wrote the prophecies and they made them happen. Just my two cents. <laughs> nope, that's a good point. It's really easy if you're going to write the story to factor in predictions. I mean, not just foreshadowing, but actual predictions and saying this is what's going to happen and then later on in the book saying this is what's happening and then later on in the book saying oh my god we predicted it and you can believe us because look we predicted it and it came true how can yeah, you doubt later, us later on the history books say this is what happened mm -hmm. how are you going to know they'll make how sure the history books know? say that right we don't know anything think, further back than what, two, three generations? For real. Right, if you can't no. talk to your grandfather about it and confirm it, then what proof do you have? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look at Stonehenge and things like that. That one blew my mind, truly. <laughs> I'd always found it interesting, but to see the level of deception that had been poured into that that was amazing yeah it was basically rebuilt wasn't it in the 50s uh-huh yep just from I mean, the ground up yeah they, they could have they, they could have been guys, doing anything that was, a, that was just a uh, cleansing they were trying to straighten it up a little bit it was a little <laughs> off set. i mean that's what you do with astrological things that are aligned to stars is that you tear them completely down <laughs> and make big holes in the ground around them and then you just put them back up with cement. That's what you do. That's, that's how you do a restoration. Come on. Well, What's up, Peter? Tomb. Oh, hey, <laughs> welcome, Peter. You're muted, just so you know. We can't hear you nor see you anymore. Oh, there you are. If you're talking, you, your microphone is muted. Back in a can you hear me now? Yep. Ah, there you go. Perfect. Oh, hi guys, how you doing? Just how you doing, Peter? Hi Peter. Yeah, very good guys, very good. I, I must admit, I'm a bit jet lagged, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to be here for long. But I just want to pop in and say hello to, you, hello to you guys and thank you for all your good work as well. Thank you. I'm so glad you did. I love being able Sorry, to put a face to a name. I, said, yeah, I love too, being able too. to put a face to a name. Yeah, it's great. I'm so glad you did pop in. So what were we saying? Predictive programming? There you go. Now you can see my ugly mug. Hey, there. Put the light on. <laughs> ah, that's better.
And as I was saying earlier on, um, Josh, with the songs, you know, I'm, I'm loving, I'm loving the songs, like the Pink Floyd, uh, another yeah, brick in the wall, and the, just the lyrics. And um, is it the Who? Is it the Who, John, that um, sung that really, really good one that you like as well? I can see for miles. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that, that's you know, it's new to all that stuff's new to me. The who is new to you? Not the not the band. What they sing <laughs> okay. about? Okay. Gotcha. Right. No, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> You're seeing it with new eyes. I can appreciate that. Yeah. Once I actually stopped listening to the lyrics and read the lyrics, to I can see for miles. You, you'd be hard pressed to convince me that that's not a flatter song. See, I'm I'm a Radiohead fan, and they're very political with what they they sing. You know what I mean? So, um, listen to a few of their songs, and that you know they're not that sort of thing. But um, yeah, uh, lots and lots. Oh, I love this! Look, hey, what's up, James? We got a room full today. Awesome. Hey, what's what's going on, everybody? I did Hey, James, what's up? Uh, not much. I'm just enjoying the conversation. I smell. Right. I smell. I smell a future blog post by Richard on music and the flat Earth. <laughs> right? Yeah. And we want it done by the end of this podcast. <laughs> Sad thing is, he'll, he'll probably get it. He done just popped by off to go do it. He just right. popped off <laughs> to go do it. He's gonna come back with two pages done. What are you worried about? There, see, done. It's two done. pages. Done. I, dro I dropped off there, but um, about the music, I, I have included a lot of music in my twenty-first post. Uh, another brick in the wall, actually. Nice. <laughs> a lot of a lot of Pink Floyd stuff there. They've even got, um, you know, a spinning uh, or circling white wall in um in their official music video um which is ridiculous once you know there's this flat <laughs> yeah, <laughs> clearly yeah. antarctica symbolism and then you've got uh john lennon um the wheels what's it song um the beatles the, the fool on the hill wheel, the wheels the go around and around. Uh, yeah wheels go around you're not longer on the ball <laughs> and then you got paul mccartney oh my goodness i forgot about that part <laughs> The, the fool on the hill. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, there's so many. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a few of them in my blog already. You see, people people by nature they have to tell somebody. That's why all these stars. Like, you know, they, uh, they have to the, tell. Yeah, my my favorite one is Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, uh, space may be the final frontier, but it's made in the Hollywood basement. <laughs> Californication. <laughs> R.E.M. are a personal favorite. They have many songs that decode quite a bit. Stand in the place that you live. Now oh, yeah. Think about the sun. Wonder why you never did it before. R.E.M.'s coming up yep. in my next post, actually. Uh, their End of the World As You Know It um, song, released on 16th November, 1987. <laughs> it's, it's all synchronicity. <laughs> if you believe they put a man on the moon. Yeah. Meatloaf. Lo losing my religion. <laughs> <laughs> Did someone say meatloaf? Yeah, he, he mentions flat earth. Really? What song? Oh, bugger, now you're asking. Can't remember. I don't know. I have to, I, I'm really only fluent on the Bad Out of Hell album, so I'm trying I to think. I think it's on that album. I think it's on that album. And he says, um, as far as I know, we live on a flat earth or something like that. Oh, I, think this <laughs> I think Paul McCartney referenced it in his songs too. Uh, solo work. Yeah, a lot. Can you think of any? Uh, I, I bow to Richard on this one. Hang on, I can't off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a whole folder called Flat Beatles? Earth. I remember I had something. My, uh, what I personally have come to think of being a very big reference is Glass Onion. 
Because I think that's kind of how this whole thing is set up, is layers of pressure going outward and going inward. Because I saw this video about a guy at the bottom of the ocean in his submarine, and he came across this lake. I, I love that video. And he yeah, couldn't yeah. penetrate it with his submarine. He's trying to penetrate this dome created by these muscles, and he can't penetrate it. And it was like, ding, that's what it is. It's layers going out yeah, into it's infinity. And at one point, there was a layer more dense inward that kept pressure to support giants and huge dragonflies, and then it ripped, and that's where the flood came. That's where the flood waters came from. And that's the rift in the sky. Just some of my personal crazy stuff I've been thinking of. Yo, can you bro hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. All right, yo, what's up? My name is Daquan. Uh, I'm from uh, Woke News. Pop it on here. Uh, so uh, you you uh, you guys believe in the uh, the flat Earth, do you? Yeah. 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 Pretty strongly, Daquan. We got a room full of us. Yeah. 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 So uh, you know, I'm I'm Muslim, and uh, you know, in, in the Quran it says that too. So uh, you it know. Does. Are, are you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You look. You boys looking at this from like a religious perspective, or uh, what, what? What you? Uh, what you looking at from? Every every perspective. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, you know, all all I'm saying is that uh, you know, when you really think about it, though, it, it, the the whole flat Earth theory is it, it, it's quite racist in 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 all honesty, because it it leaves out Africa and it makes Africa seem like a how do I phrase this? Uh, inferior to the rest of the world. You how know, so? It, In what way? How, yeah, how, how so would Slider? And just yeah. before you continue, let me just say, I am from the South, sir. So I have a pretty good handle on your dialect and your accent. <laughs> Yo, well, what you mean by that, though, homie? No, go ahead. Continue with your point. Well, well no, no, hold whoa, whoa. What do you mean you got a good act handle on my dialect? All right, never mind that. What I what I'm what I'm saying is that because it's the flat earth, uh, you know, you guys think that Europe's in the middle. And no. you know well, the no, North Pole is in the middle. I mean, it's called the North Pole. Yeah, North, North yeah. Pole's in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, uh -huh. Well, that you know, what I've been reading these forms, and they've been saying Europe's in the middle, because Europe is 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 the center of the world, and they're saying that that's where <laughs> white people come from. That's so, amazing. You know, what what forms are these? Funny. Look at the read this craziness. Where did you read these? Tell me, flat Earth society. I bro, I got no idea. Quite honestly, I, I just saw it, and I was, and I was reading, it and I was like, yo, that's that's really racist and shit. And there, there's there's <laughs> subtle stuff too, you know, like. Oh, oh, there's there's a lot, you know, like from from the from the perspective of the 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 North Pole being the center, you know, snow's white. I'm seeing the connection there, you know, white people. Everything <laughs> revolves on that, you know. That's pretty good. What about dirty I mean, snow? Dirty snow can be like brown or black. Is it could like dirty snow? I know. I, well, yo, yo, the, the, that that's the point of making it. It's dirty. It's, it's automatically, you know, my skull, my skin's black. And you know, because I'm black, it's cause it's perceived as dirty, not white, not so, clean, clean, not normal. In the same way, has in in uh, a lot of ways the um, the standard maps, the flat projection maps that we see that yeah. we have in our school classrooms and everything, they were the ones that um, portrayed Africa as a lot smaller than it actually is. When it's put on an equidistant <laughs> azimuthal equidistant map. We we see we see the a massive extent that Africa actually is yeah, and and when it's not on a political map, and that's well, come maps, out thanks to flat Earth, I think. Well, well, those maps were made by white people, and they they's they's trying to crush the perception of black people's hopes of of making Africa the the, the homeland smaller. You well, know, those, those maps are, those maps were agreed by politicians, basically. Who were I don't white. care what were color they into were. Power because they were white, because <laughs> of the color of their skin. That was the reason that they're politicians. Then not because they're simply not the color, it's because they're white. I don't think so. I mean I'm white, I'm not a politician. So they're not yeah, politicians but, because but you they're could white. be one because you are white. Okay, well but, I could be one because <clears throat> I'm a human. There's black politicians. We that's not an argument. That's a fact. So it's not. Yeah, yeah, but when they, when they, when, when they made the maps, though, when they made the maps, though, they's 
all the politicians was white. Right. But, but what John said very nicely, actually, and, and is very pertinent, is that because, because that happened and they did misrepresent Africa, the, the flat earth is revealing the true size of Africa. And, and I think it's, it's a positive thing. We shouldn't, we shouldn't, I think we're feeling it's very negative from your end, but it's actually quite a good thing. Yeah. Well, all I'm saying is that I think, I think a lot of people in the society itself is really racist for a number of reasons. You know, one of them being a lot of it's on the crux of, of religion and of Christianity. And I, and I think that those people, the Bible thumpers, them is, uh, they, they is racist and un uneducated in the sense of race and whatnot. And, uh, you know, as, as, as things that it's, it's really bad when you, when you start to control with those people, when you start to mix with those people, because you're starting to get, get some turns where you don't want to go. Hey, Mike, can you speak up a bit, Mike? Sorry. Sorry, I mean, sorry, bro. Uh, sorry, can House, can you speak up? Can you hear me now? Yeah, James, that might be your levels. He sounded pretty clear to me. Yeah, he's pretty clear to us. Um, yeah, the whole aside, thing bro. with what you're speaking about, unfortunately, is driven by our media, which is a device to get people to think these things that you are currently way involved in. And it is used to divide us and to keep things like flat earth truth come, from coming out because we all are focused on Sorry, guys. things that don't really matter. We should all be working together, everybody. No, Race, the, color, the thing is, doesn't that matter. as humans, we cannot work together. We either all got to be one race or we ain't. And, you know, um, so, uh, but, but, but racist. flat earth is racist. I know, and that's why it's, that's why it's not working. Ridiculous it's because there's too many races working statement. together. Yeah, there is some ridiculousness, you're right. There's too many races working together, that's why yeah, it doesn't work? And therefore, it's never going to succeed because people are going to be racist and people are never going to succeed because of that. Well, when the flat earth comes out, though, and everybody sees that it was made by somebody and that that somebody made each and every person kind of lose all the steam from your argument. In it was a, in made by instant. white people. No, no. Just think about what I said. minorities. Think about what I said. The creator gets revealed. Through flat yeah. earth. So we find yeah. out that, yes, somebody made us, all of us, black, white, yellow, brown, all of the beautiful people. The argument about being racist is gone in the twinkling of an eye. No, it's not. It's not. Because, you know, when Allah, when Allah made us, he said he made us into separate tribes. He said he made us into different people. And he did that. Are we equal? Are we equal? That's the question. Are the tribes equal? Or is there one tribe that's above the others? Because that would be well, racist. Well, there's there's a superior tribe. That's racist. No, it's Wait, that's it's racist. racist. No, it's not. How is that not racist? Unless it's that tribe is made up of different races. Who's well, the superior tribe? Who? Would you, sorry, my mic cut out. My, my headphone cut out. Yeah. Who Who is the superior tribe? Huh? Africans. So you say that only one race can exist and Africans are that race. Does that not sound racist to you? No. How the hell? How the, <laughs> explain, explain to me how that is racist because I'm not... I'm, to be okay. Like, okay, okay, okay. I think, you're, I think you're, you're, you're running out of time here. I think you're okay, well, let me, let me reverse it. Where, let me reverse the situation where... Let's take for assumption that I'm a white man and I say to you that only one race can exist and that's the white race and that's it. I'm going to stop you right would there. Would you that, not that, call me a racist? I'm, I'm going to stop you right there. What you said is, is very derogative and I don't appreciate that kind of talk. How is it derogative? Is it just we don't appreciate exactly because what you're, you're saying? You're saying that what this. race is superior. That's why. Cut them. Cut this. All right. Call it a Cut tribe. Him. One tribe is superior. Let's say one tribe is superior. Yeah. If you're worried about, if you think flat earth is racist because they put Europe in the middle, yeah. but you would have put Africa in the middle because you think the African tribe is superior to all the others. Uh, Josh, well, Africa, Africa, Africa is in the middle, bro. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm it's saying? Not, it's the North. Man, it's man, the North. Man, man, Explain man, flights. Man. Africa in the middle. Got Explain him flight path. Got him off. Is it wrong? Is it wrong? Don't cut, cut me. Daquan, you've got, you got about five seconds to 
understand to explain how African could be in the middle. Because black no, people are the superior people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you're done. Yes, you're done. You're done. Oh, you're I done. know we ain't. I, I ain't done. Bruh. You don't know what you're talking about, Jake. No, Goodbye. I do know what I'm talking about. Hey. hey what was the I have a real person yeah, not or one character. Of those character. That sounded like neuro linguistic programming on the word racist. Uh -huh. It sounded yeah. like uh, as if someone, if someone wanted to derail the conversation here, that is exactly how they would do it. Well, fuck yeah, when, so, when, when did racism come into flat earth? I, I've never heard that before. <laughs> no, no, me. Anyway, me. With that call, with that everything call, everything louder than everything else. It. My goodness. Well, meatloaf. Everything louder than everything else. So, and when, when, when does anyone say Europe okay, was in the middle of the flat earth? Bizarre. I think he's making shit up. I, there's no way he yeah, saw it, a flat earth map with Europe in the middle. It's <laughs> never I, happened. I thought I don't his think voice. Any of us know what is in the middle, do we? I I thought he was have, har, having a hard time staying in character with the voice and the accent. So I think he was yeah. faking it. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's what I think too. So he, I, I, as I said earlier, I'm than from me. the south. There is no doubt that was fake. One hundred percent. So do you, what were you saying, Rob? Right that you're better than me. Sorry, you Rob. Go ahead. You're better than me because I'm I'm all the way down here, you, and I'm yes. not in the middle. You, <laughs> yes, you're better than me, or what? <laughs> Dude, I hate that. When you's <laughs> better than me. <laughs> no, it's that very liberal definition of what racism is that they've been pushing these days. That only people that are not in that are in power can be racist, which means only white people, because they're the majority, only white people can be racist. So that's the only thing racism can be, is white people being superior. If you talk about black people being superior, that's not racist because well, you're not the one in power. So that works out well. Yeah, I think there's a lot of races that would have heard that, that would uh, agree that um, there was only one racist in the room there. Mm -hmm. It was it was all made up. That was made up, John. I wouldn't even. Yeah, it's, it's I, I agree. It was that was a, that's that's hearing. like anti anti semit um semitic, yeah. but for blacks. Uh, sorry, let's, for African Americans. Let's move on sorry. from this yeah. whole thing that he purposely yeah. brought into the room and get back to the music. What was the song, John? I'm trying to look it up. I'm sorry. It was Meatloaf. Um, everything louder than everything else. Okay. I, I can play it if you want, but it won't come through on here. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up. Josh, can I send you the link? You can send it to me, but if we play it, we'll probably just get a big old fat copyright strike. You could probably get the lyrics up on the screen without a copyright strike, though. Yeah, this is true. Could, you, can the, yeah. you can send me a link with lyrics. Yeah, I can just mute it. And we can just show lyrics. Meat life beats racism any day. <laughs> <laughs> Who's this Google thing uh, celebrating Mary's sea kale, kale, sea kale? They always come up with these bizarre people. That... Anyone seen that? Yeah, I saw no. that too. I haven't not yet. I'll share with Google if I can. Hello, King. Lyrics. <clears throat> King, you're muted, just so you know. Here's up. Eh, there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah now we can hear you. Alright. Hey, Walt. Alright. Okay. Walt. Yeah. Okay, it's... Um, How are we doing, guys? Louder than everything else. I know that I will never be politically correct, and I don't give a damn about my lack of etiquette. As far as I'm concerned, the world could still be flat, and if the thrill is gone, then it's time to take it back. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. Sorry, whoever just came in there. King, sorry. Hi, mate. What <coughs> song was that, John? That uh, was Meatloaf. Um, everything louder than everything else. <laughs> sorry, we're just doing flat earth music at the moment, King. Ah. Yes, welcome, welcome. 
I haven't actually found any real flat earther uh, podcasts on this. It's pretty interesting. Have you been looking at it long? Uh, for a while, yeah. It's been, you know, wondering. <laughs> and at what stage of wondering are you, sir? Uh, I don't know so far. Now, Great answer. W- would you be near the center of the map or on the edges of the flat earth map, would you say? The what? <laughs> what? Whereabouts are you on the flat earth? Well, I'm in America, so there's yeah. that. <laughs> Do you know what an average, like, what most people consider a flat Earth map even looks yeah, like? Yeah, like the, yeah, no, you got the North Pole in the center of it, right, and then you got everything else around it. Yeah. Oh, so you've, you've done a little research. That's cool. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. The only way is to test it yourself, you know. Yeah, I'm just going to go down to uh, Antarctica and forge across. Do it, man. Let's go. Let us go. We're ready. Plenty of ways to test it. Test whether you've been lied to for a start. Yeah. Uh, have you looked into the moon landing? Uh, I have. Um, I'm pretty sure they're probably faked at this point. Well, you're well on your way then. <laughs> if, you have any doubts, uh, if you have any doubts, you can check out my blog post. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> yeah, plug it, Bridget. Do it, sir. Do it. Yes, the narrow yeah. gate is an awesome place to see. No, it is. It is. I highly recommend it too. Uh, post number seventeen is called uh, "The Greatest Liars of All Time," uh, and it covers all of NASA's lies. You know, CGI. You know, Photoshop. Um, terrible acting. Um, bad hairdos. The works. <laughs> oh, Medusa! The dude. Medusa. I love the Medusa. The... Yep. <laughs> So, love- King, are you are you on Twitter? Uh, I am. Are you yeah. on this King Leonidas? No, that's just my old uh, YouTube account. Gotcha. No worries. Oh, you could do worse than following Richard. What's your at Twitter account? I'll send it here and then. At Richard Coburg. Or Rob, what's yours? Might as well do the rounds, eh? As you're on Twitter, yeah. King. What, what's your handle, King? Uh, it is... <laughs> it's uh, Latin. It's Quasitum 3. <laughs> nice. So, if you want to... <laughs> I'm Swear EG, by the way. Yeah, I'll add you. Square E.G. Sweary. Swear. Because I swear so much. He swears a bit. <laughs> he's, he's a bit of a square. Not when we're live. And this is at Facebones777. I used to be a bit of a Metalocalypse fan a long time ago. All right. There you go. Here, one sec, guys. Who else we got? Where's so, Josh? I was going to say, so Josh. Stop you lurking. I'm here, I'm lurking. I got people calling me on Skype. People You're popping the in. Celebrity we've got. They are Corey77. Richard, I got a question for you when you have a second. I was just wondering. Um, you know the cymatic stuff and the coral castle? Yeah. Okay, so is it possible that they use frequencies to move the stones for the pyramids? Yeah, that's exactly what they did. It's all ah. frequencies. Ah. I mean, ev- everything has a resonant frequency, and if you can match the, uh, or if you can find the resonant frequency of the, you know, the limestones, limestone is a, is a superconductive, uh, has superconductive properties, so it's it's excellent for, you know, magnetic levitation through you know resonators like Ed Leeds Galman's. So if you look at the rocks that are used at Coral Castle, uh, they're made with um, lime sandstone, some yeah lime limestone, which is similar to the to the rocks that are used in the Giza pyramids, which gives yeah, the whole thing away. Interesting stuff, man. 
you know, I have to, I have to admit, like a lot of people may say, like, you know, I was like, oh, I've checked out your blog, I've looked at it, but do you really look at it, look at it? And since I started looking at it, looking at it, man, you've got good information. Especially since I know audio technology, right? Like I was looking into frequencies because that's what I used to do. I was a, an electronic music producer, eh? And when I started looking at the cymatic frequencies again, and then the frequencies of, of, of objects submerged in, in water that Walt turned me on to, which was, what, what do you call it, Walt? The bioluminescence, I think it is. Sun and luminescence. Oh, so, yeah, that one. And then uh, it just started making sense. That, and then what scared me is that... Sorry, I missed, I missed the last 30 seconds of what you were saying. Sound uh, luminescence, it's sound creating a light in a jar of water. Basically what stars yeah. are, I think. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm going to cover that. There's, it's pretty awesome. I guess There's some good videos on YouTube. Amazing yeah. stuff. But just the water itself, I mean, I always use that to, to kind of explain people you know, to people who aren't really, I mean, some of us obviously have done a lot of, ex, like, deep work on physics and, and cymatics and Whoa. things like that. And uh, when people kind of don't get it, I go, okay, think about water itself. You have water in its natural state, in a, say, in a tub, you can run your hand through it, you feel it, it's there, it's vibrating at a certain frequency. Take that same water and freeze it now you slow down the frequency and it's a solid object you can't put your hand through it anymore it's a totally different state same water just vibrating at a different frequency now you take that water and you boil it and it becomes steam and it's vibrating at a very high rate your hand goes through it you can feel it but it's not anything like the other two states i kind of think that space is a fourth frequency or a fourth state of water have you have you seen those those buddhist bowls where they they make uh water boil just by uh, making the bowl resonate with yes, with the edge. Yes, that's amazing yep. stuff. I mean, you, you, can make, you can make water boil with just sound. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> well, well, that's that's what I think I was trying to get at. There's a lot more to this uh, cymatics and sound and, and magnetics than we know, but then I knew. So, Josh, I'm gonna send I you think. a video, and as long as we credit it to the guy who made it, I think he'll be okay with it. It's pretty amazing. It's real quick, and it really shows quickly what cymatics. Can do. Send it away. Who's the woke guy that joined? Um, this is Daquan. Now, Daquan, I will unmute you, but you're gonna have to accept the fact that what you're saying is racist. Oh, and that just because we're white does not make us racist. So, if you want to listen and learn, we'd be more than happy to kind of educate you on what the real flat Earth is. But we're not going to evolve this into some race thing just because we're white. So this is about the flat earth. And we'll be more than willing to educate you on the flat earth. But this is not going to become a debate about race. I don't even so know if we are all white. I agree on that one. <laughs> that, that's a good point. That's a good point. I'm not even sure I'm all white for, for that matter. I'm not even sure what I am. Is what was it Das? Is he wanting to come back in? Really? Um, yeah, he's back in. He's here. He's that's who was calling me on Skype, trying to get back in. I guess he still found the link. He's had his um, chance, Josh. Yeah, I agree. Well, he's here. He's muted. He's being quiet. Okay. He's not being ignorant. If he wants to listen, we'll let him listen. And if he wants hey, to add forward. anything of intelligence, I'll, I'll give him a second chance. But there'll not be a third. So we'll just let him sit there and listen, and we can continue to educate him on the flat so earth. So, where were we, where were we just talking about that? Walt, you were going to queue up that video, oh. right? About Simon yeah, next to quick um, video. Yeah, I'm digging for it. You know how it is when you watch too many videos in like way too long a period here. Just give me one minute. <laughs> the one Richard has is really good too. It has fire though as well, which is awesome. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Do that. That's great. Yeah. Do you have a quick link to that one, Richard, from the block? Which one? The electronic music cymatics one, the intro on your first post. Oh, right. Google uh, Nigel Stanford cymatics. Nigel Stanford? Nigel Stanford cymatics, yeah.
Anyone studied Rudolf Steiner much? No. I don't know, man. <laughs> Anyone in particular? Because I see several here. So we'll just run this straight from Nigel John Stanford's channel. This is Cymatic Science versus Music. Yeah, I think it's that one. Yeah, I think so too. Four minutes long or something, Josh? <laughs> That's almost six, like 5.52 is what this says. Yeah, 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 I think that's it. The film you're about to see has no characters. If you spare a little of your imagination, it is a film to describe to you the effect of cymatic frequencies on matter. It's going to get us a copyright strike. I don't think so. We've credited him. Shouldn't. It's from his. It's from his channel, and we've given him the credit. And we're discussing it. We're talking it. Talking about it. And it's for educational cool. purposes. It is very cool. <laughs> I want to do this. Thanks for getting rid of the ad. there then Josh King is that you with orange hair no this is this is me I'm I'm from Oak News Media oh. oh yeah hi oh yeah yeah I'm a I'm a communist capitalist so <laughs> what does that mean <laughs> um I mean essentially it's a it's a deviation from ANCAPS Anarchist communist, um, or an or anarchist capitalist, excuse me. Uh, it's just, 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 uh, it's just a deviation, a denomination of it. So, describing it, that's what it is. Okay, cool. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah. Welcome. Are you, Thank you. Are you a flat earther? A flat earther? Oh, uh, I'm getting, I'm getting into yeah. that. Ah, uh, sorry. My that's a good place to start. Sorry, man. I just like dyed my hair like a week ago, so <laughs> that, that, that guy down well with your mates. So is that what you think the Earth looks like? What, what happened to the uh, What happened to the video? Where did Josh go? Mm, I don't know. He's still playing the video. There it is. Here is it not playing? It's it's now. It didn't for a minute. It glitched up. Something happened. I see. You no, know, somebody's playing with me. What's 
Ja. Good yeah, whoever keeps coughing, could you please mute? Seriously. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> See you later, it work. <laughs> what the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> What do you say? He was an ant cap, something like that, or ant com? Communist yeah. capitalist. <laughs> he was a what? <laughs> a communist capitalist. Oh, is that what it was? A communist capitalist, which was an offshoot of the anarcho capitalist. <laughs> right. I think I think it's only beginning with a C. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So back to the music. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, that's an amazing so it seems like that was an really extended great. version. Seems like I'd seen maybe two separate videos of that one split up. I don't remember seeing all of that together at once in one video. That was crazy. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Nigel. Who's Nigel? That was Nigel's video. Nigel Stanford. He's the, oh, right, he's the right. guy that made the channel, made the video, and put the channel up, <laughs> put the video up on his channel for us to stream here on YouTube. So thanks again, Nigel. So I can say, <laughs> who's Nigel? <laughs> oh, Why do we always go to rat shit when we go live, eh? Where is everyone? Take your fucking mutes off. Come on. Let's get to No, talking. I'm right here. We were, we were <laughs> listening to the video. But yeah, the music is always... Uh, a connection to me, like finding connections, finding the details, finding the predictive. Did you find that by... um, meatloaf one? Oh Did... yeah, I looked it up. Is... It was great. Oh, Is it on that album? Hey, no, that's where hell? It's... no, it's not on Bad Out of Hell. Um, ah. It's on the uh... <sighs> the next one. I forgot I'm what sure I'd called. remember yeah. it if it was a Bad Out of Hell. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's I was my a wheelhouse. huge Meatloaf fan. I was a huge, for that album I was, I used to know everything on it. That's my, uh, that was my go-to karaoke song, two out of three and bad. We should do flatter karaoke. No, then we, we get shouldn't. plenty of copyrights back. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's just great where the music always shows you clues. I was walking by a guy doing a live acoustic set Saturday night at a art walk, at an art walk here in a, the lyrics were about flat earth. I posted them in our chat the other night. It's called uh, Small Town Saturday Night by Hal Ketchum. Pull up Hal those Ketchum. lyrics. Yeah, pull up those lyrics, Josh, and put those. That ought to be all right just to show that. 
And like I said, as I walk by, he's singing about the flat earth. I gave him a big you and a whistle. <laughs> what was he singing? It was uh, it was that song, uh, Small Town Saturday Night. Josh is about to pull the lyrics up. I don't know it well enough to even quote him right anymore. I sent them to you guys that night, and then my significant other knows the actual song. So it's really just one verse from the song. Yeah, like halfway uh, down, I think. Yeah, Bobby told Lucy the world ain't round. Drops off sharp at the edge of town. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Lucy, you know the world must be flat, because when people leave town, they never come back. Yeah, Yeah, a friend sent me a link to that about a year ago. After I dropped the, the flat earth bombshell on him. Hello. Who is Hello. This? Hello. Welcome. Hi. Um, my, my friend Peter sent me here actually. Peter welcome. Yeah, oh. yeah. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Yeah, I'm a female, so <laughs> my my voice is here too. So he might chime in in a little bit. <laughs> so if I my voice changes randomly, that might be him in the background <laughs> or him talking. So. How did you find this? Um, well, I met Peter. We we were um, on Overwatch. What? I just rhymed back. What's going on, guys? <laughs> um, and he sent me the invite. Sorry, he sent me the invite, and um, I'm I'm intrigued to be honest. So, you know, I I've it's never not, really heard. It's not me. It's not me, Peter. It must be a different Peter, just to say. <laughs> oh well, really, that's that's interesting. My bad. I'm. What was that over Twitter? So I, I, have a, I just have a few questions because I was educated by the public school systems. Um, uh, so so and we we were we were taught that obviously the Earth is round, mm-hmm. and you want to talk? Is there if my boyfriend gets on? Sure. Okay. Possibly. <laughs> Hello. Hi. 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 Uh, Hi. I, I, I'm just, she's, she's a cold right now, so she can't really talk. Um, we just, we just have a few questions, you know, we're, we're getting into the whole, uh, flat earth thing, I guess you could say. Um, mm-hmm. but we're just kind of interested, like, because there, there is some, there is some evidence you have to admit that kind of goes against it. And then there is a lot of evidence that goes for it. Um, so I like, would not say that I would say there's some evidence that wouldn't prove one way or the other uh-huh. and some that might be able to prove both. I mean, most of the evidence that they have is kind of faulty at it, as, it, as its base, so we can't necessarily use it. Things like Aristophanes. Uh, right. I, I just have a question. Like, do you guys believe that every single every single video they come out of space where the Earth is where the Earth is round? Do you believe that's fake, photoshopped, or edited in some way? If, it's, if, yes. they, if they say it's coming out of space, then yes. Have you okay. seen the movie Gravity? Yep. Um, I've heard of it, but I've not seen it. Fantastic. I mean, Fantastic high altitude. CGI. Fantastic. High altitude plane <laughs> with a, a fisheye lens on it would um, give you a curved looking mm-hmm. Earth. So, uh, are you, as have, have you, you seen, seen the, uh, have you have seen seen the seen... Fun Gardener jump? Mm-hmm. That have was, you seen the water uh, bubbles in space? Every spacewalk. Have I seen what? The water, water, bubbles. water bubbles in space, inside the I, ISS, uh, coming out yeah, yeah, of okay, uh, yeah, coming yeah, out of astronauts' helmet. Canadian guy. Yeah. What what about those? So you still think well, NASA we told space is a vacuum? Yeah. Water appearing, and they train for they train for the spacewalk in a pool. So you can draw your own conclusions from that. I think. Mm-hmm. So what, I, what, I just, do you, what, what do you hold as concrete that space is real? Um, well, um, I mean, not necessarily space, um, more uh, the Earth is round, because obviously, you know, uh, like what about, you know, you guys are obviously familiar with like the whole flat, with the whole like ship where the farther it goes away, it looks like it's disappearing from the top. From the bottom. Yeah, from the, from the bottom. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. How do you, how do you yeah, explain that? Million. Just out, just out of curiosity. Limits of human vision. Who, who wants to take that? <laughs> that I'm doesn't matter. You. I'm Sorry. happy to take it's it. Simple limits of human um, vision. Or a really, really good camera. You that if you, if you can get, uh, you'll get into the bottom of that boat. Of, 
You're cr- cracking up, bro. Uh, you're 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 really your voice is choppy right now, man. I can't really hear you. Sorry, guys. Um, I've done that experiment myself, where I go down the uh, and um, mm-hmm. I get a, a boat from about seven miles away and zoom straight in on the bottom of that boat. From I was two feet off the water, with the vert two feet off the water. See the bottom of the boat curve at that that stage should be about thirty feet any of that boat so that is a really bad um example of a proving a globe birth because that's not what happens does that sort of answer your question there um to be uh, honest not really but i mean I, okay, I guess well, the, the gist of it was right the gist of it is, is you go down the beach and you go to the seafront and mm-hmm. you watch a boat with your eyes sailing away from you yeah. And at some point, that boat is going to be invisible to your eyes. It's going to disappear from the hull first, from the bottom That's up. Right. It'll disappear. It'll yep. disappear from, from your sight. And at that point, you, the, the, what is agreed by on the ball earth is that that boat has gone over the horizon. And what we're saying is, is that if you take some optics... Uh, binoculars or telescope or a zoom lens you can zoom right back in on that boat and see it from the water touching the hull of the boat for another certain distance of time and then it will go out of view again then if you jump on your telescope then you'll be able to see that boat again but but horizontal view across air atmosphere air is is finite it's not infinite does that make better sense yeah i i suppose so so it's um, all about a perspective and your line of sight so it's just um, pers- there's you can only see so far so, you, can, you, can, you can bring the boat back into view the more powerful zoom you've got you can bring it back into view proving it hasn't gone over uh, a curve it's still there you just cannot see it with the naked eye and eventually no matter how powerful the optics you're using eventually it is going to disappear basically that's the, and that's when it disappears it doesn't go below horizon it just amorphously blobs out of existence i've watched the sun do that with a telescope okay. back to rob's point at seven miles according if we lived on a ball rob should not be able to see it so the fact that he can do it even at seven miles proves that it's flat and not a sphere yeah. or oblate spheroid yeah i was to a bridge in new orleans that's 24 miles long flat perfectly that lacks over 300 feet of curvature yeah mm-hmm. you know, i've got another great example i've got another great great example um I, i've got an island off the coast here that's about 33 miles away now recently i went uh closer to that island by uh we went on a little uh a weekend away to a island to another island that's closer so that island is now 20 miles away instead of 33 miles. Now I'm, st- I'm still seeing that island the same shape. Now if I had have been 13 miles closer, mm-hmm. I've done the calculations and I should be seeing 400 feet more of that island, but that's not the case. So it, it, the, it's the same shape, no matter. It, it obviously the island's bigger because it, you're closer to it, but you're mm-hmm. but it's the same shape. So therefore, yeah. You know, no, I've you done know the I'm same, saying. Rob. I've done the same here in uh, the UK, from Seton in Devon, being able to see the Isle of Portland in uh, Dorset, which is 30 miles away, when the whole island should have been obscured by the curve, using their spherical maths. So do you uh, believe... Just, just out of curiosity, do you believe it's impossible? Uh, if I remember correctly, I heard someone said it's impossible to get over the atmosphere. Is that true? Impossible to what? Sorry. To, to get o- to get over the atmosphere. Over it, as in out of it. Yeah, as in as in like into space. Uh, yeah. There's been no evidence put forward that is uh, in any way convincing that anyone's been higher than. I, I don't know, call it 200 miles. I have no idea. But NASA it, themselves it, 
put astronauts into a th almost 250 mile quote-unquote orbit allegedly in a shuttle mission in the 80s and they experiencing shooting stars through their closed eyes that means the radiation from the van allen belt was penetrating the shuttle their helmets and their skulls and registering on their retinas and at that point they issued an announcement they would never send astronauts that high again until they figured out how to deal with the radiation belt which we allegedly went through six times in the early 60s i mean late 60s early 70s it makes no sense if you put all those pieces together my friend it just doesn't I've, I've actually compiled a few of these examples, uh, the Chicago skyline, uh, Bear Mountain, New Jersey to New York, uh, and Santa Barbara, California, uh, in my blog posts. I mean, it might be easier to visualize if you have some examples in front of you with photographs and videos uh, rather than just over the air. Um, and, yeah, as, as uh, John was saying about the, the space, I mean, the Val Allen belts is nothing else than just, you know, the limit of where astronauts could fly. I mean, I'll say astronauts, they're not really astronauts. It's just um, people faking that they're going to space. So, uh, like, what what is the point of though faking that the Earth is the Earth is round? Is it just something well, snowballing? Hiding, it's hiding a crater, I think, is would be the big so one. You have to think. Imagine, imagine you. I mean, if, if you live on a ball and then you live on on flat Earth, you have two different options. Think about where you're moved, metaphysically and spiritually. Uh, in terms of your belief in who you are uh, and where you are, if you're, if they make you, if they convince you that you're on a ball instead of on a flat Earth, um, you, I mean, it's no surprise that we're seeing uh, society being completely nihilistic, selfish, greedy. You know, the complete opposite of what society would be like if people actually knew that they had a creator and you know a, a, a purpose in life, really. So, who who is this creator? The creator. And I'll just say, Eddie, you're, you're asking some great questions here as well. And, and the, the why is, you know, the, it's like an onion. There's so many, so layers, many layers to it. Yes. The, yeah. You know, Control you can take a materialistic, a uh, capitalistic layer and, and show how the ball shows us that we're on a finite planet, that we're insignificant little ball of dust. It's a finite planet. Um, and therefore we can introduce scarcity to control the masses, i.e. scarcity of water, i.e. overpopulation, i.e. carbon dioxide release, you name it. If you're living on a Don't forget about isolated aliens. ball. Uh, alien deception. <laughs> yeah, that was next. Well, Space yeah. deception with asteroids being able to destroy us at any second and sun going out. Yeah, or but going if they wanted to control us, they, they, I mean, even if it was a flat Earth, there would still be finite resources. No. Well, that's what they're trying to do with this dome terrarium theory that everybody's putting forward. Because I just don't think it's that dome terrarium. That's still a containment vessel that keeps us locked in. Because I don't know about you, Eddie, but uh, I've never sailed south from South Africa, South America, or Australia. I've never sailed north either from uh, 99 point recurring nines percent of us have never been anywhere near those regions so we don't know what's there another layer of the onion is that they're hiding land numerous maps are coming out now where they're they're showing land beyond the boundaries of what would, we've been told would a is pilot there. be able to see that though again human vision has limits well, a pilot only gets up to, well, 36,000 feet, 40,000 feet, maybe. 47. Um, yeah, there are, there are many pilots out there now that, for obvious reasons, are keeping stum, but they know full well that it's a flat Earth just because they understand the properties of a gyroscope. So you believe that every single pilot's in on it, so to speak? No. No. Well, they, like, they've no. gone to the same school that we went to. They've been taught the same stuff that we taught. When they look out of a window, they see a curve because they've been told there's a curve. But when you wake a pilot up and they actually look out the window, they see as little of a curve as we do. Uh, okay. There's also, there's also the issue of 
there's also the issue of the lack of spin. I mean, I've just taken a flight today and, you know, you look out the window, you're, you're high above the ground, the ground is moving beneath you with the speed of the plane, nothing to do with the earth moving beneath you at all. Mm -hmm. So what, what is, if the earth is flat, what is keeping the water in? Think of the a pond, as, as David Weiss says, think, think of a pond down the park and that pond has got um, a circumference around it, which is like a, a concrete or asphalt path. Do you, are you with me so far? Yeah. Okay. And in the middle of that pond, there are several little islands that are above the, the height of the water. Uh, that's where we live at the pond's edge. Um, what we're told is basically there is an ice wall that is Antarctica that is all around us and it's a couple of miles high and it essentially holds the water in. But again, I will stress, none of us have bloody been there to attest to this. Or few of us. You, you can go to, uh, you can go to uh, Antarctica like you can go to North Korea, basically. They'll, they'll yeah. show you what they want you to see. It costs you a fortune to go there. And, you know, you're, you're showing the bits they want you to see and that's it. It's yeah. a very you go by the palace. I've, 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 yeah, I've, you go by the deception. I've, I've broken down the Antarctic Treaty System and the United States State Department uh, laws uh, in post-22, um, uh, you know, basically showing that, you know, you can't go there unless you're supervised. And even when you're supervised, there's significant restrictions on what you can see and where you can go. So what tourists are being shown when they go to Antarctica off the Chilean uh, southern coast is just a small peninsula of the entire you know what they call a continent um and if, yeah, and is, it, is it deception island? and if you do is it try deception and go there yourself it is you, you'll get the same island, response yarlandahoy yes, has tried to go there without permission and yeah. you can read his um you can read what happened his, to him his his um when he was on the ice you know with a quad bike you know driving away he got an emergency signal from his boat uh, lost three crew members but not what, what happened to the rest of the crew though the crew and the boat uh, were um, disappeared yeah well, so three 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 of uh, his friends who were on the boat uh, you know disappeared basically the boat sank supposedly uh, and every time he tries to go back, he just gets arrested by, you know, the Chilean Coast Guard or a New Zealand Navy or someone. Uh, and he's been fighting, you know, the Norwegian court system for the last two, three years. Um, you know, he could just be a fake story, but, you know, that's the only story we've heard. And, you know, it's, it matches up with what the entire treaty system uh, rules say about going there. <laughs> oh, I can take you're interested cruise in from the bottom of Australia. Uh, down there as a tourist, it's going to cost me 27,000 bucks for the week, a, a, a cruise. But if I just go, if I just take a cruise around uh, the Pacific Islands here for a week, it's only going to cost me $1,000. But if I go down there, it's 27,000. Work that one out. Uh, and if you I, go, I, I, there's all these weird law, I mean, rules and laws about not bringing fossil fuels and not having food out on the decks and all these weird, weird rules. Mm -hmm. Is it this? You can't get below the 60th parallel with fuel on board, or or you can't stand on deck with food or anything like that. Correct. No smoking. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So what about what about all the scientists in Antarctica? Because there's there's a lot of them now. Mm -hmm. Are they all in on it? They're very com compartmentalized. I mean, if there's a story, and I can't remember, maybe one of you guys will know, um, of a plumber. He came out, he worked there on a stint, and he explains, you know, the processes and where the bases are in relation to each other. He was a maintenance worker or something. It's Doom Weaver on YouTube. Doom Weaver. Right. Correct. Yeah. Robert. Thanks, John. John. But he, the the way he lays it out is is in a very you know compartmentalized way. There's like a a central area. There's certain tunnels, and and it's a very small area where all these scientists actually work. Very small. Mm -hmm. But every single scientist working there. 
is it on? That's no. no. That's exactly what no, he's saying. Exactly. Most of them aren't in on it. Most yeah, of them they, are doing no, their job. They no idea. They're trying they to just... make their bills and yeah. feed their kids and make their way in their scientific Eddie. discoveries. And you know, Eddie, have, have you ever food. have you ever been to the so-called southern hemisphere? <laughs> Eddie. Okay. Has anyone ever been to the southern hemisphere? Not me. Uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm born in Brazil, so yeah. <laughs> okay, have you been to the Northern Hemisphere? Yeah, I'm, I'm Swedish, so I lived in Sweden for a while. <laughs> who am I talking to now? Got it, got it all covered. <laughs> I don't know who I'm Richard talking Trump. to. That's Richard, he's the man. <laughs> okay, well the point is, is that, I mean, similarly, I've been to the Northern Hemisphere, the Equator, and the Southern Hemisphere, but not as a flat earther. So when I was at the equator, I wasn't looking at the stars to see which direction they went. When I was in the southern hemisphere, I wasn't looking to see if the uh, southern cross mm -hmm. went around a, a, an equivalent Polaris in the south. Uh, the fact is, is that basically most of the time we sleepwalk through life. We don't look at obvious things around us. How many of us knew that moonlight was cold compared to moonshade um, until not, a couple of years ago. Like yeah, quite. Yeah, so I mean, but it's that a great point, simple experiment right there tells you and shows you how you can go down your library and see how your science books are lying to you blatantly when that is such a simple experiment to, to do. And you can find out right there you're being lied to. So that should be a red flag there's, enough for there's anyone. Also, there's also the fact that uh, no one's ever circumnavigated north to south. North you know, no south one's actually north. gone around the world. No, yeah, exactly, exactly. Absolutely. I mean, that's a clanger, an yep. enormous but, clanger. Yeah. But, but there's too John. much ice. But, but they say they do, John. John. They say that they do. But what they do is they just go down and they follow the same path back again. So they're that's not right. actually they're going exactly. yeah. around the world. Right, but yeah, they yeah. Or they go to the South Pole and they turn around 180 and they come back. Or the North Pole, they do a 180 and they come back. They never carry on and come out the other side. The argument, of, the argument about there being too much ice. If you're in an aeroplane, it makes no difference. You should be able to fly. If the Earth is a ball, you should be able to fly all the way around it in any which way direction you choose and end up at the same place. But the, no one's ever done that either. They've got no problem flying planes over the South Pole. Why is that? Why, what is the official reason that they would say if you were to play naive and ask somebody? What do they say? What I mean, about the weather in Antarctica? Navigation. The weather in Antarctica could be pretty bad. So I mean, that's what I've heard is the temperatures. They're, they're, they're saying it's too cold the for the planes. I'm guessing. I mean, considering they use a special plane to fly over the North Pole, not just normal like. Normal passenger like 747, 767, anything like that. They use a special kind. I forget what it's called. Yeah, special okay. because it's got no windows. So, what if yeah. somebody started a crowdfunding thing that was like, "I'm gonna be the first one in the history of the world to go north to south, baby. I need a half a million, and I'm gonna build some." They would get oh, shut down. Oh, they, they are. It would be yeah, your well, Tower of Babel, mate. This is this is math powerland territory here. He's got a whole plan worked out. I bet you he's got pictures and everything storyboarded out. It's never going to happen. It's like a it's leapfrogging. I don't know. Sir Reginald Farquhar of the third Baroness <laughs> dynasty uh, made it on his own. All his all his teammates died. Uh, unexpectedly, and yeah, he popped out the other side in a capsule. It's and his diary been. will be released posthumously. His diary, and yeah, he would be free, five books be a already written. Well. Yeah, he would be a Freemason too. He'd be his uncle's master name is Rothschild. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John. Matt, Matt Boylan, Matt Powerland, whatever you want to call him. He the Jesuit or went to Jesuit college, as far as I remember. From what I can tell, I almost like everyone's gone to a Jesuit college. <laughs> uh, real quick about the North versus the South. Another thing about this whole model that you're presented in school. The 23 degree tilt every six months should present the southern 
pole with just as much sun as it gives the northern pole on the other side every six months. Yep. That doesn't happen because there's life and tundra and all these things in the north that never happen in the south. That's nope. why the ice is thicker and it's hard to navigate. And only Admiral Birds were the first one, his crews were the first ones to go down there because it's totally different north to south. It should be the same exact every six months. Have, have you ever noticed that, um, you know, the tilt 23.4 degrees, if you do, you know, yes, the opposite, 19, 19 minus 23.4, you get that lovely number, 66.6. Which is everywhere in science. I mean, of you've course. got the speed, the speed of the sun, six, sixty-six thousand six hundred miles per hour. Then you got the the year that the apple fell on Newton's head, sixteen sixty-six. Uh, oh, that's great! What? That's classic. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> it repeats itself every, every you know, everywhere. <laughs> but they won't. They won't tell you that it's sixty-six sixty-six thousand six hundred miles per hour. They'll tell you it in in meters per second, or or you know, another unit. That'll you know, won't 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 make it obvious. Yeah, they like doing that. Like three hundred and thirty-three. Yeah, slight tangent on that is the 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 uh, the speed of light matching the the um the pyramid, yeah. the location of the pyramid in Giza. That's that's just a, a really random one, but it's uh, one that resonates for sure. That's just reverse engineering by the the amount of times they change the yeah. speed of light. Yeah. And the amount of times they've changed the distance to the sun. To the sun, yeah. Well, I, I mean, yeah. so you, just to go back to your 666 thing, you said that Newton, the apple film, is in 1666 and like all that? Yeah. Is that all a coincidence or? Um, who you are. <laughs> it's the history they've given us. That's all we can go by. And usually that's. I don't, I, I don't believe in coincidences. If I if I remember correctly though, the apple fell on Newton's head in sixteen eighty seven or sixteen eighty six. No, so he sixteen sixty was when the Royal Society was founded. Uh -huh. Sixteen sixty six was when Newton had the apple on his head, and sixteen eighty seven was when uh, Mathematica Principia was published. Uh, thank you. Which was, which was Newton's uh, you know document explaining which gravity. Which begins with the word, yes. if. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. ends with then, yeah, if then. <laughs> Similar to Darwin's theories, if. They're all if. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're all theories for a reason. Scientific theory, though. <laughs> <laughs> have have so you guys right? ever, uh, ever challenged a teacher or professor? God, yeah. Many times, many times, <laughs> they will not and, come here with us. And, and what has happened? They, they have basically they repeat, repeat off the record. They repeat and regurgitate what they've been taught. Actually, I recommend um, if you look down John's page, he actually does a very good job against a physics teacher. And it's not really against; it's more of like a question and reasoning process they go through but it's it's exactly what you're asking about it's a challenge between a, a teacher and a a zetatist <laughs> which one was that Jay? The, the guy you were on with to, for about two days he was a physics professor i think and yeah, he was, was a, a teacher a particle, yeah, yeah. particle physicist from yeah, yeah there you go yeah yeah, that was one of them. But yeah, no, there's been several PhDs. There's been a bolometer expert from Cardiff University who, to this date now, has still not managed to. Uh, I mean, a bolometer expert measures difference in radiation in heat radiation, and he was interested in my comment or claim that the. Full, uh, the um, moon rays were colder than the moon shade um, and yet now and that was back in January so 10 months on he still can't uh, find the time to test it he invited me up to Cardiff University several times I might take him up on it actually. you need to you like and we'll, we'll you should film it and we'll be there the trouble is the weather in the UK 
you know, I could visit him every weekend for the next four months and still never get a night where we could actually do it. Right. But that doesn't John... put it, oh, because I've done it five times since then, so he's got no excuse, really. John, you have a fan I, I on our live a... chat on YouTube. It's uh, it's Richard's computer fan member. We got to get him a new fan. <laughs> is, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> yeah, it's not me tonight. It's uh, 17 degrees in here, balmy. No, you misunderstand. Hmm. There is someone who is fond of your work on Twitter commenting in our live chat on YouTube. He's a oh, fan a of your fan. work. A oh, fan. sorry, Josh. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, Brian, last I'm name. So <laughs> yeah. He says, shout out to John Savage, tirelessly smashing Twitter trolls. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. like there you go. He would like to talk about rocket scientists. Who they? Uh, who are they? And what course of study is this? Is his question. Yeah, rocket scientists. Who are they? And what course of One more study? time for me. I'm a little slow. Can you say yeah. that again? Well, he's virtually asking, "How do you become a rocket scientist?" That's virtually what he's, what he's asking. Yeah. You know, are they really who they say they are? What are, are the qualifications and all that? It's roughly the same as a theoretical particle physicist. Surely, it's it's theoretical. Um, it depends what you classify as rocket scientist, because I mean, someone studying mechanical engineering in a university studies, you know, propulsion to a certain degree. That's you know, you could call yourself a rocket scientist. Yeah, it depends whether it's within whether we're we're the the parameters of what we're talking about is within our known atmosphere or whether we're talking about it popping out into zero g infinite vacuum of space that sort of rocket scientist as far as i'm concerned is pure theoretical but there's obviously you can build rockets and send them up into into the air and there's a hell of a lot of science in that i used to do it a lot as a teenager Not sure Rocket if that's man. the question or whether that answers it, but um, cheers to Brian. Last name. <laughs> Bueller. I know someone we should probably invite that probably could answer his questions about rocket thrust and things like that. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> Are you a rocket thrust denier? <laughs> anyway, as soon on. as someone can prove space to me, then we can talk rockets. Until they can prove space and the infinite vacuum of space, then it's pointless talking rockets. Indeed. I recently watched a. Um... Uh, seconds from disaster show. I don't know why I was watching it. I just turned on the TV late at night and it was on. Um, and there was a American destroyer getting attacked by a couple of um, fighters. Uh, I can't remember what country the uh, fighters were from, maybe Iran or something like that. Anyway, the uh, radar operator on the ship was picking these uh, fighters up from 400 kilometres away. And they weren't they weren't very high up off the ground, off off the off the water I should say. Okay. Um, so <laughs> all these little things you see when you become a questioner, awake. You, know, you, you 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 see these things, and it goes back to Mark Sargent. You know, Mark Sargent had that um, dude on that he was um, a weapons instructor or something like that on one of these boats one of these ships and he was shooting things 60 miles away, you know, and that's about you know, 2000 feet of curvature there. With laser sights, um, but, laser sights. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And they need, they need, sure they need to paint prairie. those targets, but, but these things were, were 400 kilometers away. 
that is a massive yeah. amount of curvature at 400 kilometers. Speaking of guns, Rob, good, great point, by the way, but have, have you guys looked into the uh, rail gun? Yeah. That's, that's a proof right there as well. 150 mile range. Yep. It's a magnetic rail gun. And it's accurate to 150 miles. Now, unless that thing goes around the curve of the Earth. Does that need to paint targets as well, John, does it? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's non-propelled. So it's, it's, they, have to, they have to see what they're... Well, they, I presume they do it through radar. I'll tell you, it looks like the gun doesn't move very much at all. <laughs> It's about 150 foot long, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I was talking to an air traffic controller the other day. I was asking him whether he could see planes landing at a, an air, airport, which was 150 miles away. He was going, yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. But I think he, were, he was cottoning on to what I was getting at. So he was getting a bit cagey after that. But then he doesn't agree with chemtrail. He doesn't know what, or he, he thinks I'm a lunatic for talking about chemtrails. Wasn't there just a, a large protest in Italy uh, of the chemtrails by pilots, or was that a false story? I don't know. Didn't hear about it. Did we lose Ali and all the others? I think so. King okay. Unitas is still here, but I think. Uh... Whoever that was, his girlfriend's account, something. I don't know. That whole hey, setup. He weird. had some good questions, though, didn't he? He did. He had some really good questions. It just seemed like a very strange, strange setup. I'm glad it ended well. I think we're, we're, we should be used to strange setups. I was worried it was going to turn into a Afrocentrist. No racist. And the muffle equidistant. <laughs> racist. The snow is white. How can the snow be white? <laughs> I still can't, can't quite get my head around that one. <laughs> Sorry, but no, he was he was asking some good questions. I mean, there was um, I can't remember what he was talking about. Now was it Antarctica? Uh, ships over the horizon. There were several. Hmm. So I'll tell you we got any more? We got any more questions? Um. I didn't catch that dude's name that was um, asking us questions before. Has he got any more? Idi Amin, <laughs> I think. And yeah, who is See, Idi Amin? I, I mean, I, I know listen, who he is, but um, look, I she said that she got the invitation from some guy named Peter, but it's not. It wasn't me. Our Peter. <laughs> <laughs> no. So some random person just hmm. happened to have our join link. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, strange, but they were good questions. It was a good, it was a good interaction. Absolutely. But, but for her friend Peter to give her that link to call and introduce her boyfriend to have him get on the line and ask the questions just seemed really strange. Yeah, that would be well, weird. I feel I feel with people like I feel with people like that. This is how it works. Like that. You so. just need to just need to point them in the direction of uh, one of a million YouTube videos, and they could get a lot of answers there. Do you know what I mean? Like that that's that would be my way of uh, kind of going back with them. They can oh, find out that a load of that information for themselves. You can yeah, also you can. Find, you can send them my <laughs> way. Like my oh yeah, so troll, like my personal trial. They don't watch YouTube. They don't. Nah. They don't believe anything that's on YouTube. Idi Amin. Well, they believe everything that's the president television. of Uganda. <laughs> Sorry, just thought I put that in there. <laughs> oh. We're in the presence of uh, <laughs> our esteemed, someone quite esteemed. Then. <laughs> oh, he said he was a uh, Muslim as well, didn't he? Mm. No, different. Oh, was that was the that first. Oh no, that, that, that was, was the, was, you know, was that the was the racist. That was the yeah. troll. That was the racist snow guy. That was, snow is racist, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's I think you should call him Snowman it. from now on. Was yeah. there yeah. someone saying is. snow is racist? Did I miss that? Yes. Oh, yeah. dude. Yeah. Yeah. I like snow. Yeah. 
white is it snow being white is a conspiracy theory against a every wild <laughs> thing we would diffuse and, and then it would get more wild he started by saying that um flat earth is racist because europe is in the center and europe is where white people come from and it's racist <laughs> against black people so we diffuse that and then it was like something else we diffuse that and then finally he's like yeah well snow's white or something <laughs> it was it was pretty fun was that that's it? What, yeah, anyway, guys, I'm gonna have back? to go tonight. Who's I'm gonna that? have to go tonight. So, is, uh, thanks for your time, by the way. It's Peter. Peter, good to meet you, Peter. Yes, Peter. Yeah, please I'm, come back again. Yeah, and you are, guys, are you on Twitter, and, Peter? I'll come back. I'll come back. Nice I am indeed at Peter. <laughs> at Peter Felt, F E L T H. He's a he's yeah. he's in he's, he's a he's in a our friend. chat. He's a good guy. Smart. He's in my yeah. follow. Oh, I think I'm following you already. Yep. Glad to finally hear you, Peter. Yeah, cheers for that. Yeah, and you guys, nice, nice talking to you. Thank you. Thank you, too, Peter. Cheers, yeah, man. Richard. Cheers, guys. Oh, we need some more questions. So I've got a question for you. Just, uh, I'm, I'm, I think I know the answer, but I just want to hear what um, some of you guys think. Um, if you think of density. Uh, as the reason why, uh, you know, density is gravity in, in, in a simple sense, and then you've got electromagnetism. Um, but a question that I get asked a lot is, okay, so it's density, but why is, you know, why, do every, why does everything layer itself, you know, downwards and not sideways or any other way? Uh, why is downwards taken as the default uh, if there's no gravity? Just keen to hear what you got, how, how you guys would answer that. My default answer is I have no idea. My default answer would be because only on a flat Earth is there a down. <laughs> but then there's gravity, isn't there? That's that's the retort that you know I get whenever I tell them you know that answer. Well, I mean, everything goes down because of density. I mean, you put a toy in a cereal box and you shake it, the toy settles at the bottom. But then why why, why why would why would it you know necessarily be down? That's the default just playing devil's advocate here no this I mean, i've I, had this several times richard you, you know but why down why why is your why is your feet down i think i mean, uh, I mean ultimately i'd speculate it's due to the electromagnetic setup of the whole, whole structure yeah but i don't I, I don't know that all That's, i know is that what what throws get thrown up if down, down was the other way around then we would be poking up the other way, and then we would think that was normal anyway. Yeah, I mean, the, the, well, you the, do, do Rob. You're an odd. The explanation <laughs> I would would think is, you know, if we live inside a torus field, uh, the the field lines on the top half of that torus, uh, you know, apple torus shape, would be downwards. Um, so it would make sense that uh, things would be down. Another thing that I've seen, another explanation would be that, um, you know, there's a vortex pushing things down, um, which is an interesting theory. Yeah. It, it's I mean, an there, interesting there question. There must be something that keeps, you know, the sun and the moon spinning like it does, like the, you know, the, the weather, it's, it's all moving. You know, if you look at the azimuthal weather patterns, uh, it's circular. Um, and there must be some motor or some vortex of some sort that's keeping it, you know, moving. And I'm thinking that that vortex uh, keeps things pressed down in a way. Like uh, the, the salt in the ocean. Be, I mean, the the salt in the ocean uh, is why you get tides because salt water is more electromagnetic conductive than sweet water, um, which is why you get heavier tides in the oceans than in in lakes, which don't have much salt. Um, mm. In, in one of the question. theories, it, it's like a battery. The salt is the power for the battery for the system. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Mm. Exactly. That's that's what it is. Yeah. 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 It's a, it's a really interesting but philosophical question without us being able to find a frame of reference, as in being able to you know get high enough or further enough away from the Earth to be able to see what the Earth is in order to say why this is down and why this is up it's yeah it, it's just one of those things and and not something i'm scared of to say that i don't know yeah 
I mean, I, I, I don't want to, I'm, uh, the reason I ask, I'm writing a, a blog post on gravity. I've uh, been working on it a while, actually, and hmm. uh, I don't want to leave loose ends like that to give people, uh, you know, skeptics something to hang on to. I want to just kill all the arguments, and I don't want to be like, yeah, we don't know why it's down, because then people okay. are going to say, well, that's gravity then, right? Give uh, the enemy except, no foothold. Yeah, exactly. I just want to, like, shoot everything down as it, uh, you know, as it comes. Uh, and the argument, what I'm thinking of presenting is that it's, it's electromagnetic, uh, either that or a vortex. Uh, which makes sense to me, but I don't have any proof for it, really. Um, oh, I think it's the most logical explanation, but um, you may want to stick a caveat in there or even a blog post in there about it, the fact that we don't want to jump from pretending we know everything on a ball earth to pretending we know everything on a flat earth because we have, we, we've had no funding, we, we've had no explorations dedicated to finding flat earth stuff out. Um, you know, we know so little about what we, what we are in other than the, the absolute basics of things like water finds its level. Um, you know, I shouldn't be able to see this island over however many miles away and you know, gyroscopes wouldn't work on a spinning ball. The, these little straws that we grasp at, that's all we've got. Uh, I don't think we should jump from the, the fire uh, into the frying pan of, of pretending or even claiming that we have ideas of how to explain all these things. But, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think electromagnetism is is the likely um, answer to, to what you're why up is up and down down mm -hmm. but the things you say john that are you know that's all we've got those things that all we've got are huge gyroscopes are huge and seeing it's, how far we can see is huge it's all we need it's yeah. all we need to keep going to, it's to all smash we need paradigms to be able to say categorically that we don't live on a spinning ball yeah, absolutely, and, and the likelihood yes. is that it's flat because water finds its level, and, and all and, the oceans are and connected. It's, it's really an adventure, too, John, because knowing just that, the possibilities are endless of what it mm. really is, and we're all trying to figure out what that is. Well, two years ago, we all thought we lived on a spinning ball. I mean, how far have we come since then? Well, what did you say yesterday about waking up or the psyop stuff? That was gold. Can you say that again? Yeah, it was just sort of hilarious me. when uh, I first heard people saying that the flat Earth was a psyop, and I would always just tweet back, "Right, best psyop ever." Yeah. It wakes you up to all the lies around you and makes you want to show others all the lies. So, yeah, go ahead, keep bringing those psyops at me. But if, yeah. if we play. If we play devil's advocate, like what what could be a reason for the psyop? I mean, the, the, I've seen evidence that the flat Earth did get a lot of funding, you know, beginning of last year. Um, so, well, if you look back over YouTube analytics, it's peaked numerous times since the early 2000s. Like it's peaked, it peaked in 2009, it peaked in like 2003. So it's had these little peaks. This has just been the biggest peak ever. I think they saw that coming with their analytics and all their computer, you know, projections and got ready for it with people like the ones who are currently being accused of being shills, et cetera. I still haven't settled on any of that. I just kind of use my own discernment at this point. I've seen so many lies torn apart before me in this last year and a half, two years I mean, went on. So, Have, have you seen the stuff on uh, Eric Dubay and CIA? connection oh yeah i mean that he, as well. he, he kind of uh get, got in ahead of the game there with his book he um, did. conspiracy and then i mean at least yeah. speaking from personal experience he kind of uh he kind of leads people down astray so a lot of the the early conversations in the flat earth movement it's, that i saw it's, it's very new between, age exactly. yeah very new age between, and also between matt boylan and uh eric dubay there was a lot of jew bashing here and there you know, the conversation got steered off to that. Uh, you know, I became a vegan for a couple of months uh, after watching a lot of Eric based things. Mm. Uh, and, I mean, it, it's it's incredibly new age with his yoga. Which is very misleading in general because, in, in essence, like, what we think is bad, they tell us is bad, is actually good, you know, like, in terms of 
fats and milk and stuff like that. That's a whole other conversation. But um, quickly, I just wanted to tell you what I think on it is um, I think they saw it coming as well, what Walt said. And I think that they tried to manage it by maybe funding people like Matt or Eric or whatever, you, you know, the money that was thrown around at the beginning, thinking that, you know, it would be a short revival that they could control the movement by releasing enough to get people thinking it's a little fad and a craze, but maybe they underestimated the actual uh, truth of it and um, they're ending up not being able to control it. That's what I think. But it's constantly being hit with very shilly, uh, Sayings. I mean, like the Matt. I mean, uh, the Mark Sargent quote-unquote sex tape with Orphan Red and Patricia Steer, and the whole Patricia Steer saying with her like, you know, talking heads, really silly show. Um, seems like a lot of the things just to distract us from doing true research. So Flat Earth Hangouts says the Earth is a square flat plane. I've done no, a lot of looking into that. I did quite a bit of looking into that with free energies uh, research into that square flat map mm, based mm -hmm. on ancient Egyptian stuff. There's a lot there that, that kind of does work with the magnetism at the north and south and things like that. I, I just... Uh, Have around my head around it. Y'all one second. I mean, what I, would, what I would say there is, I mean, we see from the, the skies, the sun, the moon, the stars, they all move in a circular pattern. Um, the ground could be square, I don't know, but, uh, you know, what we see in the sky is that everything revolves in a circular manner. So it makes sense if the world was uh, circular. Which is also what scriptures and you know in various different cultures um, support. Hmm. But there also could be that 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 is a little enclosure of a big square too, like the actual circle could be in the square. Remember that? Um, yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean. That picture, the ice picture with the, the globe with the in the center. center. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we get but, Flat Earth Hangouts on it? We can, absolutely. I imagine I could drop a link to him, and I suspect he would pop on. You yeah, guys all right with that? We would drop one in there? Sure. Yeah, why not? And just go, going back to what you were saying, Richard, um, how how much of it do you think was was um, corrupted in a co collaboration? You think it was just the the top, or do you think we're just gonna see more and more and more of it? it what, what are you talking about here? Is that Eric DeBay? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. stuff again. Um, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of uh, misinformation and disinformation. Um, I mean, I I don't really recommend any particular channels just because I I don't know. You know, yeah. it's very hard to tell who's you know, telling the truth and stuff. And it, it, it's bringing people in by by hundreds of thousands, though. Those guys. If you, know? if you wanna, if you wanna yeah. call someone a shill, you need to tell me what bits they're. It's what 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 they're saying's wrong. You need to show me what they're saying's wrong. Hmm. And no, no, you, you you can't call someone. Yeah, I don't. I don't. That, I don't. You, you can't if you if you, you you need to show me what 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 bullshit they're talking. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, I don't, when I say Eric Dubay and, and um, Matt Boylan, I gave the examples of, you know, the, the, Matt Boylan went to Jesuit college uh, and he steers the, the conversation towards, um, you know, the Jew question with Eric Dubay. It's a, it's a setup that steers people away from digging further in the flat earth things that instead of, you know, if you go on, if you go on ifers.org, uh, a big section on there is about, um, you know the Holocaust and and Jews, um, mm. and steers people away. And that's why that's what I'm basing it on. And you know, from my own experience, as I said, 
uh, you know, the, the new age spirituality uh, path that Eric Dubay clearly guides people down, you know, with the veganism material on his site. Um, yoga. And also the yoga, you know, the Tai Chi, all that stuff. Um, I mean, I don't know if he's a shill. I don't, to be honest. But, uh, you know, from my own experience, he led me in paths that, you know, weren't, uh, you know, what I would consider to be good. Uh, and that's why I would flag him at the moment. That said, he does have an amazing amount of fantastic work on, you know, factual work on the Flat Earth, so no complaints there. Yeah, he woke me up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what same, you? same. What woke you, you up, Richard? Um, my alarm clock. <laughs> uh. No, um... I don't know. I was, I was actually, you know, for a few years, uh, since I was like 15 or 14, I knew 9/11 was some. There was some fishing going on there, but I just figured it was like, you know, money or something like that. Um, didn't realize it was like a spiritual, you know, uh, you know, a bigger, bigger agenda there. Um, so I didn't really research it until improperly until like three years ago. So I was digging in the rabbit holes, you know, leaving no stone unturned, and then eventually, as as you do if you are in so-called conspiracy theorist research mode, uh, you do come across the flat earth eventually. And, you know, as I said before, all I needed was, you know, two or three proofs uh, to debunk the globe. And then it was just about answering all my questions. Um, yeah, right. No one single thing. Yeah, I mean, you can take a gyroscope, gyroscope or curvature or I mean there's five five hundred proofs but you really only need you know a couple um, to really prove prove that it is in the globe um, it is true and and when you see the, the the sort of ball earth lame videos of ten reasons why you think it's a why we know it's a yeah, ball or a globe. I know which one you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, there's several um, now, but they're equally as lame. And you know, there's my, ten reasons. My and favorite one. Have... <laughs> they say that they have pictures, <laughs> photographs. <Yeah. laughs> it's generally either either number ten or number one, isn't it? Well, exactly. Duh, yeah. We have pictures. It's like. Yeah, well, I have a painting that I have a unicorn in my garden. You know, and <laughs> is that true? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's um, you know, uh, I mean, the, over a hundred years ago, there was a hundred proofs that the Earth wasn't a globe, um, and literally only one of them needs to be infallible to um, to prove the situation, or and at you, least throw you, a question on it. You need one or two, maybe, uh, to prove the Earth is in the globe. But then to actually, you know, I guess prove uh, the flat Earth, you need to answer, you know, all the questions, I guess. Because um, there's a lot of things yeah. we don't know. I mean, uh, I, I can't remember what we were talking about earlier, but, the, um, you know, Antarctica, we haven't been there, for example. So no. we can't be 100% sure of that. Um, and there are certain questions. I mean, we can use... Um, you know, scriptural knowledge, uh, old astronomical, you know, the Chinese astronomers were really good uh, at mapping the stars and their records are fantastic. Um, mm. You know, we can use, you know, historical records, but then we don't know if these historical records are true or not. So we have to kind of mix, mix and match to see what matches with what, uh, you know, our, only, our own reality um, says. That's it. The only way is to test it yourself and that's what I was searching for with the gyroscope thing was to nail it down to a one-stop shop that proved both it wasn't spinning and it wasn't a globe and the simple gyroscope does both an opportune moment and I finally got back in for a second hey well shoot
I'm actually out and about for a moment, so I'm trying not to be on too much with all the car noises. I got you. Walt, can I, can I just say, I, I love your accent. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate it. It, it. it sounds like Billy Bob Thornton is talking to me. <laughs> That's right. I like hey, me what? some of them, I like me some of them French fried taters. Mm. <laughs> How many times have you heard that? Well, how many times have you heard somebody loves your accent? Dude, when I was in Oregon, every girl I talked to just lit right up as soon as I started talking. It was too good. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, your accent's quite amusing. It's like mine. I can hear numerous different uh, countries in there. Is there Irish in there? Uh, no, it's funny. I get asked if I'm Irish a lot, actually. Uh, um, since um, so, I'll, I'll give you my story. Uh, I was born in Brazil to Swedish parents, uh, and then uh, I moved around a bit. So I lived in a few countries, uh, always international schools, and then went to university and worked for a couple of years in London, uh, in England. So my my accent's a bit of a mix of you know American schools, international schools, um, and living in England, and then having yeah. uh, a few other languages that mix in there and just corrupt everything. Um, it's the so Swiss, it, I think. The base at the base of it, I think, is the Swiss. I can hear. Sweet, sweet Swedish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I always get told I'm Australian. But... <laughs> you know what I noticed, John? Do you have South African in your voice? <laughs> no. Because <laughs> you, you said something earlier that's a very I know it to be a very South African term. When yeah, you said damn it, sh 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 um, not against the blicks. <laughs> no, you said stum stum. It's very South African. That's a UK. I, I don't know. Maybe it is South African. <clears throat> no, I've got a bit of Welsh, bit of Irish, bit of Canadian. Where, where, whereabouts are you in England then? Uh, I'm down the southwest. Isn't that uh, Somerset accent? That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've only been. I've only been here. A decade now after leaving like London. All <laughs> right, my lover, we like a bit of cider. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you, you guys sound like Newfies from Newfoundland. I used to live there. Oh, no way. <laughs> afraid so. Where about? about Bell Island or where? No, nah, near St. St. John's. John's. Oh, yeah, yeah, near there, yeah. Yeah, I was. One foot tall and bald, probably. <laughs> yeah, you get about. Oh, I want. Uh, I have a question that uh, I haven't actually looked into yet, um, which is meteors. What I mean, I know. Um, uh oh. Uh, we that didn't sound good. I think so. Sounds like it. Well, it's an interesting question because that's I was a outside, great question. As I was yeah, outside I two nights ago doing some filming, trying to catch Orion on my camera, I saw two or three go by and realized there was a very small shower happening and looked it up, and sure enough, it was. Yeah, I can't remember the name, but it really made me wonder about a few things. One thing, they always come from up going down. I've never seen one come from down going up. Like it should happen somehow if it's coming from random directions from an infinite void, for sure. Yeah, I was just I, about to say that, and that's about all I, I know that. about it. I hear that a lot, but I think it's hard to for anyone to say, yeah, they never come from the south and the north. Because, I mean, well, no, yeah, not we direction. Know, not direction. I mean, like, I always am seeing them come from an overhead position going yeah. into a, a downward position. Angle. Never come from angle. The horizon going up <laughs> into the upper sky, like that should happen randomly if they're approaching us from different directions, like yeah. we're told. Welcome back, Richard. What was your yeah, question sorry. on meters? I dropped, I dropped off right after I asked the question there, I think. Uh, <laughs> I was going to ask. Um, uh, about meteors and asteroids, uh, what do you what do you make of them? Like, what what are they, and you know, what are they doing? <laughs> Easy one for me. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I saw one as you, as you dropped off. I was saying I saw two or three the other night and was wondering that same question, what's going on with those? And, and one of the observations I've made through many years of watching the mini showers is they always come from an overhead generally direction heading to a downward generally direction. They never come from the horizon area going upward in the sky, as should happen if they're really coming from an infinite void at a ball floating through space. Could it be arcing? Arcing over a magnetic field? That's what I was thinking, some type of arcing occurring. Which ties into the whole, this place being an electromagnetic machine realm. What do you think, Richard? Yeah, I, I, I don't have any theories on this, actually, to be honest. <laughs> It's a bit it's a bit scary because we it's one of the things and I mean but that's what's so great about I mean the the group is that we'll figure it out, you know, it's something we don't know yet. All right, let's say okay. this. Just to I mean, theory. Oh, I'm I mean, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, like you look at like the fallen angels, uh, you know, from the biblical perspective, uh, I mean prophecies and stuff about them falling and stuff. Um, it could be that, you know, for all I know. I don't know. Just throwing that in the pot. Interesting. That's like falling ISSs, though. We can't tell what it is. <laughs> yeah. You mean, well, you mean sinking? sinking. <laughs> well, I've played with a few different uh, uh, pieces of Moldavite, which is supposed to be from the Moldovia area of Czechoslovakia. It's a very clear, glassy green stone. It has very interesting pock marks all over it, generally speaking, which very much look like some type of electrical arcing took place on this stone. This is where we need Cami and um, Bob and Globusters. This is where? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, she's a gemologist. I mean, I've seen someone suggested to me yesterday that it could be bits of the firmament falling down, um, which seemed a bit weird. Um, but I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think the firmament is made of? I mean, it, if if I, I've seen those rocket videos um, where rockets just suddenly stop when they hit hit the the sky, basically. Um, I mean, if it was solid, uh, rockets would kind of get crushed or break when they as soon as they hit it not just I mean, they're stopping abruptly but they're not breaking and then they're mm. just floating, floating for a minute as if they're in water and then dropping slowly down again what um, if it's not part of the firmament but it's part of something like condensation and the ice crystals building up on a firmament whatever the hell a firmament is Okay, and that was tying into what I was about to say. Okay, when things evaporate and go up into the cloud layers, it carries up a lot of interesting things. That's all these rain of fishes and tadpoles and rocks and things mm -hmm. like that. So if it can take up these materials that are minerals and then they all are similarly bonded so they collect and attract each other and they all form these masses that then are getting hit with some kind of charge because they're up there where all these things that are taking place the things that are keeping the moon and the sun going whatever they actually are objects events phenomena whatever they actually are we still haven't figured that one out let alone you know what, yeah, what meteorites are be... but if they're conglomerations and condensations of these similar minerals that fall it's just interesting that some are huge and cause these impacts that definitely happened there in Monovia I've seen the I've done a lot of research on the Monovia motor uh, meteorite it's it's an interesting stone it is I have a few pieces I'm gonna try to find them and put them on camera here hang on a few minutes I have I mean I saw one uh, one idea um, you know if, if you think of the the magnetic torus uh, model uh, and if you shoot a rocket straight up, you'd basically be transversing uh, or entering those field lines perpendicularly. Uh, so if you think of electromagnetic levitation, what could be happening to these rockets as they hit the, you know, the firmament, as it were, uh, could be that they're just entering a, a really strong magnetic field that are just you know, stopping them, kind of. Like if you imagine two magnets repelling each other, mm. uh, south pole and south pole, you get some sort of like bouncy feeling. You're and that kind of about the go 
go fast rocket, eh? Yeah, yeah, the one that mm. yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and it kind of looks like it just floats around in the air a little bit, and it just reminded me of how, like, imagine if you had like a magnetic field and it's kind of stuck in between there. Yeah, it um, wouldn't blast you apart, but it would slow you down and kind of keep you there. It would be very hard to. It would be very resistant. I, yeah. I would say with the go fast rocket footage, uh, um, first thing we need to do is work out whether it's fake or not, because yeah. that had a huge budget. I mean, that was no that was no rocket in the park. Yeah. Who who put that thing up? Uh, you know, all the all the cameras were GoPro, fish eyes. Um, there was this sudden stop. They had a guy um, flying around in a jet suit. <laughs> yeah, and, before the rocket took off, they had a guy in a jet suit flying around taking footage. Oh, so they right. had some considerable I didn't know that. considerable money. Yeah, they had considerable money around them. And then at, at roughly the same time, they released the. Um, Picard uh, whiskey ad. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would question whether that footage is real before I'd start analysing whether it. Well, alongside analysing whether it tells us anything. Yeah. So personally, John, what have you analysed it? I don't think it's real. I think it's fake. What, okay. what makes you say that? Is it just the money that they've they've got from you know the, the funding or um, the, well, there's in, in the funding. Video. There's the um, the cameras they use the the ridiculous. Uh, I I don't know what it was. It was it was almost um, subliminal flashing of the screen with it when it was just spinning out of control on its way up. Um, the underwater sound effects. Uh, you know, it's, it's, who are these people? Where are they? Why aren't they shouting about this? Are they flat earthers? What What is going on? Where, where did this rocket come from? Was it NASA sponsored? Was it um, Red Bull? You know, who, who are these people that they can put a, a rocket of that sort of technicality and, like you say, <laughs> <laughs> Rocket Let's jet find man. Out right now. Hang on one second. I uh, I think I did some initial um research into it and it's a and group of civ off as... civilians, yeah. Yeah. But I think they had military connections. Sounds like someone's in a server room with beep, 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 in the background. Who's that? No, is that that's you, Rich? Richard's fan needs oil. Yep. <laughs> oil can. I'm on a, I'm on an old laptop. Sorry about that. <laughs> Call the Tin Man. Yeah, the Tin Man. Yeah. I'll have to talk louder so you don't hear the fan. <laughs> that was a Dave Bowie album, wasn't it? The Tin Man. There's something I keep coming back to that was really a footage that was really big back when I was looking into ufology, which was for a considerable number of years. And it kind of ties into this whole liquid space thing. There's footage of uh, film out of a, a shuttle. I can't remember which one. Maybe 70. And uh, they go out. They're looking out the door, and there's these things that everybody at that time were all saying were these discs and these objects that were like flying saucers or whatever. But Jelly. when you look at them now, it looks like yeah, it looks like what we're seeing is the stars in the sky. And one of the guys on that video comments about those, and oh yeah, they look like stars. Hmm. So maybe they know really what the hell's going on up there, and they figured it all out, and they're trying to release it to us a little bit at a time to get people ready for their big. Aliens are friendly little sea creatures coming to help us out. Y'all chill announcement, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, they definitely know what's going on. I mean, without a doubt. There's someone in the chat room wanting to join, uh, Josh.
Can you do that, Josh? I'll be back home in a minute and can take over if you'll give me a minute. Oh, sweet. Uh, I sure can as long as uh, there's no objection. I don't want to just make a unilateral decision. No, no. Go. Uh, my vote is yes. All right. So, Richard, where'd you go from here, then, if you've uh, mapped out the blog start to finish? Oh, right. Um, Come to the end, where'd you go? Hang on, oh, I'm just going to get, get my... Uh, old, isn't it? Let me get my list out. <laughs> 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 so I've got, uh, you know, I told you I, I skipped a couple of posts um, just because I thought that alien deception thing was a bit more urgent. Uh, and uh, I have another post, 26, which is on the timing, where I analyze some synchronicity and gematria and numerology, which points to uh, November 16th. Um, but uh, that's just my opinion. This, it's not, this year? This year, yeah. Um, what's what's going to yeah, happen? It's just, uh, this is the year of disclosure. Disclosure. Disclosure, Hold yeah. on. September, October. Oh, right. That's a month from now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then, so I've got that post. Uh, I've got a post on gravity, a post on stars and planets. Um, and then when it, that's when it gets nice and interesting because I want to talk about, you know, pull everything together on magnetism and cymatics uh, and numbers. You know, we live in a mathematical uh, universe and we can basically prove the existence of the creator um, using cymatics and, and other stuff. Um, so I'm going to write a post on that. Um, Are you familiar with Victor Schulberg? What's his name? Sorry, I'm saying that. Oh, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Victor Schulberger. Schulberg. How do you spell that? S C H O Schul Schul Schulberg. I'll drop you a DM. All right, cool. Um, I'm not now. Uh, what about? Um, Oh, damn. No, I'll get back to you. My brain's um, failing me now. Then uh, I've got a post. Uh, I'm going to make a uh, post on the cube. Now, I'm sure you've seen the black cube of Saturn. Saturnalia. Uh, exactly. So I'm going to do that. Um, I have an interesting thing about that side note I want to talk to somebody about. Probably you, Richard. Um, yeah. About that. Remind me, because it's uh, actually about a friend who kind of lost his mind going into the back cube and it now was labeled as a schizophrenic. So it's it's something I definitely want to talk to you about or somebody. Wait, what? How did he, what do you mean lost his mind? So, so I actually have a friend who was awake and he started looking really, really, really deeply, almost became obsessed with the, uh, the black cube and uncovering the secrets of it and, you know, got really lost into it. And he is now, you know, he started hearing voices and stuff and everything. And he's now labeled by doctors as, um, what, what did I say? Schizophrenic. Schiz That's yeah. what happens to people who usually start hearing things like that from the other side. And he started hearing angels and demons tell him things. And he started um, getting that ability the further he got into the Saturnalia stuff. So it was kind of it's kind of a, a personal okay. thing, you know, for me. I mean, that sounds like a guy I'd love to have a conversation with. <laughs> oh, I mean, the way he describes it too. This is why I'm asking about the numbers again because he was told things, and it's he was told that that things are built on a code, like all on math, right? And that, oh, right. You know that there's certain people that understand how the thing is built and that have you know not greater powers but they, they they can do things because they understand things right i mean i can see where he's coming from but i, I don't know I, I don't think i've gone as far as him by the sound of it um i mean i just look at you know free freemasons and stuff they use numbers in the code stuff uh, in the 13 33 and, and other numbers in in events um and movie release dates and 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 stuff uh, that's as far as i go um, and I mean, the stuff I posted in the, the chat on Twitter um, about the, the cube, um, you know, the Kaaba, 
the, the in Mecca, black cube, uh, rabbis with a black cube on the head. I mean, all of these religions are are worshiping the black cube. Um, so I'm I'm going to do a post on that. Um, At the North Pole of Saturn. Yeah, yeah sorry, I, I didn't didn't mean to derail your list. I just yeah, no, sorry. It was a good we'll question. talk. We'll talk later. Yeah, it, yeah. To, add to your list, Richard. That yeah. the guy I was talking about was um he's got a YouTube channel. His name's um Ken Wheeler. W h e e l e r. And his yeah. channel, his channel is called The Aurea, T H E O. The Angry Photographer. Yeah, R I A. Yeah. Apophysis, A P O P H O S I S. And um, yeah, he's got some really interesting stuff going on there. And the other guy who I couldn't pronounce was Victor. Schultz, <laughs> it's just still can't pronounce, but I know how to spell it. S C H O E L C H E R Victor S C H O E L C H E R. Yeah, is that Polish? Schultz, I don't know. It sounds Swiss. Um, I don't know. It's yeah, sort of mid-European, somewhere around yeah, yeah. Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, around that sort of area. I don't know. Schultz, yeah. Well, I actually yeah, got cut off yeah. earlier during the uh, discussion of the square map. Have you looked into Free Energy's channel at all, Richard? Which one, sorry? The Free, free energy. energy. If I've looked into Free Energy. No, the, it's a channel on YouTube. Free Energy. It's like energy, but with an A. He has a channel on YouTube oh, with, the, with the electric square yes. theory. Correct. I haven't seen that now. His electric, model. his electric, his theory is about electric model and how the light would bend with magnetism. All kind of ties into Theophia or Theosoria or whatever that guy's name that Brian just gave you. Because he actually demonstrates with a ferro cell and some neodymium magnets exactly what this other guy is talking about with his model of how the North and South Pole stars would work and how this model works kind of tying into the portals that Enoch talks about in his book. It's just a whole big thing. It's really a, it, it's a, it's a real, it requires a lot of watching to get a Yeah, get around it's, it. you need to submerge yourself in it for a week or so yeah. to even scratch the surface on this one, but it's, um, his yeah, thing about the, the light body and how the light body falls off of the sun. That's amazing. And the way the eye works. Yeah. He, he's got some next level stuff. Nice. I look forward to it. <laughs> have you speaking of eye have you seen uh, enter the stars uh stuff on the eye oh yeah I'm, i've been watching him for years since this whole thing started yeah some have, amazing have stuff you seen there. have you seen jeffrey grupp's stuff on the um gyroscopic eye model no not yet send me a link or let me get that name again what was it jeffrey grupp how do you spell it's that g-r-u-p-p He's got a, a, a YouTube channel. There, I think. Say again, sorry. I was just spelling Jeffrey. I think it's with the two Fs. Ah, uh, yeah, a, probably. A, 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 right. He's got a YouTube channel. I think it's just Teticism. <laughs> you can spell that yourself. Z E T Z E T I C I S M. E -T -I -C -I -S -M. Yeah, along those lines. <laughs> and I think he's got zeteticism.com. He's a university professor, um, been an absolute mad cap. I've followed him for a couple of years now. He actually turned me on to Flat Earth years ago in 2009 without even knowing it. He wasn't a Flat Earther himself until last year, I think, or this year even. Uh, no, it was last year. Mm -hmm. But something he said turned me on to Flat Earth in his, his rambling. He's a real crazy, uh, you know, madcap scientist sort of thing, wants to test everything, wants to be empirical with everything. He, he was the one that basically turned me on to 
zeteticism, he didn't know the word, then he called it empiricism, which was basically discovering the world around you with your empirical senses, with your five senses, uh, you know. And, um, yeah, he, he I, I knew he would, but he, he fell headlong into flat earth about a year ago and, and has been mental about it ever since. It's, um, yeah, I don't know about his model, though, the gyroscopic eye uh, model, but it sounds very similar to what you guys are talking about. Yeah. So what, what do you guys make of Enter the Stars eye model, as in we live on a, on a convex lens Earth? Yeah, I've looked at that too. It's interesting, especially considering the fact that we're supposed to be the moat in God's eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've not come across it before. What is the, what's the premise? Uh, what is the convex uh, this, part? This is, is that the land or what? No, that like we're the lens. We're inside the lens. That's the permanent. It's the lens itself, and then the like. So, right, so the permanent. We live on the back side of the the inside of the eye. So the the lens, not the one that's pointing outward, but inwards. And then the firmament would be the retina of the eye, or the eye wall. Right. Got you. And there's there's loads of biblical, uh, you know, truth and and stuff that points to this. Uh, right, I mean, but you could also take that same idea and turn it into the cosmic egg if you put the yolk as the lens and the other part of the egg because there's those same pictures that kind of tie into that idea too. True, yeah. That, that egg thing. So they're both very similar in design. Yeah. And organic, I which I like idea. a lot. I love the idea of a, of a dome and I, I tend to think it's probably the the... Um, most logical solution but there, there really is no test other than to go there and find out is there? there's there's no other way I mean we can see it with operation I mean I, I would I would, I would say I would say two things with regards to uh, a dome or a boundary um, a if, if everything in in the universe in the world that we can measure um, is magnetic as in we live in a magnetic field, a uh, massive torus, that would mean that we have you know, a magnetic boundary uh, around the world, which would be the firmament in a sense. Um, and then secondly, uh, if you look at uh, you know, phi spirals and you do a phi double spiral, you know, spirals one way and spirals the other way, you, you get natural boundaries, which is uh, exactly what we see in spirals in, in sunflowers and even the human eye. Yeah. So the overlapping of these spirals create uh, natural boundaries, uh, which is why, you know, in the eye we have you know, the pupil uh, and then the, the colored part of the eye, I forget what it's called, and then, you know, the greater eye. And if you make a parallel to, if you extrapolate the, 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 the mathematics, the phi model onto the flat earth model, uh, then it would be natural that the same mathematics that are true for the eye and sunflowers and everything else in nature would be true for the rest of the world as well, and there would be natural boundaries. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with you. Um, but the thing is, is, you know, throughout the world, we we can see um, the lay down of ley lines, but we can we can walk over those ley lines, and it's not a problem. Um, you know, we, we don't get zapped, and the, well, there isn't a dome wherever that ley line is. I'm just wondering, you know, are these physical lines, or are they, you know, the edge of our sort of flower of life design? You know, are they just arbitrary lines that we can walk over and <laughs> and carry on? My, I'm thinking of like crop circles, like. Electromagnetic energy manifests in those crop circles, uh, but if I mean it, it, that doesn't mean that it's just that location that there's electromagnetic energy. It must be like more locations. So just because we can't see, uh, you know, the energy in front of us, doesn't mean that it's not there. Uh, mm. So we walk across a ley line. We might not know that it's there or feel anything, but there might be, you know, uh, molecular or DNA level stuff that's happening to us when we're in that field. 
Um, well, like radio waves or microwaves, gamma rays or, you know, anything else, that, the, the soup that we live in. Uh, mm. All of these things may be affecting us in, in certain ways. But, I, yeah, I, I'm just wondering if there's... A, I mean, the, the whole... Although I, I enjoy the idea of a dome and it's, you know, been pre-programmed in us uh, to a sense, it, it is, in a sense, another prison for the mind for you know imagine if we all found out we lived under a dome and you can't get out um you know you might as well live in a, a rat cage and can't get out it's um to a human that's that's fatal i'm, I'm just uh, i'm wondering if the the next layer is the yeah okay you live on a flat earth but you've got a big fucking dome over you you can't get past it you're going to die on the way there. Uh, so there you go. No point trying. Yeah, exactly. That's what I think it is. They're trying to keep that idea of containment. It's an in, it's a more interesting thought than, uh, you know, we're, we're living under a dome. And it doesn't necessarily conflict with the Bible in any or, or any scripture insofar as you know there is a boundary or the you know the, the waters above and the waters below who knows what's out there but it doesn't mean that we can't explore it go through it or if there's anything out there at all we don't know mm -hmm. the bible would be a good way to imprison us back into this terrarium and say, you know, we're not meant to go any further than South America, South Africa, Australia. Um, you know, if you do go any further, then you're you're questioning what we've been told and what we've been warned against, and you know, you, you're going to get the wrath of whatever down on you. And lo and behold, that's what happens to people like Yarl Anderhoy that that do. Um, decide to say, yeah, no, we're 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 going there, and we'll see what it is. <clears throat> We've got um, multi Tom. Tom, has he spoken yet? Hello, Tom. Hi, guys. Yeah, I, I didn't want to interrupt, so that's why I didn't say anything. No, you're right. Um, so, uh, where are you from? Good luck getting the word in edgewise. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm in London. Welcome, Tom. Yeah, how are you guys doing? Right? How, how, how did you find this? Yeah, I used to have uh, the uh, the AE map with the uh, sun and moon going around. <laughs> Along with all the others. <laughs> I can't what, is that on Twitter? Or? <laughs> it, was, uh, it was a GIF, um, like it was an uh, animation. Uh, okay. uh, the sun and the moon going around, you know. Uh, I got rid of it because uh, I don't believe in the uh, in the circle anymore. So where is South Africa on your on your map? There, is that under the square or? Oh, no, no, just, that's just uh, it's just a cartoon. <laughs> yeah, no, I can't. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> so, so what do you believe in now then? Yeah, like you guys talked about free energy. I, uh, I subscribe to his ideas, you know. Uh, makes sense to me. Does it offend you to have it called the Pac-Man model? No, not really, not really no. Not at all. To get, People can call it what, what they want. Because like, uh, I come from, uh, like, uh, well, I believe in the Creator. I believe in God. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like you guys said, uh, the, the, the Book of Enoch mentions portals, right? On the uh, east and the western end, six of them, is it? So six, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right, yeah. So and also, like you know, we don't know, we don't know much. We don't know much. You know, the, the ancients knew so much more than we do now. You know, I mean, I mean, look at the mind, light, right? They, they, light pollution, yeah. It, it's because their knowledge, <laughs> their knowledge was actually based on you know what they could see in observation. You know, around them. our knowledge is based on what someone told us well, the thing is everything is cyclic you know if you can observe the uh, you know the heavenly bodies over a period of time 
you can predict it you know, to a T, like, like, like the, the Mayan stage, you know, they could predict everything precisely, um, you know, like, uh, like they do now, you know, almost, almost. So, you know, uh, other things you can't explain, like uh, this guy, free energy, right? He says, the sun and moon and the stars go straight across east to west, you know, and it's the light, you know, like, um, uh, you know, reflection, refraction, whatever, uh, that causes, uh, you know, uh, you know the, what we see is not the real the real thing. <laughs> I don't know if I'm explaining properly. Uh, I, I recommend his videos, to be honest. Uh, go, and, go and watch them. It, um, you need to watch it two, two, two or three times like, to, uh, to, to really understand them. Yeah, I know where you're coming from. It can be, it can be quite hard to describe things or, you know, on a radio show uh, without pictures and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to be honest, uh, the the AE or the Gleason's map, right, the circle, a lot of things doesn't doesn't really work, you know, for for one thing, nobody's ever seen the uh, the the uh, the uh, the ice wall around, you know, around like 360 degrees, you know, like if you go from New Zealand, if you go, go uh, eastwards, you know, you have to come, you know, you have to come to the ice wall, isn't it? You, you, yeah. I mean, um, an interesting thing, if you look at uh, maps like um, Admiral Byrd's interview on NBC News uh, in 1930s or whenever it was, uh, there's there's an azimuthal equidistance map on the wall behind him, uh, and there's no Antarctica on it. And the same, uh, there's a map, uh, an azimuthal equidistance map in JFK's Situation Room, uh, a photo of that, and there's no Antarctica on that either. It is it is the same flat Earth map, but there's no Antarctica on these maps. Um, which no, I think the, the re sorry the reason they did that is like instead of having the globe, you know what they do is they, you know it's a it's a it's a projection of the globe just flattened down. You know they like if you can imagine the North Pole, put your hand on the North Pole, and just, yeah. just squish it down. You know that's why you get you know it's easier for them to uh, to look at it rather than having the globe there. Do you know what I mean? You yeah, know, I mean, instead of having the ball, physical ball, uh, physical globe there, like that map is a representation. But then the, the question is, what came first, the, the chicken or the egg, the, the flat Earth map or the globe? Um, I mean, I think they took the flat Earth map and fitted it onto the sphere, uh, the ball, which is why you have the Mercator map, which has everything out of proportion, because they had to fit onto that ball. Um, You've also got to uh, take into account things like um, the NASA flight manuals mm. and the other things that say, um, you know, categorically state that this model is made on a stationary flat Earth or a non-rotating. These are coming straight from NASA and they're, they're, you know, flight instruction manuals for astronauts and uh, along those lines. But one thing I, I had about the... Um, the square or the rectangle is it a square or a rectangle map that that you're 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 seeing it's more of a rectangle really more, uh, it's not it's not actually a square but it's is yeah when you look at it it's it's a, it's a rectangle isn't it it's like that mercator map it's more of a rectangle than a square isn't it so the the uh, the the sun would would go um on a straight line is that right yeah, it goes straight from uh, east to west. To e east to west. Uh, this is what, what screwed me when I... Uh, I mean, I like testing things for myself. So this summer solstice, when it, it was basically rising at the highest on the Tropic of Cancer, um, I'm, I'm looking from the UK here, and... So I videoed the, the sunrise and the sunset on the solstice and it rose in the northeast and it set in the south in the northwest. And for me that alone um sort of threw up questions of 
the Pac-Man model and the Globe model together. The the only thing that really worked was a sun that was going in a semicircular formation, you know, or maybe in a, a maybe an elliptical circle or, or something along those lines. I couldn't I couldn't rationalize the rectangle model or the globe model from looking at the real world observations of the northeast sunrise and the northwest setting does does that make any sense to you I didn't yeah well there. this guy can, free I, energy, can, I right? just, can i just ask where, where yeah. can i find a picture of this rectangular map just so i have reference it's, it's not actually a rectangle it's uh it, they he uses the the mercator all right yeah maybe look up just pac-man image it's yeah. so derogatory right. saying that i'm sorry but it is something that people have come to um recognize it by pac-man right. so have no, i got it right that if if you have uh north america uh on the left of the map and then asia on the right if you fly west from Los Angeles, say, how can you reach Asia? Wouldn't you be flying off the? I mean, this is probably a stupid question. I mean, you might have an answer for it, but no, 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 it's away. not a stupid question at all. If you, if you had, you know, the flat Earth map that you're thinking of. I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking of a Mercator map as a rectangle, as the map here. Okay, well, if, if you if you think of a the flat Earth map, say the UN flag or whatever, yeah, um, with the North Pole in the center, yeah, and if you stick a big, big ass magnet in the center of your map and you put a compass on the map around the center magnetic north. Yeah. you'll see how no matter if you go east or west you will always be going in a great circle around the magnetic north Isn't only that... if you go south will you start heading off the the map so to speak does that make sense is that a I mean what I'm imagining is a, a flat earth map then if you put if you take a north pole and then put a compass over it, and you get a circle. Or am I, am yeah, I thinking? Take the North wrong? Pole, stick a, a, a circular compass in the middle of the North Pole, and then trace a, um, a standard um, magnetic compass around that. It will continually point to the North Pole, the, the, the North Pole arrow will continually point to the North Pole. You get that? Yeah, it, that's that's an azimuthal equidistant map, though, isn't it? I mean, a, a flat flat circle. Everything points to the North Pole on a, on a flat map. Yeah, but the point being is... Yeah, but the thing you, is, if you from, there, east, from there, from there... Right, from, the, from, the, from the North Pole, right? Every, everywhere you go is south, isn't it? From, from the North Pole, as you go down, yeah. Every way it's south, isn't it? Yeah. So it does work, does it? it does. And also the um, the uh, the east and west, you know, like, you know, like navigation. Uh, I mean, sailing. You know, you have you have to make course corrections all the time. You know, like uh, you know, you have to specify north, south, east, west. Like you can't go like straight east or straight west. It's impossible. Do you, does anyone and the distance? Does anyone have a picture they could send me on on Twitter or something? I'm trying to look up. Um, no, just Google it. Google it. Yeah, I'm looking Gleason's at uh, video. Oh, are you talking about Gleason? A... Well, they're both the same, actually. Not major difference. <laughs> All right, then. What's how? How can you get a rectangle from a from the Gleason's map? No. It, it, the uh, the rectangle yeah, map he just yeah. uses the Mercator, the, the the normal map, uh, the normal atlas map. You know, like uh, 
like you know the Marquesa the classroom, yeah. like on the classroom, they just wall map, flat map. Yeah, yeah, that's right. North yeah, America yeah. to yeah. the left and Europe to the right and yeah. Australia to the bottom right. That's the map that they're using to show this. And the way they justify the east west thing are these, believe it or not, portals which are mentioned in the Book of Enoch. And the way they justify that is that everything in this realm that we exist in called Earth is electromagnetic. We are anything in this realm, whether it be a solid object or a gas or a liquid, is all vibrating and can all vibrate in and out of these portals without ever knowing it occurs so that it is like a continuous Pac-Man type thing. You go out one side, come in the other. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's, that's and you really have to bear yourself in it for a few weeks to really wrap your head around it. It's so whose it's channel was that again? Was that the free energy one? Free energy with an A, A N E R G Y. Okay, cool. I'll have a look at that. Sorry to be obtuse. Um, I had the, the no, not at all. Thing, but I, I, I just couldn't. Um, yeah. When you mentioned the Enoch portals, it was like it just clicked. I knew what you were talking about. Well, that's kind of when it clicked for me when I read Enoch again. It was like, oh right, this is exactly it. Yeah. I mean, I, I read that um, Enoch. Um, two three weeks ago, finished reading it. It's an amazing book. Yeah, another another thing is, uh, have you ever seen the uh, the Hebrew cosmology uh, diagram? Yeah, yeah. That also that also has uh, portals. Indeed, for the summer and the. Uh... All these different no, that, that also portals. shows portals where the, you know yeah. there's some stars and moons enter and exit. You know the uh, the Hebrew cosmology diagram. Uh, going back to this AE map, uh, right? Uh, also the the distances uh, along the south doesn't doesn't work. You know, like they're so far away. Um, yeah, that's one thing we talked to Rob about. Wow, he just left Palva. Oh, all right. Okay. But he's in Australia. And so being in Australia, for the sun to equal 24 hours in his part of the world, when it's in the Capricorn area, speed up a little bit to make that bigger loop that it has to make around that AE map. See, you've, got to understand, though, that you, you've got to understand that the AE map is a projection though it's an azimuth or exactly. distant map it's not meant to be navigable if that makes sense right we don't have a real map anywhere yet i don't think no no the, the, there is i think no the closest one out. might be that that tibetan one with the lands on the outer edges around the ae map that might be the closest thing we've seen yet i believe well that's a uh, it's a romantic fantasy at the moment um it's assuming that the, the, yeah, the center like is yeah i love it i love it <laughs> i think it's brilliant you know we've got 33 continents or whatever out there that the size of australia someone I mean, on my twitter feed posted on. one this week that was pretty similar to that with an outer ring with all these different continents with really interesting names and all these gates of summer and gates of winter and it's yeah really that's what i thought we were talking about well it's a it's a different one that one the one i'm talking about is the one that's my uh twitter avatar josh right have now. you the got a found copy in the hawaiian i think you may be loose right yeah now. i know the one yeah it was a chinese one that came yeah, over to, to japan and then turned up in hawaii 100 years ago yeah that and, one the hawaiian um, paper yeah, that was so how do those, how do those lands work without sun? They they don't have the sun, do they? No, they've got another sun according to this thing. Oh, right. bowl, I think bowl. Do, do you the know the um, layout of uh, what we're told is Atlantis, where it's got rings exactly. of land rings. and yes, rings of of oceans, and then rings rings of land? Are you familiar yeah. with that? Yep, it ties into that very nicely. There's even one of the lands they talk about on there that's uh, taught or thought or however you say the name. That's very similar to the, the Vedic cosmology, yeah. isn't it? 
Yeah, yes, which I've studied a lot. I love, the, I love the Vedic cosmology. I got into it when I was looking into the blood moon last September and found out about Rahu and K2 because I saw this footage of a, an eclipse and all these little orbs suddenly appeared around the sun. I'm like, whoa, I've seen that in a video I made on the beach. So I started looking into it and found out those are the orbs that are supposed to be Rahu, K2. And another one, I can't remember the name. But yeah, it's a very interesting cosmology to, to dig into. Actually, I've I've seen a solar eclipse myself, you know, with my own eyes, and no way is that a, is that the moon going across because this thing is perfectly circular disk and it's black, you know. Usually, right, the moon during the day is like semi-transparent. It's like almost like blue color, like uh, you know, like, same as like the uh, the sky. You know, it's, uh, you can you can. You can almost see through it. There's no way that that thing is, is a moon uh, so eclipsing you, it, you know, there's no way. So you don't, you don't think the, the moon is going in front of the sun on a solar eclipse? No, I don't, I don't think so. Like I said, uh, you know, if you ever seen the, uh, the moon during the day, it's, it's almost, you know, it's semi-transparent. Like it's, mm. it's blue, right? It's like against blue. the, uh, you can see the, yeah, you can see the, it's like, you know, it's, it, it blends into the background of the of the sky, you know, the same color as the sky, you know. Yeah. What, what no way you, that that. Uh, here's a question: What do you think the moon is then? <laughs> it's a clock. Oh my God, you, it is. Now you're asking the sixty-four million dollar question. <laughs> That's really yeah, what I think it is: a clock. But this is the trouble: is flat earthers. We have to well, know these answers, but otherwise we're shills and we're we're full of shit because. Because the sphere earthers um, think they know the answers to all these questions. They they superficially think they know the answers to everything. So, you know, this the problem that we we come across is that we we're meant to <clears throat> know the answers to all these things. What is the moon? What does this do? How the tides work? How do we the auroras work? Yada yada yada. Um, well, you know, they, they seem to be adverse to saying, I don't know. The problem is when you show them things that kind of shake up what they've been taught, they either don't want to see it or it shakes them up too much and it scares them and they just refuse to see it. That's just like this eclipse question. I mean, you know, I'm like you, I always assume uh, sun and moon, now they're 32 miles across and they're just a few thousand miles above us, that should work. But then I saw this footage of an eclipse from an airplane, and I've sent it over. I don't know. I'm trying to figure out a way to get it on right now, but yeah, I'm having trouble it. with my controls. Yeah, with those orbs that appear that are kind of like in the shape of the, uh, I yep. guess the small the, the little dipper. And it's just, I, like I said, I caught that on my own camera. So it's something, there's something else up there floating around with the sun, there's no doubt. And the reason we can't see it is they're usually some kind of clear sphere that are blurred out, blotted out, the glare is too much, whatever, but at the right time, with the right lenses or the right filters like I was playing with the day I did my video, you uh, can catch it. Have you come across um, Rahu, the, the black sun or the other celestial object that Vedic astrologers spoke about? Yeah. Right, yeah, we were just talking about that, exactly. That's what got me onto this, was catching that myself and seeing, hey, what is this? And trying to figure out what all that was. That, uh -huh. That's what led me to Rahu and K2. I mean, I, I didn't. Anytime someone starts that, that's what I send them to, to, to those two sources to go look into that. Yeah. I mean, I added a bit on the moon on my uh, post about the sun and the moon um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and, I mean, regarding the moon, you can, as we spoke earlier about, um, you can tell that the moon is its own light because uh, it's, it's, it's got opposite properties to the sun uh, in terms of the heat. Uh, light. Mm. Sun, uh, moonlight is colder than sunlight, or sorry, moonlight is colder, uh, cold. Moonshade. Um, yeah, moonshade is warmer. Uh, sorry, I said that wrong. Um, and uh, uh, we can also, I mean, there's, there's been recordings of astrologers seeing stars through the moon uh, when it's been like a half moon or so. So we know that it's, it's, it, it's translucent from that. Uh, I, and it's, I, it's, I, I tend to think that could be stars are in front of the moon. Oh, right. In, yeah, interesting idea. 
Interesting. I haven't heard that either, Tom. That's interesting. Uh, I want to apologize. I kind of took controls of the uh, presentation because Josh needed to step away a minute, and my computer just did an update last night with this new Windows 10, and I have no, uh, it's nothing's working. I can't, I'm trying to present those maps. I was trying to present this video I'm talking about. Nothing's popping up. So, John, do you have the ability, I think, on that end to take over and present um, or not yet? I'm just going to try and present something, one of the maps that we were talking about. Um, no, that's chat. Um, I mean, I'm practically frozen on the computer. Luckily, I'm chatting on the phone, or I wouldn't even be talking to you guys right now. I love when these <laughs> updates ruin everything. Listen, uh, talking about stars, right? Uh, some people are saying uh, you can't see the stars above a certain height. You know, you, if you go up, um, you know, they they just they just disappear. You know, like there are no stars from a certain height. Have you have you guys ever heard of that? Yep. I've been looking into that very closely. Uh, yeah, the only way well. we're going to know is with the balloon launches. Um, there was a really good video or a video put out by a guy YouTube called Ron Rondra AZ or something. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, from Indonesia. Yeah. Yeah, and um, th th there was something like a 40-year study, and uh, they concluded that you couldn't see stars above a certain height, and I'm talking to a pilot at the moment about the same thing. They're saying they can see stars at 35,000 feet. Um, yeah, I, I, it needs huge amounts of research into it. This is something we could easily do, but uh, did you see the yeah, Globebuster launch? Yeah, the other day? that's what I was about to ask. Was it that the attempt with Rob? I mean, Bob had his camera pointed up for the launch, and it never got above five thousand feet. Well, it went missing. <laughs> they lost it, along with about two thousand dollars worth of kit. Goodness gracious. I never finished the show to see how it ended up because it was just turning into such a fiasco. Yeah, there's the map. Thanks, John. Oh, you got it. Brilliant. Yes, uh, I see it there. Let me like see I said, if I my get the computer's other one. useless. I'm about to shut it off. Just let it restart and see if that helps. And then, what I want is a picture of the one that's been going around that's YouTube. That's it. I'll send it to you. I yeah. have it. I have it. Why, uh, how? Idea. I'll send it to the hangout room. Will that work? I don't know. I don't even know. Or to Twitter? Would that be better? Yeah, Twitter's probably better. All right, better. I'll put it on Twitter. I'll put it in our uh, hangout room. I'm in our chat room. Multi Tom, are you on Twitter? Thank you. I was going to ask that too. No, I'm not. <laughs> I don't use Facebook. Uh, any of those things, you know, I'm just uh, well, most G of us don't either do the Facebook, but Twitter's a little different, I guess. We feel that's why we're all kind of here doing this thing together. We found each other on Twitter, so we like to hang out with each yeah, other. What, that way. Wise, wise move not to do but Twitter, great, uh, not to do Facebook, there. <laughs> right? Twitter, yeah, is a little different at the moment, so slightly. I mean, we know we're watched left and right, we've verified that amongst things we've seen disappear and whatnot, but you know. Mm. You can only hide so much these days. Where did I put the photo? Here it is. All right, I'm popping it over. One second. Okay, is that on DM via Twitter? Yeah, uh, core operations. Yeah, I'll put it in there. That's fine. Great. Lovely. I'll try and present that. Right, that map. It looks like some kid at uh, kindergarten just, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Got a paint and brush. I just. <laughs> that's what any map looks like. <laughs> All <laughs> maps are hearsay, as far as I'm concerned, because none of us have been there, have we? You haven't been there. I haven't been there. Quite you frankly, know, I don't know is... what's a hundred miles west of me. Yeah, but when you're flying, uh, you can just uh, just make out the the outline of the, uh, the countries. Now, 
Yeah, I know what you mean. You can, what, see the curvature of the Earth from a plane. Is that what you're saying? No, no, I'm talking about the land. Land, uh, like, you know, like you can see the coast, uh, you know, the layout of the coast, coastal areas, right? And when you look right, at the yeah. map, it's, it's more, uh, more or less the same, isn't it? So, you know, yeah, yeah, it looks, yeah. I think, I personally think they mapped it out. It's, but uh, the land, you know, the continents, like, should be bigger. You know, I don't think, I don't think they've got the distances right. For example, I think, like, South America should be uh, a lot bigger. Africa should be a lot bigger. Yeah. Uh, no, I agree. I agree. I, I don't think any of them is right. Yeah. I think it's complete. Um, I think it's completely political. Can anyone see that? I've just bunged it out. Yeah. Hey, game off. Still trying to source this one, though. That's the issue with this one. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? As it's got names on it, it's quite interesting. And the way they're kind of tied into the constellations and kind of tied into the Atlantean thing. And there's just a whole lot going on. The Egyptian, there's lots of layers here. And could be mm. a lot of subterfuge. <clears throat> that word I can't pronounce. Yeah, I know what you mean. Subterfuge. Yeah, John, what you should do is, you know, on your icon, if you go over your icon, there's a, there's a down arrow, isn't there? If you can press, uh, click on that and uh, click on pre present to everyone, then... Uh, you know, when we talk, um, you know, it'll stay on the uh, on the page on the screen. Right, you know, that's what I was having trouble with because my computer is just not working right now. Right. Okay. So, uh, are you not seeing the? No. What What is when we talk, it disappear. Like if anybody else talk, you know. Oh, I've look. got you. Oh, I've yeah. got it. Right. So I'll go on on to the hangout and then do what? Sorry. No, no. Uh, on this, on your, on your uh, avatar. Right. If you put a cursor on it, it should be a down arrow at the top. Yeah, I have got you. And uh, uh, click on that. Present to everyone. Yeah. Right. Got you. Nice. Yeah. Just that when anyone else talk, you know, won't uh, won't disappear. Doesn't flick things. over onto them. Yeah. Yeah. Got you. Brilliant. Thank you. Have you seen that? Have, have you seen that, that before? I haven't this I haven't seen this one before. No, not this particular map, no. Yeah, this popped up in the two new. nights ago. Yeah, two nights ago and I asked the guy where he got it and he got it from a guy who's a flat earther on Facebook, which I don't do, so I asked him to find out where this guy got it. And I've yet to hear back. So they all got Egyptian name, Egypt, uh, ancient Egyptian gods' names, yeah. No, the Sept Anubis talks. I tried to find out the source of that bowl name, and I can't find any reference to a sun or any ancient cosmology Set. that mentions a sun called bowl. Set like a bowl. Egyptian oh. soul. Say again. Sounds like a bowl or a bell. Mesopotamian. Maybe version. that's what I thought. Maybe it's a version of ball, right? So where where, where did this map come from? Uh -huh. Still don't know. Still trying to find out. Sourcing it hard as I can. I've, I've bugged him three times today you know, by DM, and he still hasn't heard back from his buddy on Facebook. He got it from. So let me check him out. Actually. Right, it says right. You know, the uh, is pointing to the suns. Right, one says soul, and the other one says bowl. Bowl, oh, yeah. But this is slightly Atlantean in itself. Very Atlantean. You know, you could imagine 
several more layers on top of this. With more continents and more ice shelves and, you know, where the soul bowls and dolls and trolls are all <laughs> melting out, uh, you know, a circuit below them. Doesn't wouldn't that match Probably with all you've got to do is move the move the sun up a thousand miles and you have an ice age down a thousand miles you have a, a global warming tropical age you, you you could do so much with this the thing is what you have to ask yourself is why are the military guarding the south and the north poles you know why why can't people go there you know there's something very suspicious going on, you know. There is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if it was just ice holding us in, I mean, they'd be guarding the dome, I guess. But they they created that treaty in 1958, I believe, and no one had even heard of the Green Movement or environmental. Um, activism or anything along those lines and they had that agreement in place that no one was to fly over the south pole the north pole you weren't allowed to bring diesel fuel anything you weren't even allowed to light a match without their permission and all of this was done prior to there being any knowledge of you know global environmental dangers like global warming or global freezing or whatever yeah another great conspiracy uh, regarding the South Pole is uh, like during the 30s Hitler sent uh, mm. send his army down there you know? so <laughs> you yeah. know, people saying you know they, they, they found all sorts of things you know? Admiral Byrd had the whole US Navy after just after World War two he had the whole US Navy under his jurisdiction uh, or under his command rather uh, to explore Antarctica, supposedly, so they say. Yeah. Well, all he said was like he found uh, land where there are there is no snow or ice. You know, it's just uh, like mountainous areas where there's like coal, oil, whatever, natural resources. If, if you if you look, and if, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go, go ahead, go ahead. If you look, you know, I, I watched, I remember watching Admiral Byrd's video a year or so ago, and I thought it was fascinating, but then recently when I was writing a blog article about it and linking to his video, I watched really carefully his, his interview, and he, he's, you can tell that he's kind of acting, because he's, he's looking down a lot onto his desk where he's probably got notes, he's looking off screen and kind of hesitating when he's saying things, and all the questions from the the the, new, the news guys are, are very scripted and automatic, kind of as if they've memorized them. Uh, so that whole interview seems to be about deception, uh, which would make sense because it's on the mainstream news. Yeah, and uh, you know, people are saying that he's a Freemason as well. You know, so yeah, he uh, was. Yeah. <laughs> Who was? Admiral Byrd. Yeah, he was also funded by Rockefeller. <clears throat> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just like um, the Serious Disclosure Project, funded by Lawrence Rockefeller. Was it really? <laughs> I mean, Ro the Rockefellers were behind the first UFO uh, UFO disclosure movement in '93. So they, yeah, they're funding it, and Stephen Greer, Dr. Stephen Greer, who's the the leader, so-called uh, he's he's uh, you know he speaks openly about his relationship to the Rockefellers. It's absolutely ridiculous how people can believe him. Yeah, yeah, he threw out flags for me very early on. Yeah, but anyways, uh, Antarctica. Um, <laughs> back to that. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, uh, you know, if they're trying to, um, you know, keep hold on to it, like, for, like, you know, when the re resources run out, everywhere else in the world, they just, like, go there and grab it and, uh, you know, just control, control the world that way, you know, like, you know, they can control it that way, kind of, like, you know, well, whoever has... Usually, 
it's easily done when they tell us we're on a finite sphere that there's nowhere else to go other than space and how many of you or me know how to go to space none of us it's a that's very right and they game. control it isn't if it? you they look they at the map the in front of us yeah. yeah if you look at the map in front of us it's a very different world in terms of finite resources um, because there there are infinite almost resources available to us if you look at the map in front of it. Well, speaking of the rock, I, I mean, this what I, I just I just had a thought. Like, if if you imagine Europeans five hundred years ago, they would be living on you know a part, this very small part of this map that we see in front of us in the inner circle, and they wouldn't have known about. South America. I mean, of course, the the leaders or the Freemasons would have known about it, but the people wouldn't have. So maybe we're just people who are living, um, you know, having the same scenario. In five hundred years, people look back and think, "Oh, you know, the people in that circle didn't know about." Right, it. didn't know anything. Exactly. <laughs> well, before I forget about the Rockefeller thing and the scarcity thing, that kind of ties back into the fact that they paid off all the scientists the year of the Geneva Convention to start the whole scarcity of oil thing that we're now are you know all struggle under daily the, the scarcity of oil that's not even real i mean it's abundant trust me i live in an area that's got plenty of it and the their whole system has been designed to put us in a scarcity system where we're all thinking that we have to pay for these things that are abundant on this plane we live on and then that goes back to this map People talk about, okay, why would they mess up our food with GMOs? Why would they chemtrail us with these chemicals? Why would they fluoridate our water? They have to live here too. They have to eat this food too. They have to breathe this air too. Maybe they don't. Maybe they have exits and they can get out to some of these lands we're seeing on the other maps and their worlds of wonder with green fields and clean air and beautiful streams and food that isn't filled with moth DNA and pig DNA and yeah, that's yeah, where all the all the cele celebrities go. You know, when they when they fake their own death. You know, they exactly. it's like paradise. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Great, that's it. Yeah, you're on the right path. Jimmy is jamming with uh, Elvis and <laughs> kicking back with Jimmy Dean. But I really am I'm checking with the guy right now. He still isn't answering. And he said the guy hasn't gotten back to him. Apparently, he hasn't been on Facebook in a day or two. So still have no source on that new map. I know at one point there was a lot of... Uh, talk with um, David Weiss and his group and they were all trying to do this thing of mapping out the, the actual map uh, and if it wasn't his group I do apologize I mean there's so many flat earthers doing so many different things but they were trying to use like coordinates of the air maybe it was Dr. Zach that's what it was was using the coordinates of all these air ports and things that have to be correct for these airports to actually be able to navigate and using that with a map and changing continents around and he'd gotten kind of far on it he and i were talking on email and then he got some issues at home and had to kind of step back but i saw he posted a video not too long ago on uh some things so i'm trying to find out has his map progressed i haven't gotten an answer yet apparently he's kind of still tied up with the family thing have any of you seen that map he was working on where you had moved the continents around and changed some things yeah, as, as far as I'm away, he's still working on it. Um, yeah, he's, he's been kind of slow. Yeah. I think he also, he was trying, something about the sun as well, isn't he? He was trying to calculate yeah, the... the sun. Uh, right, yes sir, that's the same guy. Yeah. 
that's the sad thing. I see a lot of people get so far in their work and then family issues come in or health issues come in or a friend passes or some kind of emergency in their life pulls them away from their work. That seems to be a consistent thing in this movement or this true quest or whatever you want to call it. Well, look how long it's taken us to try and set up this podcast. Well, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's been that. nearly a year, yeah, isn't John, it? John, exactly, John. It's crazy how long it's taken us. <laughs> you, me, Rob, Josh, James. Yeah, we're well, not crazy. short of numbers either, but it's no. tying it all together. It's getting that, it's, it's, you know, when we're tough. all on the crest of the wave or whatever. You know, like tonight's been fantastic. This We've had some great questions coming in, and, uh, yes. some great guests. It's been great. <clears throat> yeah, been really good. Josh still there, or has he nodded off? Yeah, no, I think he had to go uh, deal with, you know, family, suffer. Um, I'm back. Hey, Rob's back, though. <laughs> hey, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think of this map then, Rob? Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. I'm. Oh, I like it. It's quite um, amusing, isn't it? Yeah, big, yeah, yeah. Big possibility, I suppose. Don't know about that little gap in the northwest corner there. Well, that's well the you know day. what you'd need to find that gap. You'd need <laughs> a gyro compass. Yes, you would. Talk to us about gyros, John. You need a gyro compass to go in a straight line. Otherwise, you're going to be going in a grand circle around the, the North Pole. What you need is to fire up your gyroscope, set it in the bearing you need, and it will stay in that bearing. Um, yeah. Because Basically. of rigidity in space. That's right, rigidity in space. Although I'm going off that that description now because what you're space call it? doesn't exist. Oh, that's right, rigidity along the plane. How about that? Yeah, well, it's more the that the axes don't move relative to anything. They don't really move relative to the spin of the Earth, the bullshit spin of the Earth. Um, the spin around the sun, the the ball traveling from the North Pole to the equator to the South Pole, the, the, the axis doesn't move. It stays exactly where it was when you fired it up. And that's where I lose for everyone. Now you got me. Like I was going to say, you got us. It's just the rest of the guys. <laughs> we got to get on board. Have you looked at gyroscopes much, Richard? No, I haven't. No. Enough, enough uh, to know that, that in, 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 enough to know that they're you know proof of flat Earth. Um, <laughs> but I haven't yeah. dug, dug deeper, to be honest. If you want to work together on a on a blog post about gyroscopes then um give us a shout definitely but there you go i was going to recommend john to go be your go-to guy he is he is the go-to gyroscope sir yes absolutely it's a one-stop shop that proves um it's not a globe and it's not spinning yeah without well, yeah, a doubt might, might, might take you up on that offer once i've once i've worked through a few of my my posts on my list <laughs> yeah sure yeah Awesome. If I can get my gyroscope working again, <laughs> you know, I'll film it. Well, you it's like the gyroscope gyro gyro isn't it? Say again. No, I was going to say it's like the gyroscopes on the aeroplane, isn't it? it? Keeps it keeps it level, right? And the aer yeah. aeroplane always always flies level, doesn't it? It doesn't, you yeah. know, fly in a slope, you know, upward slope or downward slope. It, uh, after it, yep. it reaches its height, it's it's level, level to the ground. You know, proving flat like earth. a flat earther to me. I am, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gravity, ke gravity keeps the plane perfectly in a circle. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I, I could have sworn you were um, you were a, 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 I don't know, questioning the the flat earth, but maybe that was someone no. else with his girl, girlfriend. Yeah, that was earlier. That was mm. another person. Yeah, yeah that was, we've been going. No, I, I was questioning the uh, I was questioning the AE and the Gleason's map. You know, uh, I don't think it works. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you, you're you're talking about um, free energy, free energy, uh, yeah. and and the the do um, uh, I mean, what what is it that you hold on to on that? That like your your number one cling to or hold on to? You know, like I, I've got the gyroscope. What what's your number one proof of the straight line, sun, rectangle? Portal Pac-Man map. Well, <laughs> at the moment, at the moment, it's just uh, it's just a belief, you know. I, there's no actual proof. Cool. If if you, if you, if you watch his videos, right, it's uh, there's no actual proof. It's, he's got a few um, uh, graphics going, and you know he quotes from uh, from the Bible. Uh, it's not something you can go out and and uh, prove, you know, he's saying the the sunlight is uh, is it's like a wave. Uh, have you seen? If you go to time and date com, right? Have you seen that? Yeah. Um, yeah. The night, the night and day wave. Yeah. Yeah. He says like that one wave is uh, one uh, one turn of the sunlight from east right. to west. You know. Uh, right. One cycle. Yeah, cycle, I yeah. had a thing. I, I went on to time and date because I was interested in the twilight times. Because up here in the north, we have in the summer, we have sort of twilight up until you know ten o'clock at night, even beyond. And I was quite interested. I was at fifty-four or fifty-one degrees north. And you know, I was quite interested in looking at fifty-one degrees south. It's turned out to be around about the Falkland Islands and I was looking on time and date you know and they were showing exactly the same you know this is twilight we're all getting the same twilight we're all getting the same night time we're all getting the same sunshine and then you sort of click through on the twilight button and and it says it's mathematical twilight it's not um, you know visual twilight My, the way I I I define twilight in the UK is whether I can go outside and read a book by the sky basically by the light of the sky if I can't read a book then twilight has gone but the way they were defining twilight was the amount of degrees that the Sun had gone over the horizon or whatever you know, regardless of whether it was pitch black and you couldn't see the hand in front of your face, or whether, like in the north, you could walk outside and read a book by the light of the sky. Uh, any comment? Yeah, the thing is, uh, can you trust time and date? You know, they, they no, they uh, <laughs> they promote they're promoting the globe. You know, they. <laughs> It's, well, I can tell you personally, algorithm. From, from personal experience, I live on the Gulf Coast, and I see the sun rise and set a certain way living here. And then I went up to Oregon for three months, and there it's just like what John's talking about. The sun sets, and it is in the west until 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, lighting up the sky. And then it finally goes away, and then with that, like, hours, 3, 30, 4 o'clock, you start seeing daylight in the east, and that just doesn't add up. Anywhere yeah. down here, it doesn't do that, you know. So yeah, it's kind of insane. It look that matches the AE map to see that happen for me. But I very much have dug into the free energy videos, and it 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 works for some of the north and south pole issues with the magnetism and the starlight, with the southern uh, sky that we're all trying to figure out. It works with the equator split that's supposed to happen, which again, all I've seen are pictures. I've never witnessed that myself with the equator in the sky, with the stars that occur, you know. It works with a lot, uh, except it does work. what you can observe. 
except uh, you for know, that and part that I was again, just say right exactly that part doesn't fit you know that I see the sun rise in the northeast and I see it set in the northwest I mean how the hell is that possible if um, it's how we think it is the, the only way I can see that possible is if it's going in a circle and then you've got time lapse that shows it doing a huge arc you've got yeah, uh, time lapse that shows the sun getting smaller on the horizon as it goes away yes, and getting that larger was my, uh -huh. as it comes towards you and you did a fantastic video on that um, well thanks There's just too many things that you can empirically see for yourself that just do not add up. You, you have to ignore every single sense in order for it not to, uh, in order for it to fit the ball model. What about the weather conditions in the Falkland Islands compared to your weather conditions? John. Yeah, we talking about that a minute ago. Um, I mean, they're literally the same. I think the Falkland Islands is 53 degrees south. You know, I'm nearly 52 degrees north. You know, and I, I live in England. Um, where, you know, everything's hunky-dory. Whereas the Falkland Islands is... Well, there was an island, Macquarie Island off New Zealand. That was the same latitude as um, I am north, and it was actually deemed too inhospitable to be a penal con colony uh, for an offshore prison. It was and too yet, inhospitable. And yet, there was a big war in the 80s over this little sheep-covered island. Wasn't yeah. There? Yeah, what, right. was the, what was the what was the queen going on about for that? I could never understand here in America. We never understood that whole thing until I looked at the Gleason map and noticed that the Falkland Islands are just north of Deception Island. They seem to be the closest islands to um, Antarctica. Yeah. Yep, Deception Island. Exactly. That kind of blew my mind. It was like, well, there you go. That explains Great why name, hey. to have control. Yep. <laughs> How far is Deception Island from the Falklands? It's the next island over. I mean, it's the closest point you would go south from there to hit that point in our Antarctica. It, which makes sense. It's the entrance to, to Disneyland. Exactly. It's the gate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You literally queue up at Deception Island to go into Disneyland and then you turn around 180 degrees and come back because there's nothing to see. There's a guy who worked uh, in the Antarctic, um, and he said, like, you know, the, the ship it, it, uh, stops off in the Falklands, you know, before before it goes on to, you know, go, goes on to the uh, to the base there in the in the Antarctic. So it's a, it's a strategic place for the for the British, you know. That's uh, that's why that's why they, they they keep it. The island itself, there's nothing there, but few sheep you know <laughs> uh, nothing <laughs> and oil of course they tell us there's oil there. but it's, it's only it's very small isn't it a small island yeah. uh, tiny yeah 30 probably 33 square mile wow we didn't, that's, <laughs> that's just that's too much anyway on that note guys i'm gonna have to leave you to it all right john well thank you okay cheers john sure i'm glad we got to hang out man yeah, yeah, really glad to. I'll uh, pleasure, catch pleasure up to you time, shortly. Thank you, mate. Cheers. Take care. I'll catch up with you shortly. Absolutely. See you, John. Bye, mate. Why don't we change tack? Um, Richard, you were talking about the numbers with 9-11 um, yesterday on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. With in the new tower as well. I found that um, very, very interesting. I've never. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's. I'd, ne I'd never. Um, did you want to? Uh, I mean, it's kind of. Hang on. Let me get that up on Twitter. If I can have that as a base. Um... 
And isn't it interesting that they, as their uh, memorial, they did, a, I guess, basically an inverted cube into the ground, if you want to look at it that way? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so, if, I mean, first off, with 9/11, uh, if you if you go on Google Earth uh, and you you draw a line along one of the sides of the towers, you'll notice that it's aligned to 119.0 degrees. Which, of course, suggests that you know the people when they when the tower was built, they already knew it's you know its destruction date was encoded into its um, its design, <laughs> which is amazing. Um, well, it seems I saw a picture and some footage of the sunlight passing through the middle section of one of the towers. Yeah, and I know. You could exactly. see nothing. No, no office front. There was nothing. It was empty, an empty area. Like the building was made to be flat. Is what it looked like. You know, like it was set up to be this big sacrificial ritual thing they had ready, which, which, what your numbers are leading to, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I'll just. Uh, so all all the numbers, you know, the dates of opening the towers, the dates of it collapsing, uh, you know, when Tower Seven was built, etc. It's all, it's all by their, you know, uh, by numbers. So for example, uh, Tower Seven, which was the third tower that fell on nine eleven, uh, is forty seven stories tall. Uh, Nineteen eighty seven, when it was built, is the Hebrew year fifty seven forty seven. So you know, forty seven stories, forty seventh year of the Hebrew calendar. Uh, and then, you know, in 87, they had the song, uh, you know, Bon Jovi, Living on a Prayer, We're Halfway There. Um, that was the number one played song of 87. Um, so you, wow. can find, you can find all these numbers and, and clues in, in music, in movies. Um, and when you, when you start to look at 9-11, um, I mean, those numbers are everywhere. The, the Shard, for example, has uh, 1,000... 16 feet, I think, uh, no, 1,060 feet tall, I think it is, uh, which is, you know, they like to flip flip the numbers. So six is nine, like the Jimi Hendrix song, if six was nine. Um, uh, so you get 116 as well as 119 show up everywhere. So the, the alignment in Paris, for example, between the, um, the, 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 what do you call it, obelisk uh, with a golden top, the alignment to, from that obelisk to the Arc de Triomphe uh, is 116. Um, and I mean, 116.000, I mean, it's, it's exact. The odds of that happening are, are really tiny. And so these numbers show up everywhere. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's just their, their way of encoding things into events. Um, and once you, once you start, um, you know, once you realize that, uh, you can look at pretty much any event and you can find it. Uh, I wrote a blog post uh, on synchronicity, uh, the eighth post in my blog, um, The Narrow Gate, where I talk about how the number 33, 30, 13, uh, 322, which is the skull and bones number, uh, 911, they show up in pretty much every single false flag event that's happened this year. You know, Munich, uh, the truck killing in um, Nice, um, like all, all of these events, the, the London bombing, uh, seven seven, uh, they all have these numbers encoded all over the place in ages and addresses, in the dates, in the number of the train carriage on seven seven bombings. Um, I mean, it's it's absolutely phenomenal how much once you once you once you realize that these numbers are there, you can dig and you'll find them literally everywhere. And it's not a case of, uh, I mean, the the reaction that I get when I show people this for the first time is that oh, you can find numbers everywhere, but you don't really need to try that hard to find it. I mean, I mentioned the movie Westworld in the chat um, yesterday, and uh, if you if you just look at the Wikipedia page and go down the list of actors and directors and producers, you'll find these numbers and you know mirror dates featuring several numbers: 33, 119, uh, 69, and then 96 mirror, as well as the 37, 73 mirror, which is significant. Uh, you'll find them encoded in every single person, you know, every single actor's uh, birthdays and 
uh, you know, personal record basically, and you don't have to look very hard because it's just birthdays, uh, and the you know, the chances of those numbering numbers reoccurring so often is is pretty pretty tiny. Um, so we see that these these actors are chosen beforehand to have roles in in these movies. Um, I mean, there's there's bigger. I mean, I mentioned on the chat as well that you have the cube matrix, uh, which is going into some of the stuff that uh, I'm sure James um, will want to talk about a bit more. Because um, when once you start realizing these synchronicities, you realize that our our universe is mathematical, um, and which ties in very nicely with cymatics, uh, magnetism. It's it's all maths basically. Uh, and numbers appearing everywhere, you can kind of decode reality with, with the numbers, which is why if you look at, for example, um, the year that uh, Roswell happened, 1947, which is again the 47, the uh, the fake moon landing was 1969. Uh, you take 69 years after Roswell and you get 2016. Uh, Independence Day movie uh, came out 96. The mirror of that is 69. This is you know, 69 years after Roswell and Independence Day gets relaunched this year. Uh, I mean, I can go through pretty much any alien movie, uh, you know, the big ones, Avatar. Uh, yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head, but all, all the movies, um, you can go through them and find all these numbers and they all point to 2016. Uh, and then you compare that, as I did in my blog post, um, with... Uh, what politicians are saying in the news. I mean, they're all talking about disclosure. Obama's talking about aliens and, you know, etc. The, the Podesta files that came out now. I mean, all these numbers and all these occurrences and the, the, the news media, uh, movies about aliens, it's, yeah. it's, it's all predictive programming uh, yeah. to pass or something. And it's pointing towards November, in my opinion. Hillary walking down the path next to David with her alien book in her arm. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Have you seen that, you seen that picture? I haven't, no. What, yeah, I look she's, she's walking down a trail with David Rockefeller, and she's got a book like clutched to her chest, like a schoolgirl would carry her books, so that the cover is easily seen, and it's a book about aliens. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've seen, oh, thanks for raising this. I'll, um, yeah, I'll include this. <laughs> Yeah, this is the sort of stuff. I mean, they, they, they talk about that. I mean, you look at uh, my last blog post on the alien deception. Um, you see in, in the same year, you have Obama, uh, Bill Clinton, and Hillary Clinton, among others, uh, appearing on the same Jimmy Kimmel show, and he asks them exactly the same questions. It's just repetition. Exactly. It's just re repetition is the, the best form of mind control. And by repeating stuff, they're just going to get the public to, to buy into it, which is the same as when... Uh, you had the 1983, uh, you know, um, speech by Reagan at the UN saying that, you know, what better way to unite the world than uh, if we were faced with an al a common alien threat or something like that. Uh, Bill Clinton says that. The, the president in the Independence Day movie says exactly those words. Uh, you know, these words are just repeated, you know, ad hominem, you know, by Mr. Kako on the news, by, by newscasters, presenters. Uh, they're pres they're preparing us for disclosure essentially. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, it was about numbers, but I got onto disclosure because um, that's kind of a big topic now, and I'm tying uh, a lot of a lot of numbers into that because it's a big it's a big thing. <laughs> and very timely because it's coming, it's coming quick. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know you might have, you've probably seen all the predictive programming with 9/11, uh, you know, from the Simpsons and. Uh, Jurassic oh, yeah. Park on the watches and stuff. I mean, you see 611 or 116 as well, uh, and 911 flipped backwards is, um, I mean, uh, upside down and backwards is November 16th, 11, 16. Um, so that's just the mirror number for them. Um, I mean, yeah, it's coming. There's numbers. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a prophet or an oracle. Uh, it's not a prediction. Um, I'm just, you know, putting out, I mean, I'll write a blog post on it. Hopefully I can get it out soon. It's a lot of material to cover though. Um, but I mean, the numbers, the numbers are what they are and they point to that date. And that's, you know, that's that, it's not a prediction. Um, no one would be happier than me if, if it was wrong. But I think, I think a general consensus uh, is that disclosure is coming. 
um, and it's going to come soon, probably. Um, another fascinating thing I came across yesterday is that the the Giza pyramids are 5,776 5776 uh, inches tall, if you include the capstone. Um, then you mirror that to the Hebrew year, 5776 was 2016, uh, though we had the Hebrew New Year on October 3rd. So currently we're in 5777. So, uh, you know, we're in the year the New World Order gets um, uh, introduced, I guess. I mean, we're kind of already living in a police state New World Order, but um, you know, this is the year where you know the New World Order where it comes out of the shadows. Yeah, this is. I mean, they need, in the words of David Rockefeller, uh, you know, they just need the right. He said, uh, "We just need the right crisis, and people will accept the New World Order." Uh, and you know, the sort of stuff you're talking about with Project Blue Beam, and um, you know, they've got UFO technology. Uh, you know, flying saucers is nothing more than just, you know, what they call anti-gravity levitation uh, that Tesla talked about in his patents, you know, 100 years ago. Um, yeah, that they got when, an Operation Paperclip, too. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when, when, they, when, when these craft fly, due to the electromagnetism, uh, you know, electromagnetic nature of how they fly, they light up in the dark, uh, which is why you see... You know, these glowing, you know, in the 1952 uh, UFO sighting over Washington, D.C., uh, you see these glowing uh, flying saucers, basically. Um, and, um, and um, hey, Mike. Richard, what's up, guys? How you doing, Mike? Hey, Mike, what's, what's up, brother? <laughs> uh, I won't interrupt you guys. Keep on going. Yeah, sorry. I was, I was just saying about UFOs, how they, you know, the... They fly, they're anti-gravity, I mean, not gravity, but, you know, that's what they're called. It's electromagnetic craft, uh, so they glow in the dark, essentially, which is why when they fly over, you know, Washington in 1952, um, you can see that they were, you know, glowing, kind of. Uh, and you can imagine, you know, there's there's tons of movies that have had the plots that, um, you know, this the narrative that, uh, you know, UFOs appear over a city and then everyone panics and just runs towards the government, basically. Uh, or United Nations, and it wouldn't be very difficult for them to just throw out a few hundred of those over, you know, the biggest 20 cities, um, and everyone flocks to the New World Order. Um, that's just step one, basically. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot they could do, and it's, I mean, I don't know how they're going to do disclosure, but I'm, you know, I've got my popcorn out, <laughs> you know, trying to warn as many people as I can. Uh, because people who aren't aware of it are just going to get wrapped up in that deception. And once once you're in that deception, particularly considering that Project Bluebeam has, um, you know, you think about the mental aspect, them bombarding, you know, low, low, very low frequencies and extremely low frequencies um, from radio towers. They can feed um, feed you thoughts essentially. Um, and once that happens, you know, you're if you don't if you aren't aware that that's happening, you're it's going to be very difficult for you to see past deceptions, particularly for those people who aren't questioning things already uh, and, you know, laughing at conspiracy theorists. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've been talking a lot, so interesting to hear what you guys think. No, great. That's great stuff. And interestingly enough, I was quite wrapped up in the whole uh, ufology field for some number of years. I did a lot of research into it, uh, went to a lot of conventions, met a lot of the... Uh, names in the field. Got to be pretty good friends uh, with Lloyd Pye before he passed away and examined the star child skull at length. Oh yeah, he died from like weaponized cancer or something, right? Yes, sir. I, I looked into his stuff, it's fascinating. Yeah, he was, um, he was a brilliant man. Him. Yeah, he was quite a brilliant man and I used to do a show on cable access back in the early 2000s. He was on there a couple times and he brought the skull. And, uh, so how, was, how does the how does how do the skulls fit in? Are they like Nephilim skulls or something, or what's what's? Yeah, that? that's what I know it is now. But at the time, you know, I was completely wrapped up in the alien mythology. So, yeah, the story that went along was a Mexican girl in a cave, and the exactly yeah found the bones, and you know, it was from these people who had the star 
beings visiting and the whole classic mythology of the hybrid the, children. And, the cool thing about the Lloyd Pye stuff is that I, I, when I was looking at that, I was wrapped up in the Stephen Greer serious disclosure thing. Um, right. And then I kind of just parked that and went on with, you know, other conspiracy theories, as you call them, um, and, you know, got into Flat Earth. And then you kind of you look back a year or a year and a half later at, you know, stuff like Lloyd Pye, and it just fits in with what you've learned, new, like newly learned, uh, but you didn't know it at the time. Um, it's quite quite cool. It's, it's nice to revisit some of your old theories when you have new eyes. Yes, it is. Exactly, yeah. That's what I mean, yeah. <laughs> So how have you been, Mike? What you going on? What you doing these days? Oh, man. I'm glad you asked. Richard, do you mind if I float our idea to uh, to Walt over here? Oh, you mean the magnetism of the, uh, the sky? or? Yeah, hey, hey Walt. I, 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 I beat you to it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Walt, we've, Richard and I have been kicking around some ideas, and I know that you were in on this at one point. What do you think? Do you remember seeing the rocket hitting the dome and all the rockets that never hit the dome, right? Right. What if, what if it's magnetism? Because remember, we were talking about super cooled water before, and Richard and I were thinking, right. well, if it's highly, highly, highly magnetic, you it would either be repelled against the dome or sucked to it. Right. Actually, coincidentally, I was watching a video last night about quantum locking with very super cool magnets that they can be quantum locked into a place in space it's you'd have to see a video and i can't really present from my setup right now but yeah that's I, really cool stuff yeah like you see those videos where the guy's got like the little saucer ufo shaped magnet on the track and it's really cold and it's leaving a trail of frost behind it as it goes around in a circle right and if you take that same disc and like turn it at a 90 degree angle to that or a 45 degree angle to that track, it stays in that position, still completely frictionless, still can float around that ring completely. If you turn the ring upside down, it'll hang from that ring magnetically and lock into whatever position and put around in that track. So yeah, that really, I, my mind did the same thing. Wow, maybe it's not liquid exactly. Maybe it's some it's, kind of highly cool magnetized field up there that's locking those rockets up. That's crazy how we all had that hive mind on that. Well, the, the, the biggest thing for me is, is, you know, and this is something I was saying to Richard, it's just, as we all know, when hot air rises, it cools, right? And if there's, there's got to be some kind of energy source above us that's keeping the waters above us cold. That's why air cools, right? Right. Does that make that makes sense? Oh yeah, so, something's keeping it cold up there for sure. And maybe perhaps nothing hits the dome. Maybe because the the electromagnetism is so strong, nothing will ever touch it. When I saw Sorry, that, I missed, I missed the bit here. Could you could you read that <laughs> just for like ten seconds? What like the super cooling and the what you were saying as I dropped off there. Yeah, or, or Richard. I mean, or, or Mike. Who? Who me? Me or Mike? No, either one. I don't know. Just <laughs> whatever well, you're. I was just... I was just talking about seeing the video just yesterday about the the quantum locking that can happen yeah. with the super cool magnets. Yeah. And how right. that would definitely fit into the idea of there being a super cooled state up there that's yeah. uh, locking those rockets into place rather than liquid. It's very possible. Hey, Walt, do me, uh, when you have a moment, this is something that I showed Richard, and I think it's a giveaway. Uh, if you look at the rocket hitting the dome, right as the rocket hits the dome, the fuzz around the rocket, that metallic crap that's on it, oh, yeah, it's like, yeah, like, well, it flares out for a few seconds right before it, and then it flattens out once it stops and spins, right? Yeah, I noticed that. It was almost like uh, scales or something flaring out for a few seconds, and then... So what, what did you yeah. make of that, Mike? Think of what? The, the fuzzy stuff that kind of flattens out after a second or two. I, again, I think it's magnetism. I mean, there's obviously some kind of force acting upon that fuzz. Because first it's flying around as the rocket spins, and then when it stops, it all flattens out onto the fuselage. Yeah. I mean, jo just to like uh, qualify, I mean, J John was saying earlier that he thought those, that video was completely fake, because uh, where would the people who made the video get the funding from? 
and you know they're, they're flying around with jetpacks and stuff. But um, yeah, if we assume the video is true, then yeah, I mean it it is it does look like magnetism, to be honest. Could be. And another tie is the whole fact of the magnetism effects on water. I mean, if you have the right magnetism going on up there and the right balance of maybe even salted water of some type, some kind of saline water up there that would be the permanent, holding back the waters above. Yeah. And uh, this is something I also talked about with Richard, Walt, is, is that giant chunk in the sky where there's no stars where they think the dome broke. And I was, I was the rift, you know. if there's super cooled water up there and it hit the ground, that would explain the freezing of the woolly mammoths. The instant freezing, right. Instant freezing, right. Because I, I was telling Richard that if you hold a can of compressed air upside down and, and spray it, all that super cooled water comes out. And you can freeze almost anything instantly with that stuff. Instantly. Yes, that's that's interesting, man. That's I'm, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, it might, you Mike, got my mind going now. Mike, I don't know if you noticed, but your, your audio is kind of uh, like bad quality. Really? Not saying sure. your, yeah. your voice is not <laughs> maybe the audio is a bit too loud or something, but it's definitely staticky. It's staticky. Okay, I'm sorry. Hold on. Not terrible. Oh, one last thing, Walt. Did you like the video that I made uh, of the lightning arcs with the ground? You never let me know about that. I yeah. got your approval on it. I thought, I thought I'd sent you a like on that and, and re-send it around. If I didn't, it was probably in the middle of something going on in Oregon because, you know, I was <laughs> it was quite hectic while I was there. But, yeah. <laughs> with all those girls running after your, you with your accents. Or... <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I was, I was actually there taking care of family matters. My mom was quite ill. And, yeah. Does everyone want to click on me? There you go, Rob's got it up. Oh, what am I watch the buzz, Brad. Watch the buzz. Stop it, good burn. Stop it, good burn. There it is. Can you see that? Yeah, I see that. Yeah, look at that, it just floats. Yeah. It's almost like uh, I mean, quantum blocking is a very interesting thing, though. I think. Look at that! It flattened out. Is there an orientation on that video? Like they show which way? Hey, Rob, why don't you send that to me, and I'll go ahead and screen share it. I'm sure I have a cricket sound somewhere. And he's back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John and I were kind of passing the duties back and forth. I was handling the chat and he was handling the presentation. My, you know, my computer after that update last night, it's been a, nice. quite a chore. What is this? Is this live on YouTube, by the way, still? Yeah. It, yes, it is. Awesome. This is my first live show, actually. <laughs> is it? Absolutely, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I guess last time we weren't broadcasting, were we? Yeah, I don't think so. Well, yeah, we're I'm gonna pushing almost there for you, Josh. Hours. Can we get myself now on YouTube? <laughs> hey, Mom, I'm on YouTube. Right. Good luck, Mom. <laughs> I gotta get a better picture. It's up there. What did you say, Rob? Where'd you put yeah, it? I just said it was up there. I put it in the our our room. All right. Let's 
How many viewers have we had tonight? We are at six now. I think we were up to eight at one point. <laughs> nice. <laughs> there's, a, there's quite a big group here earlier on. <laughs> yeah, I think we had more people on. Yeah, there was. We had, more we had watching, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Probably half the people watching were the ones on. <laughs> I'm sure Eric DeBay didn't have a lot of viewers on his first video. Is this any better, guys? Yeah, that's much better. Okay. Hey, Richard, what did you think of that guy's Coriolis numbers yesterday? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I just looked at that briefly. I mean, it was just absurd. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of these guys are just... Uh, they say the Earth is spinning, and they don't know which way it's spinning. <laughs> Yeah, we I get that a lot. It's like yeah, it's it's like which way is the earth spinning? They don't even know. <laughs> and then they still expect us to have all the answers for flat earth. I mean <laughs> Well, what I what I what really trips me out is the fact that these people think they're moving at twice the speed of sound and they don't feel it. No, oh, I had a I had a moment yesterday when I went with my dad. I asked him you know, he's, he's a former engineer or engineer as well. Uh, and, you know, he's quite proud of, you know, the knowledge and stuff, um, quite rigid in, in science. But I asked him, you know, if you're on the equator and you're spinning at 1,036 miles per hour and, you know, you move upwards on the ball, north or south, uh, the, 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 the diameter will decrease. So your, your centripetal acceleration or motion speed you're moving at will, will decrease. Um, so then, you know, you, you would, he said you wouldn't feel it if you're moving at a constant velocity, but then if you move from the equator to, to Sweden, let's say from Nairobi to Sweden, your, your velocity will change by 800 kilometers per hour, which, <laughs> which is the difference between standing still or sitting on a, on a, on a jet, you know, on a, on a Boeing 747 and saying that you wouldn't feel that is preposterous. And like, I think I struck a chord there with him. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, <laughs> that's that's a good a good proof. I think. Well, you know, again, I, you, if you're shooting around that's traveling at two thousand feet per second, you know, north to south, that's the most extreme. That's the most extreme drift you're going to have, and nobody has ever been able to calculate those numbers. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, they can't because they don't exist. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it, I, I love the fact that it's called the fictitious force. That's the best yeah. part. I mean, Coriolis, I saw there's a video on YouTube which you know, of some like park ranger or something going away with his rifle and like proving Coriolis. Um, gets his like shooting chart out and then he takes like four shots, five shots. And, you know, some of them go west, some of them go east, some of them go up, down, you know. And then he's like, yeah, this explains uh, Coriolis. He's like, no, <laughs> how could that explain Coriolis? That one pissed me off because he's a shooter as well. That really ticked me off. And, and the other problem he had was he was shooting east and west in the, it, where he wouldn't have the exaggerated effect of the Coriolis anyway. Yeah. It, it doesn't make sense to me because if you were to travel west, you would – you would reach a destination faster going to the west than you would go to going to the east. Hey, Michael, I like the one um, that, you know, we've got the whole atmosphere moving at a thousand mile an hour or whatever it does. And you can have clouds at all different levels moving in all different directions while the thousand, while the atmosphere is moving that fast. That's, that was, yeah. that's what fascinates me. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 I, yeah, the radius, I mean, clouds higher up, would move faster uh, than clouds lower down. 
So you could never you you wouldn't see clouds moving uniformly as one big body. You'd see them moving like layered, kind of if the atmosphere moved with uh, with the spinning ball or pear or yeah. orange or whatever you want to call it. Uh, what I'm saying, <laughs> what I'm saying is, you could have clouds, you know, at at say five thousand feet are moving east, and then you could have ones at a uh, thousand feet moving south. They're all the oh, clouds okay. are moving all in different directions at at different yeah. heights. Yeah, and yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, fi fireworks wouldn't work the way we know it. Rainfall wouldn't know. I mean, <laughs> rockets wouldn't work the way that they work. Like with that video that we just saw. Yeah, the and Earth the, should be below. the alternative to that would be that the atmosphere doesn't move, but then you would have, you know, you stick your head out the window, and it gets torn off by a thousand miles per hour wind. Um, but then the, the question is, if you have, if the atmosphere is moving with the Earth then you'll have a point where the atmosphere meets um, meets space, supposedly, where you'd have, you know, vacuum, zero miles per hour, and a thousand, you know, a thousand miles per hour, uh, plus whatever, you know, it'd be faster, you know, 100 kilometers up than it would be on the surface. So you'd have about a uh, thousand, one hundred kilometers or miles per hour meets zero miles per hour of, of you know, vacuum of space. Um, that's the equivalent. I mean, a, a hurricane is like 150 miles per hour. So a space shuttle that sticks its head out of the atmosphere uh, would get totally blown to shreds within a millisecond. <laughs> well, my big problem is, is they say we have what four, four or five layers of atmosphere. If you'd have, if you had varying, varying amounts of speed or spin, you'd have serious electrical storms because all of, all of you yeah. know. It, if you're decelling that quickly, all of those different particles are gonna gonna wrap in how about, electrical. How, how, how about the fact that you have uh, you know the thermosphere reaches temperatures of two thousand degrees Celsius, <laughs> and then you have you know I, I've looked this up. I'm including this in my in my next blog post. Uh, you have you have these these space shuttles that have you know aluminium wings and aluminium this and that and titanium aluminium melts at 600 degrees celsius so you've got you've got a thousand forty degrees a thousand four hundred degrees celsius to account for um as to why it doesn't melt and it's it's just absurd that people don't question that well what satellites, really, satellites as well well what really bothers me is the fact that nobody actually understand how gliders work the dry weight i looked this up the dry weight of the shuttle is a hundred and sixty five thousand pounds yeah they don't even have wings <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> i mean gliders have long thin 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 wings i mean the, the shuttle those wings are designed for supersonic flight the thing is pe people have been watching hollywood movies for too long so they believe anything about that don't they also say well, that, don't they also say the shuttle is um, traveling, say, at 15, 16, 17,000 miles per hour, and then it comes into the atmosphere and slows down to about 1,000, doesn't it? Imagine the stresses on a person's body going yeah, from 17,000 yeah. down to 1,000 in, in a very, very short space of time. Yeah, there's another problem with that, Rob, is remember that the shuttle flies a circuit approach, just like any commercial airliner or a plane. As soon as they, as, as soon as that aircraft turned northbound for, say, your final approach, you have a thousand mile cross, a thousand mile per hour crosswind to deal with on an unpowered, two hundred thousand pound brick. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. Well, and what I don't understand, maybe one of you guys can help me understand it, is. Is they're saying that because it's so, the Earth is so big, we don't feel that. But I just don't see how you elevate the two between. Okay, well, we're moving at a thousand miles an hour, but you can't feel it because of scale. That doesn't make sense. If anybody wants to tackle that, well, this is insanity. Just like you say, I mean, you step off a merry-go-round, your inner ear lets you know immediately that you were just spinning. So you step off a plane from the southern part of the states to the northern part of the states, but you don't feel that change in momentum that has to occur with that vast difference in the spin where you're located on their globe. I don't even think smoke signals would smoke 
smoke wouldn't even come out <laughs> right. of um, um out of uh, you know out of your fireplace correctly. It would all be blown away. I'm sorry, smokestack, chimney, whatever. Well, your chimney wouldn't be standing there if you had a thousand mile per hour wind. I mean, have you seen these <laughs> in from Haiti and you know Matthew <laughs> ripping roofs off? You know that's 150 miles per hour. Multiply that by 10. <laughs> Well, what's creepy is, is how do, how do, if you, if, if you got, if we have a mass of air, a volume of air, like what Rob is talking about, spinning in one direction, how can you have different weather systems spinning differently in the hemispheres? You have one going, what, west, one well, going east? First of all, they're not hemispheres. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, I know what I mean. How, how would a, how would a hurricane retrograde west? It doesn't have the power to overcome a thousand miles an hour. Yeah. Well, I think my my very favorite, uh, you know, proof of that spinning thing is uh, is the Doppler effect. <laughs> I mean, if if you, if it's spinning a thousand miles per hour to the um, what is it to the west? No, to the east. To the east. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, if it's spinning a thousand miles per hour to the east, then you wouldn't hear the you know sound would travel uh, in that direction, so you wouldn't hear anything to the west of you. That's what I said. A couple. I was like, how the hell would you be able to hear anybody west of you? And the people east of you would hear your you know if you spoke to them and they were standing east of you, they would get you know such a loud high pitched voice because the, the the sound waves would be so compressed. Due to the Doppler effect, that they were it's just all, like, it's, it's all relative. It's Sorry? all relative, isn't it? It's all relative. Hey, uh, Josh. <laughs> yes, sir. There's someone in the chat that's just on and on about how we have no clue about how the vacuum and the atmosphere works. And I said, "Well, would you like to come speak to us about it?" And he said he would. His name is Negatorx <laughs> on the chat. I just have no controls. My, since my update, my computer is worthless. No, I got you. I can do things in the chat, but I can't add people at all to the call. As long as when he's on here, he's not going to start going on and yelling and being a wanker. Right. Well, Josh has the. As long as he doesn't say that no, is racist. <laughs> right. Right. Air is white. It's racist. Is the air racist? No, no, no. There was a guy earlier who was no, saying. No, just snow. Yeah, he was, he was saying that, you know, flat earth is racist because Europe is in the middle. <laughs> and then he was saying that, uh, oh, no, whatever, it doesn't matter. Let's let's move on. <laughs> exactly. It's going to be your sexist. <laughs> so is this guy coming in or what, or is he going to be on the chat side? <clears throat> He's on the chat side now. We just, uh, I just dropped a link in there. We don't know how the atmosphere works, huh? Well, I'm all ears. Apparently, he's uh, not. He he's well. He's at least known for coming on and making these arguments. So, we'll see. Yeah, you picked that up too, huh? Mm-hmm. Has he been on this show before? Or no, I was just apparently monitoring was... the chat room, and he's yeah, he's apparently on about the atmosphere. So I'm like, well, just come and show us, like show bu- us what we're wrong. Yeah, our buddy Dave apparently has encountered him before. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, God, there's a lot of there's a lot of knowledge with flat earthers. <laughs> How many times a day do we do we are we told we don't know what we're talking about? At least a hundred times. <laughs> I just go through my Twitter feed. It's it's uh, people are. <laughs> but they have such a witty repartee, moron. I mean, I don't. I, have kids. I don't mind being called wrong, but I, I mean, keep it to that. I was. Uh, I believe I was told one day to go kill myself. Actually. Oh, just one day. Just one. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> just once. 
I don't know. I still don't understand why people don't realize and how they can't realize that if the earth is moving under their feet, how could they walk west? The, the earth is, would be like a giant treadmill. If well, it was moving, you know? Because they're on the earth, right? <laughs> <laughs> Earth, uh, it's all really just right? little, little sand mites on this tiny little speck. So, so what's the question? Is the the question that we don't understand how the vacuum of space works? He's, I think, getting ready. There he is. I think he's putting his makeup on and getting yeah. his, his purse ready. Or no, no he's, <laughs> oh, he he just jumped in. Uh, we shouldn't heckle him before he's on. Sorry. <laughs> no, he's Hi. on. Hello. Uh, hello. Negatorks. Hi. It's negator. It's fine. Negator. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Negator double X. I got you. How yeah, are you? Good. How are you? Yeah. Very good. Thanks. <laughs> Welcome. So, where are you calling from? Uh, I'm in Georgia. Oh, cool. Yeah. Georgia. Uh, I uh, I I didn't. Um, Explicitly said, you guys don't know what you're talking about. I heard that, but uh, <laughs> there, there was a few things that didn't um, were quite right, I guess. All right, it's quite possible. Uh, so, I don't know how. I mean, this is sort of the first hang on I've seen you guys on, and I'm not real sure what uh, I guess how to approach this, unless you just want me to dive into to everything I mean, that we're talking about. You you heard us talking about no, that, yeah, just that right. and uh, you just say you know what's your take on it? Sure. Well, the now I'm not I, I don't claim to be a professional, and I don't study these things in real life, but I, I've got a, a basic understanding. And when you're talking about the atmosphere, right, and how it um, uh, how it, there must be some point where like the atmosphere ends and space begins and once you cross that point, there's going to be like a violent reaction. Was that what was said? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Well, the uh, I linked a chart in the uh, the main chat. I could I could link it here if you like as well. But uh, all it represents is the uh, the pressure gradient as you go higher in altitude. Yeah. For instance, when when you walk up a mountain, right, it's harder to to breathe at the top of the mountain because there's less air, right? There's lower air pressure, mm -hmm. and that um, that drop in air pressure continues uh, all the way out to to space. I could find a a graph that displays this if you like. So there isn't like a uh, a hard drop, right? Because that would produce a vacuum, right? A vacuum is when you have two pressure systems that are different and they meet, yeah, and they seek equilibrium. So there really isn't a uh, a point where it goes from our atmosphere to space with a very hard drop. It's it's so gradual that the, there really isn't any of the problems that were sort of brought up earlier. Does that any of that make sense? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's that's the classic argument. Even that, but even that low pressure is it not spinning? Is it not moving at that same rate of speed? Well, sure. Yeah, all of it is. Then now, why do snipers have to account for the spin? <laughs> do snipers? Is that's that what they say. That's you, what we're told. Do you? Uh, I have a uh, an interesting one here for you. Uh, my longest range shot uh -huh. on a rifle range was a thousand yards, which is three thousand feet. Um, I didn't adjust for the Coriolis effect. It was an eight millimeter round fired at twenty one hundred feet per second. <clears throat> yeah, Mike, but the problem was you missed by ten feet. <laughs> is, is that is that what happened? Did, did you miss by ten feet? No, no, I hit the target dead on. And <laughs> again, we we only adjust for windage and elevation. Nobody adjusts for the Coriolis effect, which is impossible considering the fact that the Earth is it's in a constant velocity state. So if 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 we go back to the the, the pressure gradient and vacuum, I mean, to me. You know, I'm not an, an expert either, but to me, uh, I mean, if you've used a vacuum cleaner before, I mean, you either have a vacuum or you don't. I mean, there's there's nothing gradual about it. Um, you know, you you see these these industrial scale uh, industrial scale uh, vacuums lifting 
you know, large bricks and stuff. Uh, I mean, vacuum isn't something that's classically uh, gradual. Um, and, you know, NASA and stuff, they can put whatever charts they want, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't explain how you can go from having, you know, A pressure to going zero pressure, uh, no matter the magnitude of that pressure, um, if you know what I mean. Well, would you agree that three miles on top of a mountain, there's lower air pressure? Mm, I would, yeah. So is, uh, I'm not sure why that gradient can exist but we couldn't go ahead and accept the fact that they're, when you add, instead of three miles, say a hundred miles, that gradient right. could not there's, continue. There's, there's an assumption, um, well, I'm thinking I'll, 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 off the top of my head here, there's an assumption here that um, the, that it would be zero, you know, a perfect vacuum at the top of that pressure gradient, uh, which isn't necessarily the case. That's an assumption that you're, 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 you're trusting in NASA to tell you that it keeps going until it reaches zero. But you don't actually know that. Well, uh, we could... What we could do is uh, send up high altitude balloons uh, or we could look at uh, airplane instruments because that's how airplanes know their altitude is, is the local pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if you trusted those instruments, then you wouldn't need to trust NASA. Uh, and then you could take that data, and like in the link I provided to the right, you could you could take all that data, uh, extrapolate the rate, and then see that it will reach near zero at you know 150 miles or whatever it is. Speaking of which, how can it, how can an aircraft fly west against a thousand mile per hour headwind? Well, does the conventional model say that? There is a thousand mile an hour headwind relative to the airplane. Yep. If you're flying west, two seven zero against the spin of the east, zero nine zero, you're encountering a headwind of a thousand well, miles. Isn't I mean, doesn't it say that everything in one frame is moving in the same direction? The until surface here in the, the plane. Until you pose the spin. If your if your argument is that the earth and the atmosphere spin in a constant velocity in one direction. Mm -hmm. You would have to have. You would have to be able to oppose that pressure with the same amount of pressure plus your forward airspeed. Well, that's that's only if you were not a part of the same system. That saying that is like saying if you wanted to get up from your seat in an airplane and go to the bathroom, you would have to accelerate to the speed of the airplane and then move to the bathroom. That's not what happens because you're already moving with the airplane. Right. But but your system says this is not an enclosed system, that it is a system attached to an infinite void in which there is no boundary. It is just infinite space out there. The uh, airplane has a boundary. It contains its own environment and its own systems of motion and inertia. They're contained within that airline. This one isn't. Yeah, but uh, it doesn't need a, a literal boundary to be enclosed, does it? How else would you enclose it? How would you include? I mean, it's it's the G word that, that y'all don't like, but that's well, one is only necessary to hold water to a spinning ball, right? <laughs> well, I mean, it works though, right? Like the, whether or not you believe it, the, the concept I mean, it, that it works, it, right? It, it, but so does density and buoyancy. I I find that any 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 scientific uh, you know proof is true, or any 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 physics um, physics law is true on the smaller scale and the larger scale and you can't I mean if you say that water sticks to a, a ball on the, the size of the earth mm -hmm. you should be able to replicate that with a tennis ball or a basketball or you know a boulder or something you know any any scale which you can do with with magnetism uh, for example you can you can replicate it on any scale you can replicate density on any scale um, you know, water in a spinning bowl isn't, you know, replicatable other than for one instance. And neither is gravity. I mean, I can't take a yeah. five-mile boulder to a beach and stick a marble to it and have it stick to that boulder because the gravity well of the Earth is the greater gravity force. Well, then why is it our moon? Why is it our moon sucked to the sun? Because that's the greater gravity force here, right? 
Well, hang on. We, we got about five different questions going on here, and, and well, no, of course, saying. there's the, the Coriolis yeah. that we need to come back to. So, number one, the the classical definition of gravity in our system and the conventional model does not say that water should stick to the side of a tennis ball. I'm curious why you think it does say it should. Because it's sticking we'll to a tennis. thousand mile per hour ball? No, no, no. Hang on. He, he said that water should, based on class, classical understanding of gravity, that water should stick to the side of a tennis ball. So I, I'm, I'm curious about why, why he thinks that. Well, if you have uh, you know, 9.81 meters per second squared, you know, acceleration on something the size of uh, Earth, mm -hmm. attracting, you know, 30, 321 million cubic miles of water to it, you would expect by the maths that, you know, scaling it down, that a tennis ball would have, you know, this, the, you know, the required amount of gravity to attract, you know, the scale amount of water to it to make it stick just like the water would stick on a bigger bowl. Due to the gravity. Right. right. So, uh, so I understand what you're saying. So uh, the 9.8 meters per second is produced by the mass of the Earth. So a, a larger object would have a greater gravitational constant, right? So a smaller object would have a smaller gravitational constant, like a tennis ball. So you're right, we, we could scale that down, but the, the, uh, the comparison is going to put us with like a, a, an infinite, in, I don't know, I can't even say the word, an itty bitty amount of water, right? Now the other problem is that tennis ball is on the earth, and that tennis ball will never be able to generate enough gravity to overcome the full, the full, or the pull of Earth, right? Like, whether or not you believe it happens, that makes sense, right? The larger object is going to pull the water off the tennis ball, therefore you can't hold the tennis ball and expect it to attract water, unless yeah, you're not true. sitting on Earth, right? Right, so a tennis ball in space, spinning at 1,000 miles an hour, will, should hold water. Well, the, the spin and 1,000 miles, that's something else that we need to talk about. But, um, yeah, yeah, things attract other things. Now, he mentioned that you couldn't, you can't replicate this, and you actually can replicate this. You could do it in your garage, by uh, recreating the Cavendish experiment. Have, have y'all, I'm sure y'all have heard that one before, right? What, what that was? Yeah, I know what you said it, so go ahead. Well, I, I, could, I could link you a video, but you could do it yourself. Uh, basically, if you took a, a ladder and uh, took a, a rectangle of styrofoam, like a yard across, and you suspended that styrofoam from uh, from the ladder, so that it's hanging between the ladder's legs and the styrofoam was level with the ground, but maybe an inch off, and you had two, say, fishing wires on each end, so that uh, you have this hanging piece of styrofoam. And what this guy did was he took two, uh, I forget if they were steel or lead, but they were, they were, I don't know, we'll say lead, lead balls. You know, get a picture maybe. of it in the trap. Yeah. And he, um, he hung. Uh, well, that, that was the original canvas. I'm talking about one that was one, one of the recent ones, because it's been redone many times. Um, this, this one was a bit more complex than what I'm talking about. Uh, it, it, the experiment I'm talking about, I'll, I'll link it in a little bit. Um, he, he set the, the balls on top of the two, si or the two ends of the styrofoam, so still suspended, still hanging, still not moving, and he put bricks on each side of those balls, and over the course of, and he put a camera at the top of the ladder, and over the course of like a day, uh, the bricks and the steel balls attracted each other and it, it rotated. And then the next day, he flipped them, uh, flipped their sides, and they rotated the opposite direction. Uh, it wasn't very far. How, how, how do you know that it's the mass of the objects attracting each other and not something like electromagnetism, for example? Well, we could. I mean, we measure electromagnetism magnetism in, in specific ways, right? Like, how would you measure electromagnetism? With magnets. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I, if I put a magnet next to the brick, I, I, I wouldn't expect the magnet to pick up the anything other, anything else but like a ferrous material. I couldn't pick up a banana with the magnet. What? Well, we're talking about electromagnetics, right? And we're, we're trying to replace gravity with, with electromagnetism. So I, I guess I'm wondering, because I'm not real familiar with it, how, how you'd go about measuring something's electromagnetic pull 
or, or testing it even. I'm just wondering how how you know that it's it's you know the mass of those objects and not something else. It doesn't matter if it's electromagnetism or something. Seems okay, like well, you'd have to figure out a way to determine an object's electromagnetic pull before you could verify it was one or the other. Right, well, and I'm sure yeah. it's been done somewhere. I, I'm not familiar with it, but to to uh, let's see. If we were, if we want to find out or make sure that it was mass, right? I, I would assume we would change the amount of mass and see if we get a difference. Like, we could take instead of those steel balls, use use something that has a lot less mass, like a styrofoam cup, and see if that attracts the the bricks. Or we could use something with greater mass, like a much larger steel ball, and see if it attracts the bricks at a faster rate. That seems like a logical way to do it. But anyway, it was just an example of objects attract, attracting other objects that you could you could do, right? Because the water on the tennis ball is something you can't do. And I know all of that was very uh, was was pretty out there. And I'll see if I can find yeah, this video. Wrapping a nail in some copper wire and attaching it to a battery is another way to run an experiment of making things attract each other. Yeah, yeah, but we're talking about things on Earth, like all the things, like the leaves outside, and my computer, right? Not not something that actually has an electromagnetic charge. Assuming we could determine a minor pull on the electromagnetic charge. Oh yeah, so we yeah. Can figure out a way to measure that pull that we can't say that there is none. Yeah, I I, I would be interested in seeing seeing that because I don't think I've ever seen anything anybody do something like that. This is the uh, video that I'm talking about if you want to watch it some other time. Uh, it's getting late. Um, but gravi see, gravity is like, gravity is hard to talk about because most people that support it or go against it haven't really done any practical experiments. And so even for me, it's, it's hard to, uh, I, don't, I guess, articulate. It's hard to, you know, be, you know, sound intelligent about it, because I'm really not. But, um... No, I can appreciate that. No, you're actually coming across very well, my friend. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, so I'm gonna, I, I try to, to, to put forth, you know, the most reasonable arguments I can think of based on my... my Shallow understanding. Shallow understanding. Do you know the gra gravity falls? Did you hear my question about the ball and the moon? Things in water, and things <laughs> float, and things don't fall to the bottom of the like a fish tank. Is why we say we believe in buoyancy. Well, buoyancy. That's buoyancy is funny because buoyancy is actually caused <laughs> caused by the weight or the gravity of other objects. Things that are things that are heavier than air fall. Things that are lighter than air rise. So gravity doesn't have a pull on everything. You've got you got little uh, trees, trees, little seeds that uh, push their way up mm -hmm. against gravity. So gravity is not that strong, is it? No, no, gravity gravity is weak. Right. But what I'm saying as far as buoyancy, why why we have buoyancy, is because you have all this water, the weight of the water. On well, gravity top of gravity object. must be pretty strong if it's pulling the moon and pulling the tides and and the and the sun and. and and all these things, and so gravity must be fairly strong to do all these amazing things. Well, the the Earth then, is going around the sun because the sun uh, is much there's, larger. There's, 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 do, you, do you see the paradox here? Like you have, uh, as Rob was saying, you have gravity is strong enough to hold uh, 300 million metric miles of or miles uh, cubic miles of water, strong enough for that, but then weak enough that a helium balloon can just float away, or a butterfly can float away, or a kayaker can just stay on the surface of the water without getting sucked down. Uh, I mean, so gravity is strong enough for some things, but then weak enough for others. There's, it just doesn't match up. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's because you, you think of gravity in, like, the traditional sense of strength. Like, if you have a weightlifter that's very strong, he can bench, you know, 300, 400 pounds. Somebody who's not strong can only bench 100 pounds. So, it, it, when you see a butterfly lift off, you think, man, gravity is not strong enough. Well, gravity just doesn't, it's the, it, there's no parallel there. Because grav, the way gravity works is it pulls on mass, right? The more mass you have, the more pull there's going to be. So if you take something like a butterfly that has very, very little mass, there's very, very little pull. 
But if you take something like an elephant, where there's a whole lot of mass to pull on, right, at each individual molecule, then that means the elephant's going to weigh more than the uh, the butterfly. Is that so doesn't doesn't that mean that something that's very heavy? I mean, I'm standing on the ground right now. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, you know, if you take like a jumbo jet, shouldn't the jumbo jet then be squashed against the earth because it's much it has much heavier mass? Well, not not squashed, but it is much heavier. Sure. Uh, the the like nine. When you say squashed, you're sort of um, you're taking the gravity that that we're saying is there, and then uh, you know multiplying it's, its strength. It's, it's a bit of a childish. It's a bit of a childish question, admittedly, but I'm just curious to know how you would explain that. Well, no, no, it's not childish. But if if you were to go to a uh, you know planet that had a greater gravitational pull, then yeah, you may not be able to get a an airplane off the ground. It may be squashed. But uh, you know, not here because the airplane's still heavy, right? Like it still has a weight to it, and it overcomes that weight by generating lift through its wings and its engines. Just like you can generate, uh, you can get off the ground momentarily by jumping by applying force to the ground. Uh, you know, in the opposite direction that the Earth is pulling you. So it's, it's it's not you know it's not uh, it's not like a a massive force or a minimal force. It's not uh, it doesn't have a strength value like a weightlifter. Um, even if you read about it, they say it's a it's a weak force. Yeah. Does, it, does any of that make make sense, or am I just like rambling? Uh, do you know? Uh... Do you know how aircraft trimming works? Air, aircraft what? Trimming, trimming. Trimming, like when you trim, uh, yeah, it has something to do with elevators or rudder. No, it has to do with the elevator tabs. Um, let's say that we're flying a Cessna 172. Mm -hmm. uh, we're flying at 6,000 feet mean sea level. If there was a curvature to the earth, if there was a serious curve, any kind of curve, manually trimming an airplane would be absolutely impossible. So it's not it's not gravity that's pulling on the, that 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 keeps the plane in place. It's the way that the aircraft is trimmed and configured. Okay. If there was if there was a curve to the Earth, every single time I went up in an airplane, I would constantly be retrimming the aircraft. Basically, so, when you trim an airplane, the idea is is that you want to relieve pressure on the yoke and keep the aircraft in a stable on a stable altitude, right? Sure. If there was a curve, I would have to retrim an airplane. Every five minutes to retrim for the, for you know, a, a constant altitude, and anybody that's spent any time in a biplane or a, a small Cessna that doesn't have an INS system understands this, and I guess that's the point. I mean, it's level, and the, the funny thing about it is, it's called level flight. Well, when the plane gets in the air, uh, are, under the conventional model, are you saying that gravity would stop pulling on it? No, what I'm saying is trimming an airplane proves that the Earth is flat. Well, it, it, I mean, it sounds like you're saying that once you got in the air, it would just continue off into space. Is that kind of what you're saying? If the, if if you're using an, a globe Earth, eventually, yes, you would, depending on airspeed. So if you have an S, a 747 doing 600 knots, let's say 550, mm -hmm. not only would the pilot have to constantly retrim the aircraft for level flight, but you would feel that. Anybody in a commercial airliner that was on a constant curve would be experiencing G-force, but you don't you don't experience any of that. Well, you, you only experience G-force outside of one G when you make a drastic change, right? Like a change in, in altitude. No, it doesn't have to be drastic. You can feel you can feel G-force at two hundred feet per minute descent. Okay, but well, descent, right? Like you're descending two hundred feet, but we're talking about level flight where you're not descending or ascending, right? Right. So why, if he is flying level over the surface of a sphere, why should he experience anything more than, than 1G? Because you would have to retrim the aircraft for the curve. You would, well, be when you, reach you would be in a constant nose-high attitude. There's something on an aircraft called an attitude indicator. And it, it, that's the, the system in the aircraft which shows how the aircraft is pointed relative to the horizon. Mm -hmm. If there was a curve the aircraft would constantly have to be trimmed in a nose-high attitude. So if you were trimming and gravity was pulling on the airplane downward, what would happen? Wait, I, I don't understand the question. 
Well, gra it sounds like you're saying the gravity, once the airplane gets in the air, gravity is no longer pulling on it. Assuming the gravity is real. What I'm telling you is, is trimming an airplane, any old crop dusting airplane, anything, if there was a curvature to the earth, you would not only feel it, but it would be registered on how the aircraft flies. The, it, nothing would, would work anymore. It's, it's ridiculous. Well, let, let's say... Uh, we, we don't have to call it gravity. We can just call it the force that pull things down, whatever you want, <laughs> the, the downward force. Um, it, we could, uh, let's say if we had a magnet, right? If you got a big magnet and uh, you had some keys in your pocket and you walked by that magnet, would the keys uh, pull towards the magnet? I guess that would depend on the strength of the magnet and how oh, far yeah. away let's, let's say it was a huge magnet and you walk within like six inches of it, right? Like, you know, everybody's messed with the magnet. You know, there's a point where you can hover an object over a magnet, and it's not close enough that it will suck it to the, to the magnet, but you can feel there's a pull going on, right? Right. No. Oh. Well, but, but I mean, I've never got a magic spot. It either pulls or it doesn't. Well, I mean, it pulls, but you can, you can resist that force, right? Like, if you had two magnets, yes. one in each hand, you could hold them to the point where you would feel the force of the two objects pulling against each other and not let them touch? Yes. Right. Yes. So what I'm getting at is if the plane, let's say it was magnetism, right? Earth generates a magnetic field. If the plane got in the air, wouldn't the magnetic field still be pulling the plane down? If you're assuming gravity is real, uh, but again, this is more of a thrust configuration issue, far more than a gravity issue. Holding, holding level flight is not has nothing to do with gravity. It has everything to do with aircraft configuration. Yeah, we're generating lift, so we're kind of not well, necessarily worried about what's pulling down. on the. When you trim it, you will feel it. You will feel that G-force when you trim. But why do, you, why, do you, trimming? why do you have to generate lift? What are you fighting to, to get up? Right? That's what you You're generate lift. The weight, the weight of the plane? You're fighting the weight drag. of the plane? Oh, sorry, go ahead. All right, the, the weight of the plane, which, you know, in, in our world would be gravity, right? You're, you're fighting that force that wants to put the plane back on the ground. And Whatever you want, not necessarily density. gravity. It's just whatever the force is, the force that makes things come down. Sure, you, you, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm not going to, like, ram that word down your throat, you know, as long as we understand when I say that, it, I mean whatever force it is that, that pulls things down. When the plane goes up, right, to generate lift, which is harder because something is pulling on you, uh, you know, you, you got to flip your elevators up and go high, right, because something is pulling on you. Now, when you level out, something is still pulling on you, right? We could agree with that. Yes. Not, right? not necessarily. Correct. I mean, you got thrust and you have drag. You have lift. Well, that's, that's and, and lift fights that force that pulls you back down. Right? Assuming that force is real. Well, what, whatever force. If, if, if you didn't have to fight that force that pulled you down, then all you would need to do is generate enough lift to get off the ground, and then you could just set your, your flaps and elevators to straight, and you'd be, you could coast all the way across the world, right? Like, if I, got, if I got on a glider and jumped off a cliff, because there's no downward force trying to pull me back, that glider could go from Australia to England, right? Well, that depends completely upon yes. the weight of the aircraft. It depends the, on the all weight. kinds of different things. It depends on headwinds, crosswinds, thrust. I mean, it's, a glider is not a good, it's not a good comparison. Well, let's say, a real, let's say a glider with a one-ton weight attached to it. it or 500 pounds. Could you get that glider with a one-ton weight up high enough so that it's constantly falling around the Earth? Is that the question? No, no, no. I'm saying even over uh, over whatever shape of the Earth you want, right? If you took a glider and let's say uh, we put uh, you know 500 pounds attached to it, it wouldn't be a glider anymore. Now you're well, talking about a giant brick. But why? Well, okay. <laughs> say say two. Well, I mean a human's what? A male, 200 pounds. His gear, 250 pounds. Right. So I'm trying to come up with a, with a weight that's not too out there but the point is that that uh, you jump off that cliff you're going to come down right sooner or later you're going to come down yeah and, yes. and let's just say there's no air just to make this even more hypothetical and cut out some more variables there, there's no wind right you're going to come down and that's what happens to your airplane when it reaches level flight just like that glider there's still something pulling it down right that's why it doesn't not, go off the We've negated that by getting it off the ground. We've negated that pulling it down by getting it into the air in the first place. Right. right. But even then, you still but, have to generate upward lift after you got up in the air. And That's right. Until you got to level and, 
and then you reach in the aircraft for level flight, and then your hands off the entire time. But is is there is there not something pulling you back down? I, you tell me. You're you're the gravity guy. Okay. Well, do, do you know what pendulous fans are on attitude indicators gyroscopes? Yeah, I'm aware of that. I I know how they work. Okay. So what? How do those pendulous fans operate? You tell me. You're the gravity guy. I'm listening. Well, to what I'm trying to. What I'm trying to. Can I can I make one point on on gravity? Yeah. Um, so, uh, sorry to put in on the, on the airplane chat. Uh, I wanted to bring up Einstein and his relativity. Mm -hmm. So, uh, on Wikipedia it says, uh, gravity is most accurately described by the general theory of relativity, um, which describes gravity not as a force, but as a consequence of the curvature of space-time caused by the uneven blah, blah, blah. So, as a consequence of curvature of space-time uh, is how it's described, not as a, as a force. Uh, so then, in the in the words of Nikola Tesla, um, supposing that the bodies act upon the surrounding space, causing curving at the same time, of the same, it appears to my simple mind that the curved spaces must react on the bodies and producing the opposite effects, straightening out the curves. Since action and reaction are coexistent, it follows that the su supposed curvature of space is entirely impossible, but even if it existed, it would not explain the motions of the bodies as observed. Only the existence of a field of force can account for the motions of the bodies as observed, and its assumption dispenses with space curvature, and therefore dispenses with, you know, uh, gravity, which you remember is described as not a force, but as a consequent consequence of curvature of space-time. So, I hope that made sense. It sounds like he's disputing the, the whole fabric of a space-time thing, you know, where they take a trampoline and they put a weight on it and they say that the... So, if you yeah, have space-time... Space, right. if, if you have space-time curving one direction, you know, action-reaction would say that, you know, it's, it's, it, would, it would cancel itself out, so it wouldn't actually curve. So then if gravity is based on space-time, uh, which, as Tesla said, to a simple mind, uh, you know, would cancel itself out, equal and opposite reactions, after all, uh, you couldn't have space-time curvature, which is the basis, the entire basis for gravity. Right, I mean, I think that's really interesting and neat, but I don't, I don't think we get anywhere with that. I, I'm not educated enough to... Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I didn't, that was a bit of a mouthful to quote that, but uh, I, I think when, when, you, when you... I can recommend looking into gravity in terms of relativity, because uh, they even... I mean, uh, scientists and... Einstein himself even describe. Uh, I mean, it says in plain text on Wikipedia about gravity mm -hmm. that relativity describes gravity not as a force, but as a consequence of curvature of space-time. So, if space-time is nonsense, then and they say that it's not described as a force, then you know it, there, there's just a massive contradiction here uh, well, that it's not as a force, but we I mean, thought that it's a force. Is it reasonable to? Uh, or rather, is it unreasonable to... Oh, hang on. <laughs> we don't know everything about the universe, right? No, of course not. Of course not. So, if you've got people postulating about how some of these forces operate, or, or non-forces, whatever you want to call them, is that, like, is that wrong? What do you mean wrong That's to postulate? Exactly what we're doing. That's what we're as doing long as right you now. make sure that you're clear that it's a postulation and not a, it's not being presented as a fact. Sure. Well, they're, I mean, they're, they're working off of lots and lots and lots of observations. They're trying to figure out, you know, man, what is this? Kind of like if... Uh, a if lot I of other postulations. I mean, that's kind of the crux of the issue is it's postulation upon postulation upon postulation, all based on the assumption that it's a ball. Well, Would gravity no, work on, a, that's, on that's something that's... Assumption. Okay, let me let me let me jump in here. I got a question for you. Do you know how much now you're saying that gravity is it, 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 the mass of an object dictate, dictates how strong gravity is, right? Is that what I'm hearing right? Sure, that the object will generate, right? Okay. Now, let me do you know how much the shuttle dry weighs? No. 155,000 pounds. 
Right. So if your theory is, if what you're saying is, is that, you know, gravity is dictated by mass, how could something that weighs 165,000 pounds glide under that scenario? Wouldn't it just be sucked with, right to the With short, stubby wings, no less. Yeah, well, exactly. It, it right. would only be, it, again, you know, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're exaggerating the strength of said gravity by, by many, many, many lengths. Okay, well, fair enough. I mean, again, it's dry weight. So let's assume the shuttle actually weighs, when it's flying, 200,000 pounds. Wouldn't your model dictate that something like that couldn't even glide? It would be sucked right to the Earth. Well, I, again, I, I would I, – the math behind it is doesn't say that. Like the the engineers, the aeronautic engineers that, that built this thing, that uh, figured out how much lift it needed to generate, how – uh, the surface area of the wings, the weight distribution within the aircraft, all of that was factored, or all of that was considered using, you know, 9.8 meters per second. But again, so I, I, I'm still saying that the argument uh, still stands. If you have a 200,000 pound glider, which doesn't glide, by the way, the wings on that thing are for supersonic flight. If you had 200,000 pounds, the wings would be miles long. But, but, again, but I, why? What do you mean? That's how gliders work. Well, no, no, I mean, why? Two, two, you said 200,000 pounds? It's a simple fact. There is an atmosphere. I mean, at 200,000 pounds, it would be sucked to the Earth. I mean, that but, is a but, lot but, of weight. But why? You're making this claim or this assertion, but I, I guess it would be nothing behind it. That, you know, the, the density of a 200,000 pound, uh, you know, glider, whatever you want to call it, uh, would be Look at a picture of a glider and look at a picture of the shuttle. Exactly. I mean, the reason the, the reason why glides towards the earth it's more like a, f a controlled faller more than it is a glider that's what gliders are my friend i've seen the shuttle land i heard the engine roar it has an engine it is not a glider I, that's that's just okay that's an eyewitness you're talking to an eyewitness yeah I, 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 I was little, those too. little tiny wings when it comes into land wouldn't hold that but why? You, you keep saying engines. wouldn't and, and shouldn't and doesn't and... Have you what? seen a normal glider? Have you seen a normal glider that you see flying around? They've got these big, long wings. Same. Yep, thin wings. All right, how much lift do they generate per, you know, unit of mass that it's trying to carry? Depends on the aircraft. If you're, if you're talking about like a STEMI motor glider, I mean, it depends on the aircraft, but the point is still the same. The wings of those air, of that aircraft is shaped like an F-16. If it was going to, if you were going to try to get an, a positive angle attack on that shuttle, as soon as it lifted its nose, it would come crashing out of the sky because the wings aren't long enough to generate the amount of lift it would need to carry 165,000 pounds. The wings would be miles long. Well, it's again, I, I would. I mean, I'd, I'd really like to see some some math behind this. It doesn't right, require some... math. It's basic. It's basic understanding of how wings work. Why would a glider manufacturer manufacture a glider with giant wings if they can manufacture them with wings that are one fifth the size? Exactly. Exactly. If you're saying gravity is a constant, is dictated by mass, that thing wouldn't glide at all. It would come right. And by the way, the shuttle does a circuit approach, unpowered. I don't know if you knew that. But a circuit approach is when you do all sections of the landing, right? You have downwind, upwind, final, right? It's, it's impossible. 165,000 pounds on stubby wings, they don't glide. They fall right out of the sky. At that oh, yeah. moment, yeah. gentlemen, I have to say, I will bow out for a while. I have pressing matters and charging issues. So let me get some charger going, and I will be back. All right, well. All right, thanks for being on, my friend. I appreciate you coming in. You have oh, some yeah. great points. All right, take care, man. Thank you. Right, uh, thank I, you. I guess, I mean, I, I, we should probably end it because I don't think we're going to go go anywhere. But like I said, I, I would like to see something more than, you know, an argument ad incredulity about this, right? Like some of our heaviest bombers – Weigh the same as the shuttle, right? 160 something thousand. They don't glide. They don't glide. Bombers right. don't glide. They have a power plant. Right, right. But they can glide, right? It's to a certain extent, that gliding is 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 allowed. Again, a plane, a bomber, let's say a B-17, doesn't weigh 165,000 pounds. Okay, let's let's. Do you remember that? Um, let's do a thought experiment here. Remember that 747 that went down in the Hudson? Uh, what, what, let me look at what model that was. 
it had both of its engines cut uh, during that glide, during that uh, the descent that he made into the water, right? Yeah. And it was a, uh, let's see, an Airbus A3 something, something, something. And that thing had a, let's see if I can find the weight of this aircraft. Right, you kind of see where I'm going with this? Go right ahead. And he didn't start from very high when he when he realized his engines were gone. Exactly, he wasn't he wasn't you know two hundred thousand feet in the air. Again, yeah. when when you have engine out, dependent upon the aircraft, the weight of the aircraft, what you do, you trim for your best glide rate, mm -hmm. which is a, he didn't he wasn't coming from fucking space in a, <laughs> into a thousand miles a fucking hour, was he? Yeah, but he wasn't doing one thousand mile an hour towards the, the Earth, was he? He was flying, the space shuttle flies virtually parallel to the Earth, right? So the, a, the A321, I'm just looking at random things, maximum takeoff weight is 183,000 pounds, right? right? Um, this Airbus was an A320 or A320 family. I don't, this is an A321 I'm looking at. Uh, let's see. See, the, the, prob the, the mistake that you're making here is the shape of the wings. The wings, the wings, the wings. Okay. And 380 has massive, long wings that can generate a pretty good amount of lift for its, for its thrust-to-weight ratio. The shuttle, on the other hand, is a completely different story. That thing is, by design, cannot glide. The wings are not shaped for a glide condition. Those wings are shaped like an F-16, and that's for supersonic flight, not gliding. No, it only reaches supersonic speeds once it gets to the outer atmosphere, it, not through the atmosphere, right? Wait, and doesn't, everything... break, doesn't, the, doesn't the shuttle break the sound barrier when it's being launched? And when it, when it comes back in, it's doing – how fast is it going? When it comes it's, back it's, going, it's going fast, right? Uh, so it's got a, let's see if we can read up on, on these wings, right? It's got a delta wing shape. I mean, are we dismissing all of the explanations about why it was constructed the way it was constructed? I am, yeah. I, it's, it's not a glider, friend. That thing is not a fucking glider. That's a brick with... Just because delta. the wings aren't long enough. Exactly. You would need wings that were so unbelievable. Think about it this way. If you were to launch a glider on top of a shuttle, the wings would shatter. Right, because they're too long, they're too. They, they would be blown away. the The shape of the shuttle, as soon as it it did something, as soon as it lifted its nose to to come in for the approach, the wings aren't generating enough lift. It's an unpowered aircraft. The difference. Well, it, it doesn't need to generate lift, though. Well, it flies a circuit approach, so at some point it has to start lifting its nose to flare out for a final. At that point... No, it's the angle of attack just keeps... Yeah, it generates lift based on the angle of attack. It doesn't generate... It doesn't, like, literally generate lift like a plane taking off does. It's still okay. falling. It's still descending, right? Okay. It's spiral approach. Right, but at a certain airspeed, mm -hmm. anything that glides becomes unbelievably unmanageable and the point is as soon as the shuttle rolled its nose high based on my flight experience because the wings aren't generating the lift necessary to keep in the air it would fall out of the sky well i mean a any pilot <laughs> that's been in an airplane for 15 minutes understands this yeah but I, I i get the feeling that you're not a fighter pilot are you no, but I have flown enough aircraft in my day to know how it works. I've flown a 172, a Mooney Bravo, which is an aircraft that does 300 knots. I've flown a Beechcraft Baron. I know how this works. Okay. Well, I, I guess I, I'm not. I'm just not feeling the, uh, the the credentials here, right? But look, I, you know, we we can we can leave this contested. So, so you're so you're suggesting that I'm lying to you? I, I don't think you're lying. I, I don't think that that you've got the aeronautics. Uh, knowledge, engineering, training, uh, Do you? practical experience Do with you have the practical practical aircraft. Experience in the tr I mean, you were the guy that came in here and said, I don't have, you know, any, any knowledge, or well, not a lot of knowledge about this stuff. So I think it's the pot calling mm -hmm. the kettle black. No, I, I think you definitely have more than me, for sure. But I mean, um, that's what I'm, I, I'm not trying to be. I'm not trying to be combative. I'm telling you the shape of those wings is not conducive to gliding flight. It would never hold a constant altitude. It is not. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it does hold a constant altitude. Does it? 
It has to during a circuit approach. As soon as it, pu it pulls its nose up long before it flares to final. I mean, you can look at the videos yourself and see. Well, can we, I mean, I'm sure this stuff is documented. Can we, I'm, I'm trying to find right now where, where any of this might be documented. Look at a glider and then look at the shuttle. Yeah, but what I'm trying to corroborate is your claim that the thing stays level for a certain amount of time as it comes back in. It has to during its during its final approach. It has to flare its nose up to bleed off airspeed. Right, but that doesn't mean it's flying level, does it? Like it can descend while also flaring its nose up, right? Well, no, but you have a positive angle of attack nonetheless. Yeah, but a positive angle of attack doesn't mean it's going level. Right, but as soon as you start to up your angle of attack, the, the wings start to sort of drop off, it, 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 they don't generate lift anymore. You would get a stall condition. Oh, yeah, if you nosed up too far, sure. Okay. Just take a look at the difference between the glider and the shuttle. They are not the same thing. I never, Sorry. I actually, oh, somebody's talking. Sorry, guys, I'm going to. I'm going to drop off now. I have to go to sleep. It's 3 a.m. and I'm getting up early. Uh, it's been amazing. And I've got to say, uh, Negator X, um, it's really nice, um, refreshing hearing someone who's actually very um, oh. calm, calm and collected. Um, you know, a lot of the time, as flat earthers, we get attacked uh, for being retards. Um, and I really appreciate that you're having a very level headed approach. And I'd love to stay on longer and listen to your. Um, you know, your points. Um, but I have to go, sorry. Okay, well, uh, thank you for having me. Thanks very much. You guys have a good night. Yeah, you too, Richard. Thanks, Richard. Take care, Josh. Good to you. Well, I, I tell you, we'll, we'll leave that point at I need to go learn myself about um, the glide soap the shuttle takes. Because right, and, and, I, no, I don't and, know. And, okay, Agreed. so my next challenge would be why don't I have to adjust for the Coriolis effect when I'm shooting at 3,000 <clears throat> Sorry, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I've got kind of a cold, so I may cough. Yeah, that's yeah. all right. It, the, the question that I have for you um, is, is if the Earth is in a constant, say, <laughs> a thousand, what is it, a thousand, fifteen hundred and twenty-five feet per second, why don't I, why doesn't any sniper, why doesn't anybody that's ever fired a mortar, why has nobody adjusted for this effect? So uh, this is something I am pretty familiar with, and, and it's pretty boring to list, but i got to tell you. Um, but I'm going to try. So there, there's some, some misunderstandings, right? So when we talk about the rotation of the Earth, it's the, the rotation is measured in, in RPM, just like anything else that spins, you know, like the tachometer in your car. Uh, and that, that rotation is, is 0 0.00069 RPMs, right? That many rotations per minute, or, or one rotation per 24 hours. Yeah. That, that's angular velocity, yeah. right? Uh, so linear velocity is when you talk about the 1,000 some odd miles per hour, and that's that's of a single point on the Earth. So the equator, yeah, you're right, is its linear velocity is 1,030 or four, whatever it is. But that linear vo velocity of the surface of the Earth, as it closes in to the the point of rotation, gradually reaches almost zero, right? In the same way that um, uh, if I put you on a one-mile running track and I put your buddy on a two-mile running track that uh, was a larger concentric circle, and I told the both of you to run your lap in eight minutes, right? The guy on the two-mile outer track would have to run twice as fast to achieve one revolution in the same amount of time the guy on the inner track did, right? Does that make sense? That's yeah, when they stagger the starting blocks. Right. right. Okay, keep going. So, so that's why. So, uh, the the at the equator, yeah, it's one thousand spin miles per hour. But at say fifty degrees north latitude in England, it's six hundred fifty miles per hour. And then as you close in on you know Greenland, it's three hundred. And then in, you know a few feet from the actual point of rotation, which you know, you, I don't theoretically, right? If you could ever find it, locate it, it would be. Um, you know, rotate six feet in 24 hours or, or however long, however far away from the exact center point you were, right? So Coriolis happens when an object moves from one inertial frame of reference to another. And those inertial frames of references are, those are the, the, uh, the linear velocity.
velocity of that chunk of the Earth, right? So if, you, if you're on the equator that's moving, let's just approximate to 1,000 to make the math easier, 1,000 miles an hour. Uh, if you math it out, I could find you the websites that explain this in, in depth and give you the equations. Uh, you'd have to go about 10 miles north of you before the linear velocity dropped to 999 miles per hour. Uh -huh. So the Coriolis effect is where an object goes from one, remember one frame of reference to another. So uh, let's say if you fired a bullet from the equator to 10 miles north, that bullet, as it travels, uh, first of all, it has the forward velocity of the, the rifle fired it, fired it, but it also has a, a lateral velocity that's moving with, with the ground. And just humor me, right? Uh, it's moving laterally 1,000 miles an hour, but it reaches a section of land that's moving laterally 999 miles an hour, and that's, that causes a very slight deviation. So, uh, furthermore, these deviations are like itty-bitty, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw a, a short video in the, the chat that uh, uses people on a merry-ground throwing a ball to illustrate this point. Are you aware of the fact that uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson blamed the Coriolis effect on winning the Bengals game? I think he was probably kidding. No, he wasn't kidding, actually. He said that, that the rotation of the Earth helped the Bengals win a game. I, I really appreciate your knowledge on all of this. But, uh -huh. I mean, come on. So, first, you, you say the distance is... Well, let's, let, me, let me talk about that real quick. I, I, I don't see <laughs> the Coriolis effect. You're, you're still not answering the question. Why does nobody on this planet that you claim as a planet, why has nobody else adjusted for this force? Well, well they do. Uh, and I'll show you, and I'll give you some proofs here in a moment. I just want to make sure that we're, we're at an understanding about what this force is. We're not at an understanding because Neil deGrasse Tyson disagrees with you. No, like I said, he's, he's either kidding or, or wrong. Uh, well, and you, I, shall I play it? I've got it all queued up right here. I've got it queued up. Keep my queued up. Neil deGrasse Tyson talking well, you, about you don't, you, don't need to, you don't need to prove to me that he said it. I, you know, I believe you well, when he, when you well, say he's, he's an actor. He's, he, he's familiar with television, so to get his point across, when he's joking, he makes it sure that people know that he's joking. And when he's serious, he makes it sure people know he's serious. So we'll just listen and see see if he is joking or if he's serious, because well, no, no, he knows how okay. to work on television. It's, 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 I, I mean, I've given you my two answers. He's either uh, joking or he's wrong. Right? One or the other. <laughs> you want to go tell Neil deGrasse Tyson he's wrong? Well, I'd love to see that conversation. Well, here's the thing, right? You, you could you could mathematically work out the Coriolis effect on that football, right? But nobody the, does. The, That's the point that I'm trying but, to make. But you, nobody like you, adjusts for it. It's this hang thing. on, let me hang on, Michael. Hang on, let, let me let me get to that. What I'm getting at is that the Coriolis effect on that football would be measured in like a, a fraction of a millimeter. Like it would be it would it would be there. It would exist, but it would be so small as to not matter. Now you're talking about snipers and stuff, right? Now, at, at 1,500 meters with a 308 round, you're only talking, you know, four inches left to right, depending on what direction you're shooting. Four, right? inches, is a huge four, inches. Amount, four inches is a huge amount of distance. I'm sorry, target area on a target. Well, well sure, but at, 15, at 1,500 meters, though, right? We're talking like a 10-mile crosswind is going to cause a 100-inch uh, deviation left to right, just from a 10-mile-an-hour crosswind. Or the drop, right? The drop is going to be measured. The drop from the bullet or from the muzzle is going to be, you know, what, 15, 20 feet? Uh, and we're talking adding an extra itty bitty four inches. So an itty bitty four inches shooting uh -huh. 3,000 3, feet is not a small deviation. I don't know if you know that. I don't know if you've ever fired a rifle. Four inches is a. If there was a four inch deviation left, left or right, depending on the spin, you would not be able to put your scope on a target. You would unaccounted for deviation. You have to lead it. Four inches it is a huge number in shooting. Right, but again, fifteen hundred meters. Right, like the uh, the record for the farthest kill is uh, what a mile and a half, made by a British sniper who also claimed that he uh, accounted for Coriolis. Right. My, my again, I, I he's the only one that has. There have been plenty of guys that have come out from the military. Plenty of people, sharpshooters, people like me that shoot. Nobody adjusts for it, and you still haven't answered why I don't adjust for it, or anybody. Why? I mean, either you don't know about it, or it's not relevant enough for the target ranges you're shooting. Really? So now, here's the thing: effect, a, a Coriolis effect for a sniper is no big deal, or some sharp shooting. Well, like I said, four inches at 1,500 meters. When, uh, like I said, compared that to a, a 10 mile crosswind, that's going to cause you a 100 inch deviation. 
right? That 10 mile an hour crosswind is 25 times can I, the power. Can I ask how fast that bullet? Exactly. The 1,500 1, meters, how, how long does it take for that bullet to get to its target? Uh, what, the 308, I don't know. I think it's, what, 1,000 feet per second? No, it's a lot. It's a lot more than that. The a thousand question, meters I, per second. I guess the point that I'm trying to make is, is if you have any scope time on a rifle, you would realize that if there was a four inch deviation on a target at 1500 meters, you would have to lead the target. You would not, you couldn't put the crosshairs on the target. You would have to lead it left or right, and no sniper has. Well, again, we've got snipers that claim that they do. Which snipers? Uh, well, again, the guy well, that's got the record for the, the furthest kill. You, you want to see the guy? Let me, uh, let me link you a, um, a chart that lists all the things that go into uh, ballistics yeah, calculations. I'd like to see what these snipers are calculating while they're getting ready to make this kill shot. Well, I, I just I link you a chart. That, well, like, yeah, it, it goes over all of the variables, right? That you but why don't I have to... Why don't I have to input those variables when I shoot? You still haven't answered the question. Well, a four-inch deviation on a target at fifteen hundred meters is a huge lead angle. Huge. Uh, it, it's at fifteen, not at fifteen hundred meters though. Rifle at that range? I've been in the army for thirteen years, but have you fired a rifle at that range? Uh, no, I have not. Okay, so okay. I have I've fired rifles at combat ranges, three hundred fifty meters and shorter. I know that I get all kinds of deviation from from uh, you know in a tactical environment from all sorts of different things okay and that's just a three you know three and some odd meters but three thousand right. feet isn't three hundred meters it's three thousand feet that's right so like i said i, I just linked you a, a calculator that goes over all of the distant the different things that can uh you know affect your accuracy right there's a lot no, i see that but my, I, that's my point. Is you're saying that this British sniper sat there before his kill shot, factored in all these variables, and did it in a time so that none of the variables, none of the variables changed. He did it so quick, none of the variables changed, and still managed to make that kill shot within four inches. Mm -hmm. That's pretty. That's four pretty spectacular. Inches? That is a huge, huge. That's hit or miss. That's life number. or death, right there. You wouldn't. You wouldn't be able to put your sights on a target. You would lead. You would have to lead it so much that your your the crosshairs wouldn't be on the target. They well, would be four that. inch. Right. Yeah, it'd be left or right four inches. It wouldn't. But nobody has done that, and no one's adjusted for it, and I've never adjusted for it. Well, no, no. You keep saying nobody and no one yet. This guy says he did, didn't he? Okay, one guy, guy says he did. I've got twenty okay, other guys. One guy says. Let, let me let us let's talk about something that's a little more. Uh, I want to see the math. Though. I want to see the calculation. I want to see exactly yeah. because I doubt he had an online yeah. calculator. Can Can you screen share me? Sure can. So I, I don't know where to find the the ballistics. Like I said, the calculator here will tell you the ballistics for Coriolis, but I, I don't know much about it for small caliber stuff. Uh, but I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you something. Um, uh, right here, it's called um, it's FM Field Manual 6-40, right? It's what we use in the Army. It's what the Marines use as far as field artillery gunnery, right? And when you go to gunnery, because I, I, I've, I've been to gunnery as a tanker, I was a tanker when I first enlisted, you do everything right. You account for everything. So this is Chapter 7, Firing Tables. It covers uh, all of the different things that can affect your shots. And Chapter 7-11 Table H covers corrections to range and meters to compensate for the rotation of the Earth. And this will give you an idea of how this works. So what this is showing is on the left-hand column is the range to target. Excuse me. The range to target. And uh, up top is the azimuth. Uh, you know, obviously azimuth means you about a compass and, and get the directions. Now it's not in degrees, it's in mils. Mills are a bit more precise than degrees. There's like 17 or 18 mils in, in one degree. So based on the direction to your target, you make a, uh, a correction for this deviation. Because you remember the Coriolis effect happens when an object goes from one frame to another. And if you're shooting north to south, it covers a greater differential in frames. Whereas if you're shooting east to west, it's less. So it gives you that correction in mills. Uh, and again, the greatest correction is 20 mils. Now, 20 mils is less than one degree, and that's for a target, uh, what, about 6,500 meters away? So less than one degree correction at max, right? 
So this is my first practical example. Uh, I've, I, like I said, I've been in the Army 13 years. I've worked with artillerymen. I know they do this, right? Now we could talk about, uh, do you know what a, um, uh, of course you don't. So in World War II, our battleships used range keepers, right? This one was called a Mark 8 range keeper. And uh, again, it, uh, it aligned battleship fire and it accounted for Coriolis. Same thing with artillery directors in Vietnam. Same thing with high altitude bombing in, in World War II. You can Google oh, all of those key terms. Oh, right. no, no. The B-17 used the Norden bomb site. There was absolutely no Coriolis map in that system. I looked at United States Army sniper manuals. No talk about Coriolis. Well, again, I'm showing it to you right here, and this is a current manual that we use right now. But I can show you a manual just as easily that shows no, and you still haven't answered my question as to mm -hmm. why I had I did not have to adjust for the Coriolis. I appreciate all this stuff you're showing me, but it doesn't answer my question. At well, that range, I should have had to adjust, and I don't. I adjust I mean, how, so what sort of shot groupings are you, you doing at 1,500 meters? What's the difference? What is, it, again... It, well, you said you didn't have to adjust, right? So it sounds like you're telling me that you put three rounds within, say, you know, a three-inch group at 1,500 meters. Is that true? Yeah, or was the grouping well, a lot larger? Was, was, the grouping, was the grouping greater than four inches? No. It was no? no? Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe you got lucky. Maybe the direction you're shooting was, con as I'm showing here, your your direction, right, is what dictates how much deviation there is. No, you're incorrect, actually. You need bullet speed, geographical location, and the angle at which you're shooting, north, south, east, or west. If you are shooting from north to south, you're going to get a much more exaggerated effect of the Coriolis. That's exactly what I said, though. But, again, it, it, that's the whole that's the whole ever-loving point. Nobody's adjusted for it, ever. Well, ever... you keep saying that, but I mean, I've given you a number of examples where that's simply not true. Well, I can show you examples of plenty of United States Army manuals that say there's no adjustment for anything. Uh, the Earth moves under it. The Earth moves at about 400 meters per second. <laughs> so if you're shooting north to south, wouldn't that make the bullet a huge uh, adjustment? <laughs> meters if you're, if you're, if no. you're shooting north-south across it? because the bullet has the frame of reference of the section of earth that it left with. So, yes, it's landing in a section of earth that's moving left to right, you know, 400 meters per second, but also left the ground and has a lateral force that's also almost 400 meters per second. But I thought you said the earth isn't moving at 400 meters a second. I well, said, we're talking in his I own terms. Was, right? Oh, I thought you told me it was almost unnoticeable because of your RPMs and dudes running in circles. 400 no, meters a second. 400 meters a second would be another huge adjustment. No, no, I just explained why it's not because the bullet is also moving 400 meters per second laterally. Okay, you still haven't answered the question as to why nobody's adjusting for it. I well, can't again, it's, it's not nobody, right? We've got a whole field of people that do oh, right here. Guy. You've got one guy, some British sniper, that said that he, said that he adjusted for it. Uh, oh. Well, in all of the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marines artillerymen, unless you're telling us that we're doing it wrong. No, if, if, you can, if you can show me somewhere where some artillery guy can actually give me the numbers as to how much he adjusted, I'd be happy to see it. You don't think we use our own manuals? No, I think that the idea that you're, you have to shoot at different angles, at different speeds, at different parts of the earth is ridiculous. A sniper in the south would be shooting completely different. It would be, it's based completely on geographical location. And again, it is, because, you're, you're ch again, if you're firing from one point on the Earth to another, you have to adjust for those know, two points' point difference and speed. You don't have to adjust for it. That's the oh, okay. point. Okay. At that range, I should have had to use your GVM calculator. Well, I tell you what, do this for me, right? And, and this may be asking a lot. But if the if we can come up with a practical experiment that you could do, right? So if you were to lay a target direct north, you know, zero degrees north, 1,500 meters away, and then another target uh, east, 1,500 meters away. Mm -hmm. And uh, you fired, you know, you put a shot group into each. If I were right, then there should be some differential between where your groups land on those targets, right? And if I were wrong, mm -hmm. then you'll be able to put all the rounds, center mass on both targets, and they would look identical, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, I know, again, I know that's asking a lot of you because I I'm, don't have access to a 1500 meter range where I'm at. 
but that would be one way that you could, you know, see this for yourself. But I don't need to because again, it, it's it's very simple. Snipers adjust for windage and elevation at the most extreme range is air pressure and temperature. That's it. There you go. Like I linked you, um, I linked you another uh, instructor who said otherwise. And I will send you a link to a flight instructor that says otherwise to you too. We can do this. This one. Hold on. Well, I mean, your claim was that nobody does it. I'm showing you people that do. Oh. Right. Well, at least people that claim to do. What? <laughs> exactly. Just like that other guy that missed. Like I mean, I've I've watched an artilleryman dial in uh, all of these factors on his on his daggone piece of equipment, and I know that he factored for rotation of the Earth, and I know that the rounds fell. Are you saying that the rounds fell off target because we're trying to trick people? No, I'm if, the bullet, if the bullet's moving at 400 meters per second, say we're shooting north south exactly, mm-hmm. the bullet's moving 400 meters and the Earth's moving 400. Why would you have to account for it all then? What's what's making the bullet slow left to right then? What, let me, what, let me what's understand. making it slow up if it's if it's if it's shooting at the same rate as what the Earth's spinning then? Why what? How would you calculate that? Oh, excuse me. Well, it's not. It, it leaves. It it assumes the inertial frame of reference. Like an inertial frame of reference is when you when you're a part of a system that's going one direction, you, you generally will also go that direction. Like in your car, or when you get up to go to the bathroom in a plane, right? When you go pee, your pee has the inertial frame of reference of the plane, and that's why your pee lands in the. the could um, you could you pee on top, standing on top of the fuselage of the airplane? You couldn't because the outside atmosphere is not part of the same inertial frame of reference. No, oh, you're, you're talking about drag. The only reason that you can pee inside of an airplane is because you are being protected from the forces of drag by the by the by oh, the yeah. actual oh, surface. Sure. So that's true. I don't know if it's really a, a good argument to be using. And here is a United States missile instructor talking about the lack of the Coriolis effect. Is right this here. the is this the Navy guy? One of the Navy, man. I got another one here, too. Uh, I'll be happy to talk about that one. I'm, are you watching my screen? I'm going to show you what, like, the actual what happens with Coriolis. Uh, here's a flight instructor saying the same thing. Hold on. Bro, hang, hang on. I'm trying to give you a, a practical example of this. Right? Do, do you see what's happening with this ball? Do you see how when they throw it straight, it uh, deviates from where it's going? Yeah, they're talking again. Watch this. Ball thrown, deviates right. Because she is moving to the right, and the location she threw it to is moving to the left. Now, this is really exaggerated. Right, so the ball is not moving, the target is. Right. 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 That's, yeah, that's the whole point. Right. Now, I, I would be happy to. I really want to talk about the Navy instructor, because the weapon system he uses doesn't need to worry about Coriolis. Uh, he also makes a number of uh, he, he lies several times that you can confirm yourself. Here's uh, another flight instructor. Talking about Coriolis. Hold on. I mean, again, I, I, I appreciate all your hard work, but you have failed to explain to me as to why I personally and the people that I know, some of them in the military, have never adjusted for it. Ever. Uh, like I said, I, I don't know. I mean, if, if Neil deGrasse Tyson says that a football game was won over the Coriolis effect, and if you're willing to tell him personally and publicly that he is wrong and you are right, I would love to see that. I, I, would, I would do that, but I, I genuinely believe he was joking. You cannot have it both ways. You can't have it as to, well, uh, you know, it, it's moving so quickly that it won a football game, but then, you know. But again, you know, I, I don't, you don't, right? I, I don't, um, I don't believe that, right? You can't hold that to me. I, I'm not. I'm not supporting that. So you're not supportive of an astrophysicist that is supporting your argument? No, he's not supporting my argument. He's making a joke, right? If you That's want to talk to look, if you want to argue with Neil deGrasse Tyson, you should probably call him up. You're the one calling him wrong, not me. Okay. You're the one telling him he's wrong. Why I'm are you telling him wrong. he's wrong? Go tell him that he was. Joking. I'll tell him he's wrong. Okay. I told him he's wrong. I told him he's wrong on Twitter all the time. <laughs> Yeah, it's just it's ironic that you you can win a football game with the Coriolis, but me shooting at three thousand yards, it's, you know, it's almost non-existent. 
Well, well, how much, let me ask you this. How, if you went out of the same range, right? The first time you went to that range, you, you fired some rounds, uh, you, you, you adjusted your sights, you applied some Kentucky windage, and you put them on target. And every time you go back to the range, you, you use that same setup, right? No, not necessarily. It depends on the heat of the day. It depends on the round I'm firing. It depends on the distance. It depends all. It, there's a whole bunch of things that go into that. But it's, the range doesn't move, right? The range is still the same direction. So if there were a Coriolis effect, then you've already naturally adjusted for it. No, no not at all. No, I mean, if you're, if you're firing, every time you go to the range, you have to re-zero. Every time you go to the range, you re-zero. <laughs> Excuse me. Do the clients have, uh, have to adjust for Coriolis? Nope. When you're on a landing approach, say north to south, or let's say you're going from 180 to 000 on a runway, there's no cor there's no adjustment for that. It's a light flare in and touchdown. Yeah, because the, the actual answer is the Coriolis is so minimal that they don't have to worry about it. And any, any correction it is simply, no, they don't. Look, I'm telling you, he was joking or he's wrong. Or That's yeah. not good enough for me. You claiming him to, to, to be doing something, it does not sound like he was joking. So uh, are you saying that everything he says is truth? No. I think no. he's I think he's a bullshit artist, to be honest. Okay. Well, I'm not here to defend Neil, Gr Neil deGrasse Tyson. But you're, but you're willing to tell him he's wrong when he's not. But what? Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm not, I'm not citing Neil deGrasse Tyson as proof of anything. I don't need to. All right. But uh, here, th this is this is from a practical. I don't know if you can see my video. This is a practical explanation of the why, right? So the the CD he's got in the background. That's the rotating frame of reference, the two points on the Earth, and the uh, the straight edge represents the straight path of the bullet, how it's going to travel from one point to another, uh, that are uh, uh, both rotating, but a different at the at the same angular velocity, but different linear velocities. Let's see where we can get started here. All right, so it's really hard to tell, but what he's doing is he's rotating that, D, that DVD and making a dot. And as you can see, the dot remains in a straight line on the straight edge. Uh -huh. But the Earth isn't a disk. No, and, it's not this, a disk. And this is not spinning at 1,040 miles an hour, and the disk doesn't have an atom. <clears throat> and the disk doesn't have a lot of the things that are being removed with this little experiment. Well, the, uh, the Earth is not a disk, but remember, the only thing you need for Coriolis is a change of inertial frame of reference. And even though the Earth would be spherical, uh, the closer you get to the poles, you're still getting closer to that point of rotation, right? Just like on this flat disk, as that marker goes from the inside out, it gets further away from that point of rotation. But what's the, what he's displaying here is uh, the curved trajectory uh, or a parent trajectory, even though he used a straight edge representing a flat uh, flight path, or a straight flight path. All right, but anyway, like I said, you know, we, we can go we can go back and forth. Well, what I, if it's ever possible, you know, try to <laughs> try to set up two targets at the uh, you know azimuth I suggested, and see what happens. But let's um, I tell you what, let's 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 talk something that we can that's a little more down to earth, right? A little more observable. So the, um, on the 22nd of last month was the, the equinox, right? And there's a bunch of things that happen on the equinox. And one is that uh, the majority of the earth experiences a 12 hour day, 12 hour night. But more importantly, uh, the sun rose directly east of every location of earth and it rose directly east of every location on a single line of longitude simultaneously. Does that, does that make sense? Or are we, we tracking? Keep going. Right. So the problem for a flat Earth is that when you, when you have a sun who's making a ring, right, a circuit, uh, and on the equinox, the circuit would be over at the equator, since when you're standing on the equator and you look at 90 degrees above the, uh, the horizon, which is straight up, the sun is directly above you. Uh, the problem for flat Earth is that the sun can't be on the equator, but also directly east of Maine and directly east of Argentina and directly east of New Zealand. 
Now you're getting into a subject that I'm not well versed in. One of these other guys would probably be, be a little bit more receptive to that. I focus on the flight and Coriolis stuff. Okay. Well, like I said, read, read through that manual. Um, <clears throat> you know, do a little. So if I sent you a United States Army sniper manual and it doesn't mention Coriolis in anywhere in there. Sure. I'll take a look. But again, Coriolis is much more relevant to projectiles that move much further. Right? Like battleships. You need to stop saying that because I don't believe that. Okay? But what you yeah. believe, what's reality is. We'll move on. We'll move on from there, Mike. Yeah, I'm with you. Okay, let me. Let, hang on. I'm with you. Move on. Stupid. Let me, um, let me, let me draw you a picture. This is, I'm going to use the, the all ascribed to the uh, azimuthal equidistant map. Is that a representation um, of flat earth? Probably not. I mean, maybe with maybe with a North Pole centered, I think we could probably get that far. Okay. Yeah. So something I'm gonna let me see if I have a paint thing up here. Let's see if I can break the problem I just presented down into tubable chunks here. So I'm going to screen share my uh, my MS Paint here. So what I have is a, an azimuthal equidistant map, right? Which in, in the conventional model, you know, we say that it's just a projection. They took the globe and they stretched it out uh, over this. But what I'm what I'm trying to show here, right, uh, is that we have our north dot in the the center, and yep. uh, this black ring is the equator. I overlaid it on the equator. Got it. And uh, we have this this purple ring up here. That's um, I don't know. It's over Canada. That was just a particular line of latitude I was using to display a point. So down here in the middle, I have this red dot in Ecuador, and that's uh, that's over the equator. So on the equinox, the sun rises due east of this red dot. Now on an AE, <coughs> excuse me, on an AE map, due east is uh, runs the line of this this black circle, the equator. <laughs> Yes, and uh, if you go back and at uh, using suncalc.org or maybe it's .com, I don't remember, you can reference where the sun was at sunrise for for Ecuador, <laughs> and it was over Gabon or Gabon, uh, Africa, right here. So the sun was here at sunrise for this location here. Now, uh, again, the sun also rose ninety, uh, exactly ninety degrees, exactly due east for this person. Right. The problem, though is at the same time the sun was rising for this person in Ecuador, the sun was also rising for somebody down here in, uh, in Chile, and also for somebody here in Australia, uh, and also for this person here in Canada. Right? So we have these other three observers, and the sun also rose directly east. Right? Uh, and actually, this person here in Canada, he saw the sun re rise slightly northeast, so it was like 88 degrees. Right? So he saw the sun rising here. This person seeing the sun rising right here, he's seeing it rise over here. This person right here, this black line, he's seeing the sun rise that way. But he's also seeing the sun rise that way. Is this coming across? Where are you getting this info from? How do you know where everyone's seeing the sun come up? So, like I said, you can use a website called Time and, or I'm sorry, SunCalc. Have y'all heard of it? It, uh, it it accurately. You realize you realize that website could be full of shit. You got to uh, look out the window and see what actual degrees it's coming. Out. Uh, I'm in Australia, and uh -huh. um, hang on, I'll just I'll just tell you where exactly where the sun came up for me this morning. Hang on a minute. Okay. Well, this morning is going to be a little it's a little bit different, but um, and I could tell you what SunCalc says, and you could corroborate it for me if you wanted. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's see, sunrise in what section of Australia are you in? Townsville, man. I'm sorry, where? Townsville. Townsville. Uh, give me a bearing from the center of Australia. It's about 19, it 19 degrees latitude. Oh, okay, 19 latitude. Uh, so you're on the north somewhere. Yeah, we'll, we'll put it right there. So this is saying, let's see if I'm doing this right. I should have been 
Excuse me, I'm so sorry. Right about 98 degrees azimuth uh, at, let's see if I convert my time, 1600 UTC minus four. So what's your UTC? Uh, what is, what are you like, plus nine on GMT, Rob? I'm not sure. I'm just. Um, I just had you on mute there. Sorry. I'm. Got, I've got it nearly directly east this morning. Mm -hmm. Just off. Just off. Just short of 90 degrees. Right. So this website's about 80, saying about 85. About 85 degrees. It was. 85. So this one's saying, and let me see if I can get it exact. About 90, 98. Now that's not including uh, dawn, like the bright time beforehand. And then what's your, let's, let's take this line sheet and latitude and look up your magnetic declination. Well, actually, were you, when you were referencing the azimuth, were you uh, spitballing it or were you using something to measure it? And it's fine if you're spitballing, I just want to know so that I can see here. Because you're, uh, if you're using a, an actual magnetic compass, then magnetic declination is going to throw you off just a little. Yeah, I'm not sure, mate. I just I've just used my compass that I always use, same one. So yes. um, it's in 98 degrees is what well, well, well away from um, from where it actually came out. And you actually pulled out your compass this morning and and measured it. No, I, I've got a. I know where the sun was rising because I've on, I've been on this hangout. Oh, okay. Well, the Since magnetic the declination right? for your area is going to be. Uh, plus, you said Townsville? Yeah. Is that near... Oh, hang on, I'm the wrong country. Yeah, magnetic declination for you is going to be plus seven, seven degrees. So I'll take whatever you said and add seven. I don't understand what, what you meant by that, but yeah, that gets me to about 92, then 93. Yeah, I, I, five degrees is. I, yeah, I, I would. I, I'm I'm pretty confident that uh, if you were to look at this website tomorrow and take a, a super accurate reading and then factor magnetic declination, it, it would come up right. The, the other thing is a, a flat earther got a bunch of his friends together across the world and they took compass measurements on the equinox uh, where the sun was coming up and, and confirmed all of this. Um, and then lastly, this website's just never, it's just never been wrong. Um, but magnetic, while we're talking about it, do you, you don't know what magnetic declination is? Just, just so we know? Because I mean, I don't mind explaining uh, it. No, I don't, no, no. Okay. So, so true north, right, uh, is where, you know, Polaris is and would be where our axis of rotation is. Whereas magnetic north changes every year. It, it, it's actually about 400 kilometers offset from the dead center of of uh, our axis of rotation or the dead center of your flat earth if you want to call it and every year it moves another 40 or so degrees so if you google magnetic declination uh, you can go to a website like i've got here and pick a point on the earth and it'll tell you what your declination is because your compass is saying north is one direction but because north is 400 meters off from true north you have to uh, uh, apply this correction right like that's how we do it in the army when we do land navigation with compass by by foot, and they call it a GM angle. But um, anywho, what, what I'm gonna I'm gonna show what happened on September 22nd, and see if I can explain myself in a way that makes more sense. So looking at this website, I'm gonna move. Uh, what we've got here is you can pick a point on the Earth, and uh, here on the right we have a, or on the top you have a slider. For the where you want the sun is, and on the left it tells you its altitude, its azimuth, well, its elevation, not its actual altitude, its elevation, azimuth, uh, the grid coordinates, the times, everything. You can you can corroborate all this stuff uh, on your own. But uh, the point I'm presenting is that if we pick say Maine, right here, the sun rose at what six six thirty. Uh, for Maine, uh, and if you go straight down a single line of longitudes to say uh, Peru, this in rows 628, 
and I may have off clicked from center just a little bit. And if we go down to the tip of South America, uh, again, the center is 624. And you'll notice this orange line on the right represents direction of the sun. It also tells you the, uh, the azimuth on the left. So here in, in Maine, we have an azimuth of 91 degrees. Uh, in Venezuela, it's 90. Uh, going straight south into Argentina, it's, it's 88. Down here in Antarctica, at this location, it's, it's 87 degrees. So here in, in Maine, we have an azimuth of 91 degrees. Uh, in Venezuela, it's 90. Uh, going oh, straight south into right Argentina, there. it's 88. And in Antarctica, at this location, it's, it's 87 degrees. So here in, in Maine, we have an azimuth of 91 degrees. Uh, in Venezuela, it's 90. Uh, oh, street salad right in Argentina, it's 88. Oh, see there? Is he? No, that was me. Sorry, I didn't know what the hell just happened. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. So the, 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 the problem I'm presenting, right? I'm going to represent. I thought maybe that was part of the problem. The problem I'm presenting is that if the sun is running a circuit over the flat Earth on the equator, it can't possibly also appear to be east of a point uh, to the south or to the north. Because if it's if it's here on the equator and it's east of Ecuador, then if someone looks at a compass who's in Canada and draws an azimuth to the rising sun, it's not going to be directly east. It's going to be southeast by quite a bit. Same thing for somebody down here in, in Chile or the tip of South America. Their compass is going to read an azimuth that's very, very northeast, like uh, you know, 45 degrees or so. Is all that reasonable? Yes, I suppose. Or at least make, make, makes you think a little bit. Right. So, so the, the, the globe Earth has, doesn't have an issue with this because on the equinoxes, our, our tilt is neither towards or away from the sun, right? That's why, uh, and I would have to get a 3D model to better represent this, that's why you get 12-hour days over the course of the entire Earth because the, the, uh, the tilt isn't causing any shift in, in daytime. And you could look up, uh, you could use sun, or time, sun calc, like I just showed you, to look up the time and, uh, or the number of hours in each day. Or uh, I got another handy tool here that uh, you can play with to double check hours in the day. I'm just going to link it on the, the right. But for me, like this, this is one of the biggest things that, that it does not make sense uh, if the Earth were, were flat. Now, we could say that the Earth is a different shape of flat, like some people say it's square, it's some diamond. But it still doesn't resolve this problem. And the only thing, the only way this problem could possibly get resolved over a flat Earth is if the sun were really, really, really far away. Actually, or it, or it changed its altitude, and this is something that I've, I've been kicking around for a while, and a couple of people are, are working with me on what if, what if the, the the sun itself changed its altitude during the day? Well, if there's a bunch of observations we can make to confirm that, right? And in this particular example, an altitude change wouldn't alter its um, uh, the azimuth from the observer. That's what I was thinking too. Right, like it would. Um, yeah, no, it wouldn't. It wouldn't alter because it's still on a single point over, over the flat Earth, right? You would just have to look a little bit higher to to draw your azimuth. Um, and this leads into a number of other problems, right? Like, um, I know that some flat Earthers will say they'll they'll say that the the sun they'll pick a position for the sun based on who can see it directly above them. Like that's why most flat Earthers will say that. Uh, it runs a ring along the, the equator during the equinox because somebody on the equator can look directly up and see the sun, whereas somebody in, south, uh, in America has to look south right, to, to see the sun at apex, right, at noon or around noon. So the other problem is that uh, during North American summers, they say that the sun uh, runs a ring all around the Tropic of, I think, Cancer. Is that the northern one? Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's yep, right. You're I up. Think, yeah, I think it's... And, and it goes something like this line, like obviously more round. This is like a potato, this, this red line. In the Tropic of Capricorn, you know, they say during North American uh, winters, the sun runs a ring uh, along the Tropic of Capricorn down here. The, one of the other problems this presents is one of time, right? Do you, you remember the example I used earlier of uh, if we had one person on a one-mile circular track and one person on a two-mile circular track, and they both completed a revolution in the same amount of time, the guy on the two-mile track has to run twice as fast? 
Well, that's the same problem, right? The Tropic of Capricorn over flat Earth, right? Once you mathed it out and uh, did the, uh, the, the the calculations, would be a little bit more than fifty thousand miles in, in length, where the Tropic of Cancer is twenty two thousand, right? But the Sun still makes a single rotation in one day. That means it has to be moving twice as fast along the Tropic of Capricorn in order to make that one revolution per day. But the problem is when it's doing it's so, so rotation in 16 hour days. That means now, if the sun were moving faster overhead, you would think they would get shorter days, not longer days. So it's something else to chew on. Yeah, that's, that's, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, does that, does that make sense to you? Like yep. uh, it, 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 some people will say it changes altitude, but that, again, the altitude isn't going to change its linear velocity, right? That, what the altitude will do is change how big it looks, right? And that's another problem uh, entirely. Have you all heard the, the arguments about the sun changing size and not changing size? Yes. So you, you're familiar with the, uh, you know, people talk about wanting to use a solar filter to view the sun. Have you, have you seen pictures of the sun like that? I think so. Through a solar filter, yes. Mm-hmm. I'm going to play a short, short video. This guy, um, y'all stop me. If I'm getting boring or you're just not listening, please stop me. My wife tells me I should stop. <laughs> Cheers to her too. I'll, I'll, I'll stop in a minute. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll go find something else to do. Flat earthers um, deal with the same thing. <laughs> so, uh, oh, I'm not playing. She says I should jump off the cliff. That would be a better thing to do. Um, th this uh, this guy here, he took a picture of the sun every 30 minutes using the same zoom and a, and a uh, solar filter. Let me fast forward here to the end because he, he puts in a time lapse. Here we go. So these are all of his shots of the sun throughout the entire day. And what, what that is, that's called the photosphere, the actual circular part. And the other problem about the sun is that um, for it to be, I know that um, you, know, you guys are keen on saying that uh, you know, if we use the Pythagorean theorem, we can uh, take two observers of the sun and then calculate its, its elevation. And that's why some flat earthers say it's like 3,000 miles up, right? Does that, does that sound right? That's the argument, yes. Okay. So uh, that also, you know, they, they say that the sun is 32 miles across. And what they did to determine that is use something called angular diameter, which is simply how big something looks to you. Like we could, um, you know, if I held a nickel up at arm's length and you held a cantaloupe up at six feet away, um, we could find out the distance to make both those objects from a particular observer appear the same size. And that's what angular diameter is, right? How large, how wide something appears. Was that a red rhetoric video then, was it? It, it was, yeah. It was, he's a shocker. Yeah, I, yeah, I wouldn't <laughs> trust that guy as far as I could throw him. Well, that's, I mean, that's what he showed has been corroborated elsewhere. I would love to see a flat earther use a, a real solar filter and, and do that. He, he would get these results. Uh, Walt, who was on here earlier on, um, he's got a good video out there where um, he had a filter on and showed the sun getting smaller. It's a it's a fifteen minute video. I think he's even yeah, cut it down yeah. to two minutes. It's two an minutes. absolute ripper with um, how the sun gets smaller. It's an oh, absolute it? beauty. It's one of my favorites. Okay, I, I, I'm I'm hundred percent confident that I've seen him, and that he wasn't using an actual solar filter. But I would love to look at it again if you want to link it to me. He was not using an actual solar filter from what I can see. Yeah, that, and actual solar filters are, are pretty expensive. But I'll still take still a look. See, you can still see the sun changing size as it was getting further away. You can clearly see it changing. Right, but the reason we use solar filters is to cut out glare. Because when you say the sun changes size, what you're seeing is glare. Right, because uh, when the sun is on the horizon, there's less glare because there's more atmosphere between you and it, and the atmosphere is cutting out that glare. That's also why the uh, you know the sky changes colors. Right. I'd like to change a bit of tact again because I'm I've got um, I've got to go and do something for the rest of the afternoon. But I just want to ask you a quick quick question, and um, I did uh, talk about this uh, earlier on in the day when you weren't here. Um, I've got an island off the coast here at this. <laughs> Uh, 33 miles away. <clears throat> now, I recently, and uh, this island's probably 1,800 feet uh, tall, 
I can see that island. Well, I believe I can see that island in full because I've lived here my whole life. I know what the island looks like. Mm -hmm. So I can see the high island in full from 33 miles away. Now, I've um, we had a weekend away across um, another island that is uh, about 12 miles closer to that island. So, therefore, the island is now only 20 miles away from me. Yet, that island is the same shape. Uh, my calculations, I should have been seeing uh, 600 feet of it should be uh, hidden when I was 33 miles away. And when I am when I was uh, 20 miles away or so, it should be only 200 feet missing. So I should have seen an extra 400 feet being that close. Yet, the, the, yet that island is the same shape. It's the same, so it's the same shape as the other same island shape, that was further shape. away, you or same. You could, yep, you can see the same, same uh, flows no, across gonna, the mountains. No. You, you, you can see it exactly the same. It's 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 the same shape. Obviously, it's bigger because it's closer. But mm -hmm. It's the same shape. Um, how can you explain that? Same shape. You mean the angular diameter? Like it looks the same, like left to right size, or? Which, let me, well, it's the same uh, let me shape, tell you what. Can, uh, you, you can see the same amount of the island. You can see just as much, no matter how far or near you were. You could see from the shore to the top. You could see the entire thing. It was larger when you were closer, when he was closer, but he could still make out the entire thing. And when he went what? further from when he left, when he could still make out the entire thing. Well, he could but see there, should the been, there should have been 400 feet of that that was hidden mm -hmm. when I was on. From the mainland to when I was in, but it, that wasn't the case. Which island is this? The same um, shape. Which island is this? Um, uh, this is called Palm Island, which you can see from Townsville. Oh, so you're you're observing it from Townsville. Yep, and then you you go to a different island, across the bay. You're a lot lot closer, and the the shape of that island does not change. Okay. Can I ask where in Townsville you work? Because it looks like there's a mount, there's a, a some hills in Townsville that get up to 500 feet elevation or 600. Um, or at least Townsville town. I was, on the, I, was, I was standing on the beach, mate. You stand on the beach looking at that island. Okay. Let's see here. Let's see. But yeah, all, all um, yeah. so what's your expert? It's very very hard for me to um, mm -hmm. I can only tell you these things. You know, I can't. I can't really um, share it with you. I know oh, you've got the ability there to have a look where I am. It, I mean, it's a fun thought experiment. Uh, I mean, I do want to. I'm, I'm. I am buying a uh, P900 at the end of the year, mm -hmm. um, and I can hardly wait because I'm going to start doing some good filming and stuff like that, and um, I will be posting it. Uh, <clears throat> I will. I'm, I'm going to see if I can find find an answer for you right now. Uh, I do want to point out that um, you know, there's all sorts of documentation of stuff not being seen when you, you know, you shouldn't see it. Right? Like, uh, you know, you it's should called, see most it's everything. Called, it's called rubbish. <laughs> because you could, if, ship, if ships sail over the horizon mm -hmm. from 10 miles or whatever they do, then that island should be as it gets towards you, as you as you move towards that island, it should should be changing shape. It should be rising up out of the ocean. Well, it should right in front of your eyes, shouldn't it? It, it should, but the the but it's it going to be so ridiculously gradual. It's not going to be like oh man, the island just like popped out at me. And, and that but, that concept can be displayed a, but, in but all sorts of places. The difference between thirty <laughs> the difference between thirty three miles and twenty miles is is. 400 feet, that's, you know, so you, 125, 130 meters wait, wait, of that I, island should have been more visible. Where were you observing Palm Islands from 33 miles? Mm, it's a place called, um, uh, where's that? Well, is, it, is it on the Strand. coast? Just, on, just on the beach in Townsville. Yeah, just on the mainland. Man. Well, the, the, the far north. You mean like Innisfil? In a fall to the north, or no, you're you're way, way, way there. Yeah. Well, there's only, in it's only I'm in 10, Townsville. I'm in Townsville. No, I got you, but it's it's only ten miles from Townsville to Palm Island. So for you to say no, thirty three no, miles, no, it's no, it's it's ten miles to Magnetic Island, or five six miles to Magnetic Island. Palm Island is thirty three miles away. Oh yeah, you're right. I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah, thirty five miles. So let's say you're staying on the beach, and let's let's give you an observer height of. 
I don't know. Six feet. Were you, were you in the water? <laughs> Six feet. I was. I was. I was standing on the beach. Standing on the beach. I was actually in the water of at um, Magnetic Island. So I was two feet off the. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so I'm joking here. So the math says if you're actually six feet above the water, 35 miles, there should be 680 feet hidden. And the topography of the island shows at its height, it's 1,700 feet to the central cliffs, and then there's like a section. Yep, yep, that's, that's right. That's right. Yeah, 1,800 yeah. feet. That's what I'm, yeah. I'll round everything off. 600 feet sounded nice. No, no, 200 no. 200 feet for 20 miles. That's you know, that's 400 feet. Yeah, yeah no, that, no, that's good. Uh, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not disputing that. Uh, and then there, it looks like there's like another smallish mountain range to the southeast that's attached to it that has a highest elevation of uh, 1,400 feet and uh, gets really close to the coastline before it drops below, you know, 600. So in either case, you, you should see the islands. Now, how much is, I, I don't know, man. I have to see some photographs to see what you're seeing. Um, I'm not disputing that you saw it. Uh, nah. But I do want to point out that there are lots of instances of objects that, that go away from you. Like they, they, you can no longer see them at the ranges you would expect to no longer see them. Like um, discounting refraction, uh, let's say you were, let's see what distance you would have to be to not see those. Let's say if you got like a uh, telescope. What do we say the highest point was? 1,800 feet? 7,800. Well, at 56 miles, there's going to be 1,800 feet hidden, and that's, like I said, not, not discounting any effective refraction. So if you could go to, let's see, above Home Hill in Ayer to your, to your southeast, it looks like there's a, there's a section of island that goes out there and that's 60 miles away. So if you were to go there and you could still see it, then the then uh, I would say, I would probably say it's refraction. But uh, that would also be something that without refraction you should not see on a globe. But as far as seeing the same thing, like I said, I, I, that, that's rough because I, I can show you all sorts of pictures of somebody going from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 and the object uh, clearly uh, becomes obscured from the bottom up. So I don't have a good answer for you, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. No, that's that me showing everyone else what what I see, or, or everyone listening to what I see, right? Is um really what I want, you know? And I will prove that too. I will prove that once I got my camera. Okay. Hey, try like I said. Try go to the Air Hill, or Air Home Hill, whatever it's called, at, at seventy miles, and see if you can see it. Whenever you do do that. Uh, yeah. Well. Um. Well, just on that island, because I live a little bit south of Townsville. Um. That island isn't really visible. I, I, I can see it from 40 miles mm -hmm. because of the dust in the air and all the crap. Right. I've seen it from 40 miles from, but um, that's as far as I've ever seen it away. So okay. um, home hill and air, that's a hundred kilometer drive for me. Right. Oh, wow. Is it? But, okay. Um, well, just, I'm just... not sure. I'm not sure. I'd have to go to, I'd have to go to a place called uh, Alva beach. Well, if, if you've got your little map there uh -huh. um, at air, just east of air, there'd be a beach called Alva beach. Would I have line of sight from there? Let's see, Alva. Is that is that north of Colville or Girona? Um, that'll be east of Air. Oh, east of Air. No, yeah, there, yeah. there's like a, a, a east jutting. of Home Hill. There's a, a piece of, of land. Hill. Yeah, there's. You'd have to go direct north of Air because there's a piece of land that uh, it sticks away. out. Yeah, it's called uh, yeah, yeah, Russell yeah, Island. Yep, yeah, another one. You another one you mean? Yeah. 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 So yeah, that you're right. I'm gonna to have to go and find some spots, but I will. I'll, that's my, that's my goal. Okay. So to uh, to uh, to wrap up sort of what I was saying about the sun, just so that I don't like leave strings unattached. What are they? What's this phrase? No strings. I don't know. No strings attached. Whatever. Um, what I was what I, where I was going with the sun and the angular size is that uh, if it were 32 miles across and 3,000 miles up, you could math out how far it would be from you on the horizon. 
because you could you could draw uh, rather you could measure your distance to the position of the person who looks up to th see the sun while you're seeing the sun on the horizon and it'll end up about seven thousand miles away and the problem is that the sun went from three thousand miles overhead to seven thousand miles on the horizon and it didn't change shape at all uh, and you would expect it to change shape by half the angular diameter would go from 32 arc minutes from like to like 15 but it, it stays the exact same 31 or 32 i forget what what it is the entire day Anywho, have I bored y'all to death yet? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of good information. There's a lot of stuff to take in. Um, yeah, I got a lot one. of online calculators. Uh, hey, hey, you might before you say that. That's a Yish argument. That um, that uh, globe that you were showing before, Josh. That I've seen Yish re recently use use that one. Which one? Which one? The uh, where he had the. Um, the flat map with the sun and how the sun moves. And, you know, I've seen you, sh you sh um, arguing with people on here. About that. And, yeah, I've seen him argue that one. Hmm. I... Sorry, you broke up there. No, I said, I don't doubt it. I'm sure he was arguing that. <laughs> Let me argue. Well, hey, hey, I feel like I've, I've taken over this ship. So unless you all have a question for me that you want me to answer, I'm going to roll out do you know how uh, no worries, okay, let me, thanks it. let me, let me go, explain Mike. how this hey take it easy rob all right, all right take care thank you in aviation um a lot of commercial pilots are coming out saying that the earth is flat let me explain how this works let's say we're taking a cessna 172 up to 6,000 feet mean sea level right this is a this is an aircraft that does not have an ins system it is a simple ratchet system like every other Cessna out there. When you get to 6,000 feet with the autopilot off, you do something called manual trimming. You're not changing the shape of the elevator. What you're doing, well, you technically you are, you're rolling a, a wheel inside the aircraft. Usually it's on your, your right-hand side and you roll it up and you roll it down. And what it does, it changes the shape of the wing by moving the trim tab, which is attached to it, into a different position. Mm -hmm. That, right. That's the, those are the, not the leading edges, but the, the sides opposite the leading edges, sort of slide. Is that what those are? Horizontal, the horizontal wing in the back. Stable. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. When you get to 6,000 feet mean sea level, you trim the aircraft once. You trim the aircraft for level flight. And you can fly from, and I've done it, from Cincinnati to Dayton to Cleveland. And you trim the aircraft once. If there was curvature to the earth, the moment you trim for level flight, the altimeter continues <coughs> to climb. And it would be a noticeable effect. If there was a curve, mm -hmm. you would have to trim 25, let's say, I don't know, depending on the curvature of the earth, you'd have to trim the aircraft maybe once or twice between Cincinnati and Dayton. Well, you're but remaining... You're remaining in a, in, a, in, a, in a level flight attitude the entire flight. And that is absolutely, unequivocally impossible with a curve. With but, an aircraft that does not have an autopilot, it has a simple trim system that's not designed to deal with any curve, you get to that, you, you, can, you reach the same conclusion. Call a flight school in the morning and ask them exactly what I'm telling you now to confirm it, and they will. If there was a curve, you could not manually fly an aircraft nearly as easily as you can. Well, you're saying that downforce is no longer affecting it, right? Affecting the aircraft? No, what I'm saying is, is if, the, if there was a curve to the earth and you're in level flight, as soon as you trimmed once, the altimeter would start to move. It would start to show an ascent. Okay? When you trim an airplane and you're flying along at 6,000, right, headed north, you're at 6,000 headed north the whole time until you have to adjust the, mar the, mar the barometric pressure on the altimeter. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the earth was curved, you would have to constantly retrim the aircraft in flight. Because well, you would be that's only if there was no force pulling you back down. Again, if there was a force pulling you back down, you'd have to then trim it back up. You have to trim the aircraft. If there was a curve, and you're talking to someone who has flight experience now, if there was a curve to that, 
Mm -hmm. the, you would see the, the altimeter rising. You would be climbing as soon as you trimmed once but, per level from that on, moment yeah. on. But to climb, you have to produce additional lift, right? Of course. Or change right. the configuration of the so, aircraft. Why would you, how would you be climbing? Because the earth? the earth is curved, right? As, as you fly along, you're getting higher and higher and higher. The ground falls away. From the ground. Call a flight school, ask them in the morning. I promise you, you're going to hear the same thing that I'm telling you. I'm not lying to you. Call them up. No, no, I, I got you. I, I believe you. I, I understand it. So yeah. uh, level, right? A yardstick on a basketball is level flight on a basketball. Level, right. not curve flight, level. Right. So when you look up the definition of the term level, you get a couple of different uh, answers. And one of those is distance to a stated base, right? Like you can have something that's level well, well, over a curved surface, right? We've talked for like an hour now, and I'm telling you the same thing. If there was a curvature to the earth, any pilot, anyone – would have to adjust for it manually. We're not talking about an automatic system or an INS system, a, a regular old stick and rudder aircraft. With, with well, I, I understand what you're saying, right? Like right. you said it like six I different times now. Over the definition of level, okay? Well, because level can operate on a sphere as long as you remain at the same distance from the surface of it. But you're not, and that's the point you're missing. You're missing the fundamental point here. When you're in one stable altitude, mm -hmm. if there was a curve to it, mm -hmm. you would be consistently climbing away if you were trimmed. Okay, let me, flight altitude. Let me, let's see if I can draw a picture here to, to, to display this here. I'm screen sharing. I'm going to put my globe earth. Now, obviously, it's going to be exaggerated. Hang on. Right. That's silly. Uh, okay, so here, here's our uh, our ball, right? So I'm gonna draw. I don't think I can. A larger circle. Now let's say this circle represents our our level flight. Now just ignore the fact that it's a but it, but it's not a circle. Look, listen, you're you're making a false argument by saying I, I, well. I, I, no, 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 no. We've listened to you talk and talk and talk. And right. the only thing we've heard is your jump. Listen, a curve is a curve. A level flight is a level flight. Mm -hmm. can argue, the level can argue, means that it's the same distance from the top, right? So if all, let's say you're at the 1,000 feet, a, fly, a plane flying along this blue ring, as long as it's 1,000 feet, is flying level with the ground below it. That's okay. the old, you're, you're well, using let's, let's, the hang, on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's, no, listen. Let, me, let me write this down, okay? It, for the plane to go uh, from, let's say, it takes off. Oops. I don't think level and equidistant should be should mean the same thing. Um, and it, then you got gyroscopes as well. I mean, and then you bring so like the well, we, we can, we can, we, we can is, level level too, level. But let me, let me show this to you, right? So this is the plane's flight. Now, Consider that the the center of the Earth is is where all the gravity is is pulling to, right? So anytime you go further away, you have to generate power to get away from it, right? So for it to go from you know here to this point in space, it has to generate lift to go to fight that force of gravity no. to get further away from the Earth. Oh, you are absolutely you do not understand the mechanics of simple flight. If you are in level flight, regardless of your flight condition, your mm -hmm. you, gravity does, it does not pull an aircraft along a curve. You would feel that. Why well, not? Why? Would, Why would you feel it? How would you feel it? Because of acceleration, because you're being pulled in one direction or another by the aircraft. It, yeah, but uh, imagine the amount of that pull, right? The pull, like you're, it's the same pull that's pulling you to your seat in that aircraft. It's the same pull that's pulling the pendulous veins down and the gyros at, attitude indicators gyroscope, right? It's that same pull. No, I oh. disagree with you. Call a flight school. I'm not going to argue level flight with you, bud. 
I'm not look, look, we, we, you don't need to. I understand what it is. You're, you're, you're not, you're not you're trying, trying to present the point of, of level flight as proof of a, a non-around Earth. You're, you're trying to say that the uh, gravitational pull of the Earth doesn't work like the way we say it does. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you were manually turning an airplane at 6,000 feet, mean sea level, you could not fly that aircraft without having to re-trim. Because no, you because you're at the same elevation, right? As long as you're the same distance from the surface, you're at the same elevation. And you don't have to trim for different for the same elevation, do you? Just, you okay. Only on a flat earth. <laughs> Call a flight school, do not argue with me. All right? Hey, tell you want me to the tell them one of their students thinks that the earth is flat? No, I want you to explain to them what I just explained to you. Well, you I, I, I'm not denying how level flight works, right? We, we, just start, we just disagree what level means. Well, no, I don't disagree. Here, the let core me. of the Earth. You think the core of the Earth, the the, out, the shell of the Earth, would be level with the core, right? So that would make the Earth level, as long as it's level to the core, because it's an equidistant from the core of the Earth. So equidistant would equal level. Mm -hmm. So walking around the a, walking around a sphere would be walking in a level. That's correct. A level path. Uh huh. So that's right. So round is level. No, look at look. I'm, I'm broadcasting the definition right here for you. A height or distance from the ground or another state of base, and that's all there is to it. it it's your it's your vertical difference uh, on a uh, perpendicular to what's below you. So that, oh, no, okay. So oh, this could just be one, one one measurement. So I could go 15 feet up in the air, and that puts me level because that's a height or distance from the ground, right? Well, if so you're 15, trying to find I mean, out if you're... 15, sorry, go ahead. Uh, a, height or dis, a height or distance from the ground or another stated un, or understood base. So if I jump 15 feet in the air, right, that's my height and my distance from the ground. It means I'm level. Well, it, no. What it means is if you had two objects, right, another object that was 15 feet, ah, you would be, you so two, would both be level. The height of two objects. Well, look, look so the height or distance of two objects. Look, look at the example. Ground. Storms cause river levels to rise. Levels. Right. Okay, multiple levels, yes. So each one of the, each, right, so we're talking multiple levels. I mean, let's say, let's say I cut a, uh, uh, I'm a carpenter and I cut a sphere. Are you saying it's not possible to have a level surface on that sphere? How would you it describe a surface that's perfectly, uh, all the radii, radi radians are the same distance? Equidistant? Equidistant? No, that, equidistant. Again, I wouldn't. It's two points I, that are both the same distance from another. So, Two points on the Earth are not equidistant to the core of well, the Earth? If they're at the same elevation, yeah. Okay. So then if you take one of those away, those are not, so that one wouldn't be level? Level wouldn't apply? It only, it would, it would, I'm, I'm confused. Then it's only so, equidistant? So sea level, right? Like level, we're all talking comparisons. That, that's what it's for, right? Your elevation in... Uh, your altitude in, a, in an airplane is relative to, you know, mean no, sea level, no, right? No, well, that that depends on how you look at it. You've got mean sea level and you've got above ground level. Sure. And that's but, the point that I'm trying to make. But it, they both start with ground, right? Regardless, regardless of that, if I were in an airplane flying mm -hmm. along at 6,000 feet... Please don't say you have to trim one more time. Please don't say that again. <laughs> why? Because you, you said it seven or eight times already. And it's just like we've listened to you jabber on for over an hour and 15 minutes to get to the same conclusion. That you think Neil deGrasse Tyson is wrong because you what? believe he's wrong. You yeah. didn't hear me jabber on. I explained observable phenomenon in this world that you can observe yourself to confirm the shape of the earth like the sun. And I have given jabbering you on. examples of how... The Earth is flat. Now, I didn't get a single rebuttal to anything I presented regarding the sun, right? No. But okay. that, doesn't, that doesn't prove your model's right and ours is completely wrong. Well, it, it means you, have to, you either have some homework to do or you have to change your worldview. Yeah, that's perfectly fine, but you haven't convinced me of anything. We've listened to your junk science. That's fine. It, it, look, uh, again, observing the sun isn't junk science. It's something you it can might, do. You could be a little bit more respectful. I mean, there's no reason to get rude and nasty. He was here as a baller. We're used to the ballers being rude and nasty. We just try to yeah. keep it simple. Yeah, I know true. I know your patience gets tried. 
Hey, I love him being here. Oh, this is good. I like. I like. We got at least we 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 uh, need at least one on the other side. Well, it's challenging, right? Like it's fun to be challenged. Absolutely, absolutely. That's that's the only reason I'm here. Is a year ago, I was like, why do these people think the Earth is flat? And they started asking all these questions that I didn't know the answers to. And that led me to things, right? Like being challenged because most people don't. They can't tell you, right? Uh, all of these different things or what sort of measurements you can take and things like that. Uh, and so the, 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 at the end of the day, right, there's still a force pulling on the airplane. It sounds like you're saying that force is no longer affecting the airplane. And I, I don't understand why, because you're still sitting in your seat, right? You're down in your, the airplane seat because of something that's pulling you down that's still, that's also obviously affecting the airplane. I mean, we would at least agree to that much, right? Like it's affecting you, it's keeping you in your seat. It's probably also affecting the airplane. No, I, we don't agree. Okay. I think gravity is. You can call it what you call it. You call it whatever you want. We we'll call it the downforce from here on if you want, like I said. But we both have to agree that something is keeping you in your seat, and that something is probably affecting the airplane too. It's not gravity. Okay. Doesn't it? That's fine. That's cool. Do y'all? Um, I forget. Did I? I mean, I can. There's a few other interesting things I could talk about if you want. But. Well, I'll tell you what, Negator. We will probably do this again later. I think we're rolling up on five hours now, or something ridiculous like that. Yeah. Probably more than that. We started at four, and it's late. Yeah, it's ten. So we're like six hours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, right. yeah, we will end this, and we will continue it later. And hopefully, if you see us on, we would love to have you come back on and oh, talk yeah. about those other few things that you've seen that would. Uh, Negate the flat earth. That would be awesome. Great. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for coming on. Ooh. <laughs> what do you guys think? I think I'm bushed. Yeah. Mm. Lucky I was doing some housework in between all that. <laughs> How does this person not understand that if there was a curve to the earth, you would have to retrim an airplane? I mean, we got into the argument over the word level. It's all relativity, Mike. That's what, that's that's that whole argument. It's all because the, we're in this enclosed atmosphere that's all spinning at one time, and gravity pulls the plane down <laughs> in, in, at the same right. rate. And, because and you're not really flying, Mike. One bit. That's uh, and you can't. We can't beat that. I mean, it's it's bullshit. But you can't beat it. It's, you it's, you don't it's, overcome gravity in an airplane. You're not going to fly in an airplane, Mike. You're not going to overcome gravity. You just got to stay on the ground and fly level something. For that guy to tell me that my own flight experience is incorrect, really, dude, really, that that was biting on my last nerve. I got to admit. I got to admit. Well, you know? I mean, it happens. Oh. It's good practice. It's good practice. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I mean, it was, it was weird when he said, well, I believe that Neil deGrasse Tyson was joking around. I was like, what the fuck? Okay. Uh, the guys in the chat room, they've, they've heard of him before. So I think he's done this a few times before. He's very, very well-spoken, oh, very, yeah. very intelligent. Like he, he's done this before. So don't yeah, believe he makes him. Anybody, but yeah. Yeah. He's, um, it's, he's yeah. Done this before. It's, yeah. I just, you know, it, it really bothers me when people, you know, tell me that every life experience that I've had doing this is wrong. It just, uh. Well, how bad can it bother you? I mean, what are we telling us, astronauts? What are we telling scientists? How bad can it bother you if you're willing to tell somebody else that? Yeah. If you can look at Neil deGrasse Tyson and say, look, everything you say is bullshit. Your experience is bullshit. But don't tell me mine is. I mean, right. you got to be give and take. I'm with you there. God damn. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. I just couldn't believe we got into the argument over the word level. <laughs> so, right. here's the definition. All right, yeah, I'm going to get out of here. We're gonna, let's end this. Let's get the hell off of here. I'm uh, tired. Thanks for inviting me, guys. I had fun. Thanks for coming thanks, on, Josh. Mike. It's always a good time. Thanks, Rob. You thanks, enjoy the Ryan. rest of your day. Right. See you later. We'll do. See All right, guys. sounds good. Bye. Peace out. All right. Well, I guess that's it. We're done. Everybody, thanks for joining in. Thanks for listening. Thanks for participating. Thumbs up if you like us.
thumbs down if you don't. You know what? If you want, you could even send me a text on our flatline, area code 503-314-3528. Send me a text and tell me how stupid we are for thinking the earth is flat. That's always good. We'll take it and we'll put it up on a video. We'll, we'll quote your text demeaning us. So yeah, that's everything I've got. Find us on Twitter, Iron Realm Media, Facebook, Twitter, here on YouTube, havenosphere.com, ironrealmedia.com. Love you. Peace.